It's a pleasant summer day in Megapolis. A man with a ponytail and a green shirt walked into a flower shop. He turned his attention to one of the plants in the pot. Approaching this plant, the man tried to pronounce the name, Zamiokulkas. A store employee, a blonde girl with long elf ears, approached him and commented with a friendly smile that the leaves of this plant look like coins, which is why this plant is also called the money tree, and people often give it as a gift for opening a business. The man politely said that this was what he wanted and asked to give him one such plant. The radio in the store began to make sounds. The announcer of this radio moved on to the next news and began to talk about a strange storm on the beach in Sokcho. The government says it is a natural phenomenon. The store employee walked up to the counter and turned off the radio. With a dissatisfied look, she said, Of course. And she asked who would believe this. Is such a storm just a natural process? The man stood behind her with his hands in his pockets and watched her. She asked if he watched the video on video hosting. The man lowered his eyes and thought that, as expected, the consequences of a battle of this magnitude could not be hidden so easily. The man remembered how he fought a dragon in the sea during a storm. At that moment, with a purple knife in his hands, he said that quite a long time had passed since he fought the dragon. Also, hunting two dragons in one day is too much. Thunder roared, lightning flashed, and the man rushed to the attack. Present tense. The elf girl, packing the man's purchase, sighed and said that their world was strange. She asked the man's opinion on this matter, and he, taking his purchase, casually replied that he extremely agreed with her. Coming out of the flower shop, he looked around and headed to the taxi. He got into the car and asked the taxi driver to take him to Seoul. While they were driving, the man again thought that this was a strange world. He looked out the window, where people, elves, monsters, goblins, golems, and other fantastic creatures were passing through the pedestrian crossing. The man thought that this world was abnormal. But then what kind of world is considered normal? The taxi driver was an orc. He told his client that it didn't look like his client was here to relax and asked what brought him here. The man replied that it was nothing special and that he was here for work. This story is about a distant star on the edge of the galaxy and about a man who has been working for 800 years. The man who was sitting in the back seat of the taxi threw his head back and, closing his eyes, tiredly said that he really didn't want to work. The taxi driver said with a dejected look that he had the same situation, but isn't it all for food and a good life? He added that in this world you have to work just to survive, and it seems like no matter where you go, everyone has the same thoughts. The man agreed with the taxi driver's idea. Some time later, the man was sitting in a doctor's office with a sign on the door that said a patient was being examined. The man in the green shirt repeated again that he does not want to work and that it is very boring for him and drives him crazy. He asked if there was an option to live without working. The doctor raised his hand to his face and suggested out loud that Mr. Minjun was burned out. Minjun first looked somewhere to the side and then lowered his gaze and explained that he was burned out because he had been doing this vile job for too long and was it right to live like this? The doctor typed something on the keyboard and said that it seems Minjun is already mentally tired, just like a rubber band, if you pull it for a long time, it loses tension. The doctor made a diagnosis, having printed it in the patient's electronic record with emotional burnout syndrome. The doctor continued to talk about how the mind needs rest, but Minjun is unable to do so. The doctor moved the bottle of pills closer and asked me to just take them as before. Minjun picked up the jar and, looking at it, repeated the doctor's words, take them as before. The doctor said that the next visit is in 23 years, so of course the medication is prescribed for 23 years. The doctor had golden eyes without whites, fins and gills. He was not human. Doctor asked, does Minjun have any other questions? Minjun stood up and calmly said that he was leaving. The doctor stretched in his chair and yawned and said goodbye, saying that they would see each other in 23 years. The doctor looked at his notes and with a tired look mentally asked, should I live without working? He doesn't believe that this is possible because if you don't work in this world, you can die. Minjun walked outside and looked around him with indifference. The sun was shining brightly, City residents were relaxing in the park. Children ran and played. Residents had picnics sitting on the grass. Minjun took a deep breath and said it was a good day. Suddenly, 
Everyone's phone rang warning them of danger and asking residents to go to the shelter. Minjin's phone also rang. Minjun took it out of his pocket and put it to his ear. A certain Katie called Minjun by name and told him that there was a job available. Minjun asked, Is this a bank robbery? Katerina answered with a smile that this was so and everything was as expected from a top agent in Korea. Minjun asked about the payment and Katerina replied that the payment was the same as last time. Minjun hung up the call and muttered that it was so boring. He teleported to the robbery site. Someone loudly ordered everyone to step back. Someone shouted that the safety of citizens is most important. It was the police. One of them, being an orc, looked especially terrifying. His name was Chongpul. At that moment, he turned his gaze and looked at Minjun in surprise. Minjun asked with an indifferent face if the man was alone. There was a crowd around them watching everything that was happening. And he answered positively. Minjun added that Jiangpul is a police inspector and asked him to make his face simpler. Jiangpul scratched the back of his head a little nervously and replied that his face is always like this. This orc is Inspector Park Jiangpul. Jiangpul filled Minjun in on the situation, saying that judging by the last refugee, there were only four hostages, all unconscious except one. In the dark room of the castle sat a beastman and two people. Some monitor screens were broken. Minjun said that he understood everything and would take it upon himself. Chompo looked at him in surprise and asked what he would take. Minjun, exhaling heavily, explained that this case is of course. Jiangpo, shocked, looked after Minjun and thought that it would not be the police. But Minjun, who is an agent of the immigration department, who would take on this case? Jiangpo didn't believe it. Minjun stood in front of the huge high-rise building that housed the bank. He reached into the inner pocket of his green shirt and took out several pieces of paper with strange hieroglyphs that looked like spells. These spells were activated and the buildings were engulfed in a blue haze. Someone from the crowd began to be surprised that this was magic, and someone asked what was happening. Minjun calmly said that in that case, he would go. Changpul told his subordinates to take the residents away because the immigration department would solve all the problems. One of the police officers loudly told the inspector about magic. Chonpul turned his head towards the bank building with a surprised look. He said Minjun's name questioningly. The policeman responded positively and asked Jiangpul if the immigration department doesn't catch foreign immigrants. He added, how did these people end up here? Jiangpul, with a gloomy look and crossing his arms, asked his ward if he had learned the difference between an immigration office and an immigration department in school. Changpul added reproachfully, what was he doing at school? The policeman looked away guiltily, with tears in his eyes. He pitifully said that he worked on night shifts, so he was busy sleeping in class. He added that he didn't even have enough time to earn money, and how was he supposed to have enough time to study under such circumstances? The policeman covered his eyes with his palms and began to sob. Changpul got nervous and looked away. Putting a finger to his chin, he decided that he shouldn't have asked about it. Jiangpo, with an annoyed face, said that he understood everything and decided to explain the difference that he spoke about earlier. He started talking about how, like the policeman said, the immigration office handles complaints regarding foreigners, but an immigration department agent like Minjun deals with special foreigners. The policeman asked again with incomprehension, are they special foreigners? Jiangpo answered positively with a serious look and continued to say that they deal with people coming from abroad. The policeman looked at the bank building and said with a little excitement what it means inside the bank. Jiangpul interrupted the policeman, answering positively. He also looked at the building, and then said that there was an illegal immigrant inside on another level. In a dark bank room, someone was being held by the hair. Jiangpul finished the thought by saying that this man is a guest from a very distant place. Inside the bank, this immigrant with short black hair and sportswear was holding a hostage by the hair. He walked dragging her with him. Meanwhile, Minjun was already in the building. He read aloud information about this person, No Kang, 21 years old, unemployed. Awakened and registered as a special ability user last year, used it as an opportunity to go work for a security company, but failed. Minjun thought with an indifferent face as he read this information. He looked up towards the sudden source of light, focusing his attention on a special skill. The source of light was a bench that was flying towards Minjin. She glowed green. 
Minjun managed to dodge and the bench flew into the wall. He said out loud, telekinesis. Kangu, who was dragging the woman by the hair, asked Minjun who told him that he could come in. He added, did Minjun really get rid of the police and go in on his own? This man had crazy green glowing eyes. The woman he dragged along the floor left a bloody trail on the floor. Minjun, with a calm face, ordered the hostage to be released first. Kayanga was casually sent to Minjun. Minjun, with his hands in his pockets, calmly continued to say that he promises that he will not kill the emigrant if he surrenders right now, but if he does something to the hostage. Minjun didn't have time to finish this sentence when Kyungu interrupted him, ordering him to shut up and do what he says. Kangu covered his face with his hand, not letting go of the woman's hair in his other hand. Minjun is still calm. He said that this was the last warning and ordered the hostage to be released. Jonggu began to look even more frantic and cursed, ordering Minjun to shut up. He asked if Minjun seemed like he was playing here. Does Minjun think he can treat him like a jerk if he's unemployed? Kangu raised his hand and began to use telekinesis, chairs, tables, and other objects in the bank premises rose into the air. Kangu started screaming that he thought his life would turn around with the advent of this power, but he couldn't even get a job. He said he was only given $1.65 a month just as a stipend. How is he supposed to live on this money? He asked Minjun if he understood what it was like to live like this. Why should he be the only one to suffer like this? Jonggu continued to scream with tears in his eyes and was ready to attack Minjun, screaming that his life was useless. Suddenly the man stopped and looked straight ahead in surprise. He thought that now that he thought about it, he came here to collect his scholarship. But some old lady said that he had something on his back and was trying to take it off when she touched him. But what happened after? Kengu stopped looking crazy. A terrifying voice praised Minjun. The hostage that the man was dragging by the hair was the same old woman, but now her eyes were shining green and she was smiling madly. She said in her ominous voice that he saw her at first sight. The man had sweat running down his cheek. He looked at this old woman and was shocked when he realized that his hand was connected to her by strange green veins. He immediately jumped away from her shouting, What is this? Green veins came off his hand. The old woman looked straight at Minjun with a crazy smile and quietly said that he had a good sense of smell, which is not surprising because he is the dog of the immigration department. Minjun replied with contempt, looking down, that he would be a fool not to notice her. The old woman tilted her head and, smiling, said about the man that this idiot did a good job of brainwashing her. These same green veins began to grow from her back. They got bigger and bigger. The old woman said that she thought Minjun was saying all this nonsense for no reason, but he was saying all this about her hypnosis. The woman turned to the man who was sitting on the floor. She looked at him intimidatingly, and he yelped in fear. Suddenly, she turned into a terrifying black-green substance with shining eyes and a fanged mouth. She attacked Kanga, and he turned for an instant into the same black substance. He rolled his eyes and groaned, veins popping out on his face. Strange green veins joining his entire body, Kengo screaming heart-rendingly, begging for help. Minjun rolled up his sleeves and said that the criminal that everyone wants to catch came from the Odense dimension. The criminal's name is Ethril Daphne. Daphne smiled, saturated with power, taking away Kanga's life energy. Minjun continued to talk about how she committed three attempted murders, twelve murders and forty-nine robberies. She is guilty of possession of contraband and entering a primitive dimension without permission, all crimes excluding those committed on Earth. Minjun took out his purple knife from behind his back. He directed it at her and said that he gave her a chance and she blew it. Minjun frowned a little, but his face still showed indifference. He grabbed the knife with both hands, with one hand he held the blade, and then with a sharp movement he cut his palm. He clenched his hand into a fist. Blood flowed in a copious stream onto the floor. Daphne looked at him and thought that this was an ominous aura and that he wielded dark magic. Dark magic comes from pain or sacrifice, condensed, absorbed by life force. Dark magic is prohibited in some countries, but is allowed in cases of self-sacrifice for the greater good or self-defense. Minjun's arm looked emaciated and was covered in pronounced veins. The hand had an unhealthy color. Daphne thought with a smile that the life force that Minjin spent would never be restored. 
she mentally wondered how much vitality there is in people. Kengu, from whom she took the life force, lay unconscious. Green veins were connected on the face, collarbones, neck, and other limbs. Daphne, with a terrifying look, decisively said that she would make this power hers too. She rushed to attack. Minjun quietly uttered some kind of spell. Daphne had already directed these green veins at him, and they were a few centimeters away from him, when suddenly strange red bubbles covered his body, and then a huge red hand burst out of the ground. This hand pressed the veins to the ground. Behind Minjun, a huge black humanoid creature emerged from the ground. This creature, like Minjun, had a red eye that glowed red. Daphne was very surprised by what she saw. She started to get nervous and thought this was incredible. She continued the thought, How could an ordinary person use so much dark magic? How much life force he spent? Daphne noticed Minjun's arm, which looked very sore and exhausted. She figured that, come to think of it, Minjun had wasted half his life just to deal with her. Fear appeared in her eyes. She asked what he was. Minjun looked at her with red eyes and, thinking a little, said that he was not sure that he knew. The creature behind him screamed heart-rendingly. Daphne watched everything that happened with her eyes wide open. She thought that she didn't fully understand what Minjun wanted to do, but should she just sit back? A huge black creature rushed to attack. Daphne didn't even have time to react before the creature grabbed her and tore her into two. She started screaming in pain. The creature continued to tear her body into pieces. When all that was left of her was her severed head, she looked at Minjun in horror and thought that he was really strong. Minjun, with his hands in his pockets, asked if she was in pain. Was it worse than she expected? Daphne screamed in fear at him, asking him to wait. She tried to bribe him by saying that she would repay him if he let her live. Minjun asked with an indifferent face how she would repay him. Very nervous, Daphne asked if Minjun knew why there were so many criminals gathered on Earth. She continued to say that once the main fortune editor of the dimension prophesied that in the farthest corners of the dimension there was a part of the soul that was defrauded by the most dangerous criminal in history. The main fortune teller of the dimension looked like an anthropomorphic insect with tarot cards, a fortune-telling ball, and other mystical attributes. Daphne said she has a clue that will lead Minjun to the main fortune teller. She added that there will be riotous lines for this award if Minjun decides to sell it. Daphne, nervous, smiled and chattered that if Minjun promised that she would remain alive. Before she could finish her sentence, Minjun said that he was not interested picking his ear with his little finger and looking away somewhere to the side. He explained that if he sold it, the committee would immediately start looking for him. And on top of that, he already had someone right on his hands. Daphne tried to say something, but Minjun interrupted her again, saying that she was trying to fool him on the verge of death. He combed his hair back with his recovered hand. Daphne was shocked by this. She turned her attention to his hand and shouted that this couldn't be happening. The life force that has become a victim of dark magic will not be restored. This is the law of the universe. This is impossible. Daphne, with fear in her eyes, frantically asked him what race he was. The huge creature swung at Daphne. A moment before the blow, Minjun indifferently explained that he said he didn't know. The creature crushed Daphne's head with its huge hand, so that only a bloody trail remained. Minjun absorbed her dark energy with his right hand and thought about how many extraterrestrial criminals he had on his account. He realized that this number could no longer be counted. His eyes turned black and his gaze blank. He thought that he was tired of all this. Minjun remembered the hostage and, turning to Kang, said that he was still alive. Minjun thought that such a crime would be forgiven only for robbing a couple of banks. Minjun, looking at the huge puddle of blood, said that he envied them. The magical barrier that shrouded the bank building disappeared. Minjun went outside. Chanpul, noticing him, asked if it was all over. Minjun responded positively, walking up to him and asking him to take care of the consequences. Jianpul put his palms on his hips and asked what happened to the hostage. Minjun looked away and said with an indifferent face that at least the hostage was alive. Jianpul grabbed his chin and, nervously, said what a relief that he wasn't dead or wasn't a robber, otherwise it would be difficult to look at a young guy with a hole in his head. Jianpul began to get even more nervous when he realized that Minjun didn't respond to this. After a few moments of silence, 
Minjun closed his index finger and thumb, saying that the hostage already had bullets all over his body. Chongpul, covering her face with her palm, began to feel even worse, and Minjun, getting ready to leave, added that he said that it was difficult to work here with Chongpul's attitude. Minjun offered him something to drink. Jiangpul crossed his arms over his chest, responded positively to his request with a smile and said goodbye, asking Minjun to be careful. The phone in Minjun's pocket vibrated, Katie wrote it. Minjun took his phone out of his pocket and read the message. The message read that the Jenkinson Company, the privatization department of the Public Administration Service, the Korean Migration Bureau, 223-540,001 was sent to the employee's account. Minjun said out loud that these guys pay promptly. He stopped a taxi. When the taxi driver asked where they were going, Minjun politely replied that they were going to a bookstore in Sunrocks. On the way, Minjun was lost in thought. What everyone knows about him is that he is a famous immigration bureau agent, and 99% of cases are successful. However, a system window appeared in front of Minjun. It was a prisoner's questionnaire. A SIF profile ID 666. Dispatcher Service, Multidimensional Intelligence Transfer Committee. Location, Earth, Space 22, 189, Fourth Rank Province. Type of employment, sentence to correctional labor. The offender is under limited influence on the mind. Language, Korean. This is something that few people know about. The hidden identity listed on the profile is Yi Minjun, a human. But in reality, he was not human. One day, he committed a crime and was sent to prison instead of just being killed on the spot. His body and mind were taken from him, and he was sentenced to forced labor. All important work, too dirty for other workers, is given to such with an altered mind. A new system window indicated that the memory operation had been activated. Work is a prison, and dismissal is liberation. A new system window notified that 200 Delanta had been added to the deposit. Every time he successfully completes his job in this terrible place called Earth, Minjun receives the universal currency Dalant. He exhaled heavily and threw his head back. A new system window stated that a transfer of Tudian Dalant had been made. The notification was from the tax collection center. The operation prisoners pay taxes was carried out from the taxpayer's account. The current balance is 20 Wadin 5 and 25 Dalant. The system politely asked to be careful. The user will be charged a fee if their account reaches a negative balance. If the user delays payment, he will be sentenced to death. Bail for immediate release 5,120,490 Dalant. Minjun mentally repeated 5 million Dalanta. Here the meaning of tax payments is different from that on Earth. On Earth, payouts are paid upon retirement but here the user must pay them himself in order to retire. The reward that Minjun received for today's order is most likely just a couple thousand Delantas. And since earning a talent turns into hell as soon as you become a prisoner, one day you still have the idea of stealing earthly currency, exchanging it for talent and paying for release. Minjun operated the windows of the system, but the driver did not see these windows, and therefore was a little surprised to see his client in the back seat waving his hand. Minjun, thinking about theft, decided that everything was better, just not to live like him. He is tired of this life. Minjun flipped through the prisoner's manual. It stated that prisoners could legally obtain Dalant in the following ways, capture or kill a wanted criminal, carry out a special task from the Bureau, solve a food problem in Dimension 31E490, obtain information about a pirate crew, develop a vaccine or cure for a virus that arises every two years, the reward for all these tasks was not that big, but suddenly Minjun noticed one task. It stated that the soul of a criminal with the identification number as if one must be obtained and delivered. The reward is 7,000 thousand talent. Minjun remembered Daphne's words that once the main fortune editor of the dimension prophesied that in the farthest corners of the dimension there was a part of the soul dropped by the most dangerous criminal in history. Minjun laughed quietly and covered his face with his palm. He thought that if only he could complete this mission. Minjun quietly called the system a cowboy farm. The taxi driver started the conversation by saying that his client was probably having a difficult time at work. The taxi driver encouraged him and said that Minjun should hold on. 
Minjoon countered by saying that he thought it was time for him to leave because he had been working too long already. He thought that who would have known that he would work there for 800 years, but now he would definitely leave this disgusting company. Minjun clasped his hands and buried his face in them. At the police office, Chief Jiangpul asked if he knew the three most effective ways to kill a boss. The boss was sitting at the table, reading information from a sheet, and Jiangpul stood in front of him, his hands clasped behind his back. Jiangpul thought, looking away, and replied that he was not sure, but with a headshot, should he cut his throat, or is it better to use his abilities? Chief Jiangpul loudly replied that he was wrong. He closed his eyes and showed one finger, explaining that, firstly, you need to slack off at work and let the boss die of hypertension, and secondly, you need to create confusion by doing something other than your job, so that the boss is fired and starves, and in third, you need to ignore the chain of command and talk nonsense about the boss. He hit the table with his palm and said loudly that he needed to make his boss so neurotic that he would get cancer and die. Jiangpul asked why asking for more manpower sounds crazy. He added that the territory of the 4th Brigade is too dangerous for civilian personnel. Chief Chongpul loudly stood up from the table and shouted that it was Chongpul who thought so. He asked Jiangpul to forget about it and stop making him nervous. The boss ordered Chongpul to leave, pushing a piece of paper towards him. Chongpul took the sheet in his hands and asked what is it. The chief explained that this case was assigned to the second team. Contrary to this, the chief asked Jiangpul to take charge of it. Jiangpul read the document and asked, Is there a missing person? He said that they already don't have enough workers, and then there's this. Before he could finish speaking, the boss angrily ordered him to stop making excuses. He said loudly that Jiangpul will do this even if they lack something. The boss waved his hand and the paper on his desk flew apart. Jiangpul stood with a gloomy expression. Chief Jiangpul arrogantly asked why he was still standing. The boss shouted reproachfully, Why are the orcs so slow and so annoying? Jiangpul squeezed the piece of paper in his hand and humbly said that he was leaving. Meanwhile, Minjun arrived at his office and was met by Katerina. She drew his attention to herself and asked when he would finally change his phone. She was a brown-haired woman with blue eyes in a pink suit. Her full name is Katerina Kang. She is 25 years old and she is Minjun's assistant. She put down the newspaper she had just been reading and asked him with an irritated look if he knew how tedious it was to write messages individually. Frowning her brows, she showed him the screen of her phone, which contained contacts, and said that the second most important contact in her phone was Minjun. She added that he is even higher than his mother on the list. Minjun asked who is the first contact. Katerina, after hesitating a little, said that this was a credit company. Minjun walked up to his desk and noticed a huge box. He asked Katerina what it was. She raised her index finger and said with a smile that she grabbed it on the way. Minjun opened the box and saw a huge amount of potatoes. He asked how many potatoes Katie bought and why would a person living alone need so many. She took the blue notebook from the table and said that she needed it to share with her boyfriend, who also lives alone. She added that Minjun must like cheap food since he is already an old man. Minjun was clearly hurt by the last phrase. Sighing heavily, he advised her not to be a spendthrift and to live more economically. He sat down at his workplace and asked Katerina if she came here, then it was probably for work. Katerina showed him the blue notebook with a smile and said that he had guessed right. The word request was written on the blue notebook. Katerina put it on his desk and said that she asked the Immigration Bureau to hold off on this because she was not sure that Minjun would take on this case. Minjun took the notebook in his hands and said a little thoughtfully that if she says that, then this matter is dubious. He asked, missing person? Katerina responded positively and said that the president of Hyacin Industries, Yang Tijun, had disappeared. Katerina explained that his company has a net income of 300 billion, but he has not shown up for work since last week just evaporated. The Bureau suspects that he may be an alien living on Earth without documents. And we also need proof, even if he doesn't return. Katerina showed Minjun a mini-presentation that she had drawn herself. He noticed one strange picture of a man with eight legs and money. He asked what is this. She answered with a smile that she had drawn an alien. Katerina continued to fill Minjun in on the matter, 
saying that without this, the government could not lay claim to his shares. Minjun asked if there is any heir. Katerina, leaning on his table, said that he had no close relatives. There may be a will, but the Bureau must first obtain it. Minjun read the information from the Blue Notebook and said that if inheritance is possible without blood relationship, then it seems they want to get it before the will is found. Katerina approached his face with a slight smile. Minjun hit her on the forehead with irritation and ordered her to move away. Minjun stood up and said that if Katerina brought something as boring as a missing person, then perhaps the government really needs these shares. Katerina was a little distracted because of the bruise and said that perhaps this was so. Minjun, with a calm face and holding a blue notebook, said that maybe it would be a good idea to get rid of debt this time. He said he was leaving and asked her to remember to close the door before leaving. Katerina, sitting on his desk, asked if he would really start right now. Minjun left her question unanswered and left, and she took the potato in her hands and said that Minjun is a workaholic. Minjun walked out of the building and noticed a goblin boy sweeping the street next to the bookstore. Minjun called him by his name, Dongchul. Dongchul turned to him and greeted the owner with a smile. Minjun immediately panicked and loudly began to scold Dongchul, saying that he asked him to stop calling himself the master. Minjun told Dongchul to call herself boss. People won't understand it that way. Dongchul put his fist to his mouth and, blushing, looked away. He said the pronunciation is so difficult. Afterwards, Don Chul turned to Minjun and said that the boss was on the first floor. Don Chul is a little confused. Don Chul started saying unintelligibly that the first floor means boss and the second floor means master. Don Chul pointed his finger at Minjun. And Minjun, a little nervous, asked rhetorically why Mr. Lakefield needed to introduce Minjun as the owner of the store. Don Chul bowed to him and again, calling him master asked him to take care of himself. Minjun entered the bookstore and was a little surprised. He noticed a cactus and asked if he had managed to revive it. It was amazing for Minjun. Minjun added that they are elves for a reason. An elf with long blonde hair noticed that Minjun had arrived. He was dressed in a white kimono and with a tired look told Minjun not to touch the other plants anymore. He added that he was of course not sure what exactly Minjun was doing, but how could the cactus dry out like that? This elf is named Lakefield, and he is the boss of the Sunrocks bookstore. Minjun scratched his head and said that he did not buy this cactus, and Katie gave it to him. Lakefield was furious and ordered Minjun to stop. He asked loudly, how much more is possible? Lakefield explained that this is a bookshop, not a vegetable garden. Minjun sat down next to Lakefield and asked with a smile how Dong Chul was coping. They both looked at the doors that were open while Dong Chul was sweeping the street, all the dust flying inside. Lakefield said sarcastically that Dong Chul was employee of the year. Minjun said with a slight smile that it was true. Lakefield, with a tired face, asked how he could help. He added that he doesn't think Minjun came just to chat. Minjun said with a slight smile that he had to find someone, and Lakefield was doing just that. Minjun thought about how Lakefield used to be their agent, so he thinks quickly. Lakefield reluctantly agreed since it was a request from Minjun. Minjun handed him a blue notebook, saying that in exchange for this, he would reduce the rent. Lakefield calmly said that he was grateful, but his pride would not allow him to pay less. And if Minjun reduced it, then Lakefield would have to pay practically nothing. Lakefield began to study information about the missing person, and then asked for help with a slight smile and extended his hand up. Streams of water appeared in the air, and from these streams a tiny elf girl in a white dress appeared. Minjun watched this with a calm face and thought about what they say. When someone summons an elemental spirit, that spirit takes the form of the one the summoner misses the most. Minjun was surprised by the speed of summoning the spirit and asked what the secret was. Lakefield responded that it takes focus and practice. Lakefield smiled and showed the spirit Yang Tijong's profile and asked if she could help find this person. The spirit smiled widely, grabbing her dress, and then, turning into blue pollen, flew away from the bookstore. Lakefield handed the blue notebook back and said that he would contact Minjun when he received an answer. Minjun thanked him. Evening came. Minjun was sitting in the office when suddenly there was a knock on the door. Minjun invited the one who was knocking to come in. The door opened, 
Dong Chul stood behind it with a wide smile. Dong Chul was slurring his voice again. He informed Min Jun that Lakefield was asking him to come. Min Jun was surprised that he managed it so quickly and began to get up from his seat. He came to the bookstore and asked how things were. Lakefield calmly replied that he had found it. Min Jun said with a smile that the boss is simply the best in this business. Looking a little gloomy, Lakefield asked why Min Jun was looking for this man. Min Jun answered with incomprehension that he needed to be interrogated. Lakefield asked, Are you serious? He added that then they need a specialist in another matter. Min Jun, surprised, wanted to say that this couldn't be true, but Lakefield interrupted him, saying that it seemed that this man was not breathing and he was dead. Min Jun, surprised, asked if it was a man. Lakefield replied that he was not sure, and added that it was difficult to call such a person. Min Jun found young Tijong in the forest. He was hanging tied to a tree branch. He was wearing a suit, but no shoes, and his legs were covered in wounds and scratches. Sunset time. Min Jun told Katya that he searched everything he could, but found only a letter in his pocket, and, apart from the mention of a will, nothing useful. Min Jun asked, but the Immigration Bureau hasn't found the will yet. Katarina responded positively, saying that this letter was kept in the main office of the Changchun Main Bank. Min Jun said that then they won't be able to get the letter if it's there. He said that they should forget about the will for a while and instead check the house belonging to President Yang Tijun. Katarina replied that she understood him and said that she would then contact the bureau and submit a request for a visit. Min Jun looked at the corpse with a gloomy face and thought about trying to retreat if it became difficult to prove that he was an alien. Some time later, Min Jun and Jianpu visited a house owned by Yang Tijun. Jianpu was surprised when he saw Min Jun. He asked him what he was doing there, and Min Jun was surprised that Changpul was here. The elf in a suit and glasses joyfully said that he did not know how to arrange everything, and since they both submitted a request for a visit, it is very good that they already know each other. This elf walked up to the white car and opened the door. He asked them to handle it themselves and just return the keys later. The elf announced that he was leaving. The elf got into the car and drove off. Changpul asked with a dissatisfied look, double booking. Jiangpul was a little annoyed that this elf left so quickly. Minjun looked at his phone and asked Jiangpul to let him clarify the situation. Changpul, going inside, asked, What is there to clarify? He added that he was only here as an assistant. When they entered the courtyard, Changpul said with irritation that he should have guessed that if that idiot, the leader of the second brigade, conveyed this to Changpul, then everything would happen like that. Min Jun asked if another team was doing this first. Chompel explained that recently there had been a sharp increase in the disappearance of elves, and therefore the second team was sent to the special investigation headquarters, and missing person cases were left to individuals like them. Orcs disappear every day. Chompel said as he walked up the stairs to the house that the leader of the second team had apparently figured out that the bureau would be given the credit for the case, and so he had transferred the case to them. Minjun said that he was honestly glad that Changpul was assigned to him because it was better to work with Changpul than with those empty heads. Minjun smiled. Jiangpul said that he appreciated these words. Jiangpul's phone rang. He answered the call. The boss shouted his name loudly. The boss added that someone from the bureau must be there. The people from the bureau told them to cooperate. Jiangpul, with an irritated and intimidating face, said that he understood everything quietly adding about what a jerk the boss is. The boss asked what Jongpul said, but Jongpul hung up the call. Minjin smiled and offered to share the reward after the investigation was completed. Jongpul also smiled and repeated after Minjin, Divide? He said that given their relationship, Minjun might just buy him a drink. Minjin smiled, agreeing with him, and then offered to go and earn money for a drink. They began to examine the house. Minjun was looking around the living room, and Jiampul was in the office downloading information from the computer. Minjun was trying to get something from the top shelf of the bookcase when Jiampul entered the living room. He had a flash drive in his hands and said that he would send Minjun a copy of the hard drive tomorrow. Minjun agreed with him, taking something black from the shelf, and added that he was leaving the sending of files to Jiampul. They heard strange sounds and turned towards the source of these sounds. Jiangpul turned to Minjun and asked if it sounded like a sword crying. 
He said that ego swords make similar sounds. Minjun shushed him and asked him to be quiet for a second. He thought that this might be evidence. They came to the kitchen in search of the source of the sound, and both were very surprised. Minjun noticed a frying pan that was shaking a little and making these sounds and asked, Is that really it? Jiangpo took the frying pan in his hands and with a thoughtful look asked why the cry of the sword was coming from the frying pan. After a moment, he became serious. He threw the frying pan on the floor and it flew off. Minjun said that Jiangpo scared him and asked what happened. Is this frying pan really talking? The frightened Jiangpo shouted that yes, she was talking. Minjun walked up to the frying pan lying on the floor and, touching it, said that he should let him talk. And why throw it away right away? Jiangpo pressed his fingers to his palms and said this thing. He corrected himself that this frying pan was making very strange sounds. When Minjun picked up the frying pan, it started to moan. Minjun threw the frying pan on the floor, and it flew even further, he swore, and Chongpo, a little nervously, reported what he had said. They both stood with a gloomy look over the frying pan and were silent. Minjun exhaled heavily and still took it in his hands. He addressed it with the question, what is it? Red lights on the frying pan lit up, creating an image of a face. Frying pan thanked Minjun for asking her. It said that it is the great cook of the Helid dimension. It contains a partial copy of Dignov Alcha TQ memory. Cookware with built-in artificial intelligence. Minjun felt uneasy because the frying pan continued to moan. A day earlier, when Minjun discovered the president's corpse, he said that they did a good job. Minjun realized that they were homunculi. Since they used the same DNA as Chairman Zhang Tijun, the results would be positive if they decided to do a DNA test. But why did they hang the fake in the forest a week after it went missing? Why would anyone need this? If Zhang Tijun's death is revealed, the only benefit will be the heir who will receive the 300 billion dead, and the loser will be the country that cannot get the wealth of the illegal alien. And even if Zhang Tijun is an alien who hung a fake for a company worth 300 billion, it is literally impossible to create a homunculus. In Korea, to do this you need to be one of the seven richest people or have some kind of technology to do this. How much are the shares of the company owned by Jang Tijun worth that they are creating this problem? And now that the homunculus is involved in all this, the situation is getting out of control. And at this rate, it's better for Minjun not to interfere. But it would be nice if he could get at least some evidence from Jang Tijun's house. Present tense. The alien cook in the form of a frying pan exclaimed with joy that it had been collecting dust for so long and had not been used for so long that he was even a little excited. Minjun thought that this thing's ego was higher than Everest. This is not easy to find on Earth. The frying pan continued to chirp about how it not only represents 245 dimensions, but also knows almost 2 million recipes. It also comes with micro-vibration features that allow any user to cook delicious meals. Minjin thought that based on this, it was quite possible that Jang Tijun was an alien. The frying pan continued to chirp that it could see and recognize any objects within a 3 meter radius, which would help it inspect the ingredients and give advice. Also, the user does not have to worry about communication, because it can read minds. Minjun thought with annoyance and a gloomy expression, maybe he should just throw it away. He asked if Jang Tijun ever used it. Frying Pan looked away in embarrassment and answered positively, adding that this happened quite often. Minjun continued to say that he had a question about Jang Tijun. The Frying Pan happily replied that she would answer the question only if it could ask for a favor. Minjun asked which one. Frying Pan sheepishly responded by asking him to quit, just like Minjun wanted. It added that it loves disdainful games and new stimulation. Minjun's last nerve cell died. He threw the frying pan with all his might. After that, the frying pan began to say that it seems that Jang Tijun is an ordinary person, and the frying pan has been thinking this way since their first meeting. Minjun asked when was the last time they saw each other. The frying pan with a smiling face replied that a week ago somewhere around 2 o'clock in the morning. This added that he saw Jang Tijun leaving in the middle of the night, and also thought, what kind of meeting was he going to so late? It reported that the next day I felt movement in the living room and calmed down, thinking that nothing had happened. Minjun asked in surprise, What? He turned to Jiampul and asked who came into the house after the incident. 
Changpu replied that today was the first time since Chairman Jiang Tijun left the house. Min Jun frowned. Frying Pan said with confidence that that person was not Jiang Tijun. He always just comes, searches the house and leaves right before dawn. This man came for five days in a row, but then just disappeared. Min Jun asked if he saw that face. Frying Pan worriedly replied that he was sorry, but this one did not have night vision mode. But judging by the silhouette, it was definitely a person. Min Jun began to reason that in order to come and go without using the door, one needed warp magic. He thought about it, and Chonpul looked at him with confusion and asked what the frying pan said. Min Jun turned to him and replied that there was someone here who had searched the house before them, and most likely entered and left using warp magic. Min Jun became serious and used magic. He explained that he was looking for traces of magic in the present, but he should have looked in the past. Jampul, not understanding what was happening, asked what Minjun was doing. Minjun replied that there is a spiritual world that intersects with the material world, and magic leaves traces in the spiritual world. Jampul had a blank face. Minjun realized that this was too difficult for him. He added that now he only had to find traces of the use of deformation magic and find out who entered the house. Minjun walked to the place where there were the most traces of magic and asked, So he entered here? Frying Pan responded positively and added that he always appeared right here. Minjun looked up and ordered someone to find him. He added that there are ten traces of warp magic, and considering that this person has been here five times, then everything matches perfectly. Minjun told Jiampul that he found traces and suggested that they try to track them. Chanpul asked what this frying pan was even talking about. Minjun, with a casual look, suggested that Jiampul go with this frying pan, since it was the only witness. Frying Pan happily asked if Minjun wanted to tie him up and steal him. Minjun put it in the trunk, and when they got into the car, he suggested with a dejected look that they should not touch it unnecessarily. Chonpul, sitting behind the wheel, said that he agreed with him. Chonpul had a serious face. He asked if all magicians could do this. Minjun answered in the negative and added that Jiangpul himself knows that Minjun is just experienced. Jiangpul agreed saying that since Minjun's life is so long, even if he is only a quarter elf, he must have been using magic for a long time. They were driving along the highway. Jianpul said that Minjun's abilities are amazing. Minjun crossed his arms and asked if Jianpul was going to retire in five years. He, with a tired look, answered positively and said that orcs age slowly, but it happens very suddenly. Minjun, looking at him with a smile, said that he didn't know about the rest of the orcs but Changpul was holding up well. Minjun offered to work at the bureau once Jianpul retired. Jianpul replied with a slight smile that Minjun knew their rules. Minjun asked, don't piss off the troll. Changpul frowned and replied that he was talking about a different rule. At the crossroads they turned. Minjun said with a dejected look that he needed a book with all their rules, otherwise how was he supposed to remember it all? Chongpul with a smile suggested acting according to the situation and doing only if the occasion allows. A few moments later, Jiangpul asked Minjun to forget what he just said or else his mom would throw a tantrum. Their car stopped at a traffic light. Minjun asked, isn't she already worried now? Jiangpul replied that the news used to say when the bureau caught a drunk orc officer beating a man, Jiangpul raised his voice, a party for the people, organized by the people. The land has always belonged to them. Let power return to the people. The main human party, candidate number seven, Choi Teek. There was silence. Minjun pressed the power window button and then suggested listening to the radio. Jiangpul agreed and the radio announcer said they were moving on to the main news. A visit from the Jalanko dimension. Princess Berm of the unified royal family was announced. The visit was rumored to be in preparation for mass migration. However, the United Nations currently denies this. The Phantom is calling a protest today in front of the Congress building. Their request is taking place. Minjun looked away from the radio for a second, noticing traces of magic outside. The announcer finished talking about how the bill concluded that it would violate their privacy. Minjun asked Jianpul to stop and said that the traces of magic diverge here. Jianpul got out of the car and said with a regretful look that this place was an orc community. The place looked like a junkyard. There was cracked asphalt, 
Scattered road barriers, cones, and several orcs were sitting at a table made from a huge metal barrel, playing a board game. Ninjun also got out of the car and said that if this person came every night for five days, then he must have settled here for a while. And if you think about it, this area is perfect. Fortunately, there is no trace of invisibility magic here, so that Minjun suggested checking the cameras. He added that he was leaving it to Jiangpu. Jiangpu scratched his chin and looked away, saying that he understood everything and would try. The next day they met at the same place, and Minjun cried out in a drawn-out voice, What? He asked in surprise, holding a tube of sweets in his hands, Is there no video surveillance in the entire area? Chungpul explained that Minjun knows what it's like in the orc area. Minjun said that he understood why Jiangpul had that expression on her face yesterday, and since that's the case, they will use the good old methods. Chungpul asked in surprise, Good old ones? Minjun responded positively and explained that they would use the traditional method. With slight irritation, he threw the tube wrapper into the street and said with slight irritation that to think that a magician 21 century would begin to conduct research manually. They came to the York pub. Chonpul greeted Lee Tesum. Tesum was the bartender of this establishment and paid attention to those who came. He asked with a sullen look, What is Jiangpul doing here? Did he receive the report? Minjun asked if they knew each other. Chonpul smiled and replied that this was within his authority. He turned to Tess, placing a photo on the bar counter, and said that he only had a couple of questions. Chonpul asked if Tesum had seen anyone suspicious nearby. He added that this man has the same build as the guy in the photo. He mostly operates at night, and he has the scent of a wizard. The photograph, in very poor quality, showed a guy in sweatpants with a backpack. Tessum took the photo and thought about it, and then went into the next room behind the curtain. He said that since Jiangpul asked, he would watch for his sake. He added that he would make one call and come back, so let them wait here. Jiangpul turned to Minjun with a smile and said that if Tesum doesn't know, then no one knows. After a short amount of time, Tesum returned and said that someone told him that they saw someone similar in the third quarter and let Changpul and his partner go there. Minjun looked pleased as Tesum returned the photo and wondered if this would be easier than he thought. They came to the third quarter and began asking passing orcs if they had seen the guy from the photo. Evening came. Chongpul said that there was poor security in the orc area, so they didn't even go out at night. And since the criminal walked around here every night, it would obviously be easy to spot him. They looked at the high-rise building in front of them. Minjun turned to Jiangpul and using detect magic traces, said that he thought he had found it. There was a large clot of magic in the apartment he was looking at. Minjun said that he found the guy who used warp magic. They entered this house and approached the apartment. There were magical mechanisms on the door of the apartment. Minjun said a little surprised that this guy used a barrier. He must have wanted to live. Changpo looked at the door and saw nothing. He asked again, barrier. Minjun said that it looks like this guy doesn't have enough skills since he put up multiple barriers at once. Minjun took out his purple knife and said with a slight smile that they will deal with these barriers one by one. Suddenly he noticed that something was wrong. Minjun smiled and grabbed the knife blade with his other hand and said that this guy is smart. Minjun asked Jiangpul to move away, explaining that this guy was trying to escape. Jiangpul was still completely confused about what was happening. The black matter flew across the city and flew into the apartment. Minjun with a terrifying look ordered this matter to take him. This matter broke the door. They saw a guy with long hair tied in a ponytail standing in his underwear and creating a portal. The guy was surprised by their appearance and looked at them. He turned around with a smile and asked if Minjun thought he would catch him. Jiangpul rushed to stop him, but the black matter controlled by Minjun was faster and grabbed this guy by the leg, pulling him out of the portal. The guy didn't understand what happened and was very surprised. The black material completely enveloped him and, tying him up, left him on the floor. He looked like a caterpillar in a cocoon and was shaking and twitching all over. Minjun haughtily agreed. Jiangpul was thrilled at how Minjun managed to handle everything. They sat this guy on a chair and tied him up. He had a tattoo on his left chest, the letters H and S surrounded by a circle. Changpul was a little surprised and asked if he was really a member of society. Minjun shook his head and explained that society. If he is not mistaken, 
is a criminal organization consisting of capable prisoners. Chongpul confirmed this information, saying that this was a waste collection site. He added that the guy's phone was clean. Minjin reasoned that his room was also nothing special. Jiangpul, walking up to him, leaned over and took him by the shoulder, saying that since they had confirmed that this guy was a member of a super-powerful criminal organization, according to Article 4 of the Constitution of the Republic of Korea, as a citizen, this guy didn't let Jiangpul finish his sentence and spat in his face, sending him away. He added that Jiangpul is not even a person, but just an idiot who thinks he is a person. Jiangpul straightened up, and his appearance became very gloomy. The guy asked with contempt and mockery if Jiangpul thought that if he put on the uniform, he would become one of them. The guy added that he is so angry that he just wants to tear Jiangpul apart. Minjun turned to Jiangpul and said that he wouldn't help him if he said something like that. Jiangpul swallowed his saliva and agreed with him. A moment later, Jiangpul was already holding this guy by the throat. In his other hand, he had a hammer. Minjun asked why he got it. Jiangpul asked if this wasn't Minjun's style. Minjun called it barbaric and asked Jiangpul to put the hammer away because he had something better. He took out a purple knife. Jiangpul, a little nervous, said that it was even better. Minjun said that he misunderstood him and asked him to take a closer look. On Minjun's hand, there was a small larva from which a strange insect hatched. Minjun brought this insect on his index finger to this guy's face. The guy with a frightened look wanted to say that Minjun wouldn't dare, and cursed. Minjun said that it's great if the guy has already guessed everything. With an intimidating look, he asked if he could share it with them. The guy remained silent, lowering his head nervously. Minjun called him a moron, and the insect bit into his nose. Minjun asked Jiangpul to give him the recorder. He handed him the recording device while the bound guy trembled and moaned. Tears flowed from his eyes and saliva flowed from his mouth. Minjun started recording and cast two spells. Jiangpul asked what is this. Minjun turned his head to him and said with a smile that this is a happiness bug. It penetrates directly into the opponent's brain, causes dopamine to explode, causing a surge of happiness in the body. Since Minjun recorded the spell on a voice recorder, he can use this bug for a while. Sometime later, water was dripping from the faucet into the sink in this guy's apartment. The splashes of drops woke up this guy, and he first exhaled, then screamed, and then heart-rendingly began to beg to let him go. He shouted that he hated this place. He begged to be allowed to return. Minjun said, great, then again. The guy, all sweaty, looked at him with fear. Minjun leaned over and showed him the microphone with an indifferent face, asking if this guy wants to go back to his happy memories. Minjun explained that this is a spell to control the happiness bug. The guy sat with his mouth wide open, and Minjun, meanwhile, demanded to tell him everything he knew, and then he would be released. Meanwhile, the happiness bug connected to the arterial system of this guy's brain. The guy, looking frightened, jabbered loudly that he had no idea where Jang Tijun was. This guy just had to find the secret vault hidden in Jang Tijun's house using magic and bring all the contents to the customer. Minjun asked again, looking down, secret storage? He added that he had not seen anything like this when he examined the house and then asked who the customer was. The guy got nervous and said with a wide smile that he didn't know his name, but he was sure that it was him. Jiangpul interrupted with a furious expression on his face. He grabbed the guy by the neck and swung his fist. He said loudly that this scoundrel continues to lie even now. The guy shouted that it was true. He added that he acted on orders from the center. Jiangpul, alarmed by everything that was happening, turned to Minjun, asking what to do now. Is Minjun going to continue? He added that it is too dangerous. Minjun knows. The guy was trembling in pain and fear while Jiangpul squeezed his throat. Minjun put his finger to his chin and looked down, thinking that everything becomes more complicated if the customer is a dragon. Jiangpul was very worried about Minjun's darkened face. Minjun thought that dragons are creatures that can become high-class creatures in just one generation. They account for more than one or two people who disappeared because they simply did not please them. These influential creatures rule society. They are immensely rich have enormous power and control everyone like puppets. Jiangpul tried to make Minjun wake up from his thoughts by calling his name. Minjun asked him to wait and added that he still had questions. 
After some time, the police already arrived at this house. The guy who broke into Jang Tijun's house was tied up with a towel thrown over him, and Min Jun told the policeman that if he didn't want to listen to Min Jun, then let him at least listen to the recording. The policeman politely asked them to follow the rules. Jiangpol asked Min Jun if they would leave that guy like this. Min Jun, with an indifferent face, replied that he did not care about him, and let him enjoy the lucky bug. He added that informing the police was indeed the right decision. The guy they're talking about was walking in handcuffs with a distraught and scared face. Chongpul asked, do they usually just die? Minjun replied that if he received decent treatment, the chance of survival would be somewhere around 50%. Minjun thought that it all depends on what effect the magic potion will have. That guy had a bulging vein on his forehead. Minjun and Jiangpul were returning in a police car. On the radio, the announcer announced the start of the news. A decision was made for Princess Vernus's visit. And this is Korea. Minjun didn't listen to the radio and, looking out the window, thought that most dragons don't bother themselves with such things. He thinks there are only about four culprits. However, he still doesn't understand their motives. Who is this? Frowning, he pondered as the radio announcer said that Hyacin Industries had set a price cap due to the news of the purchase of government shares and the existing 15% of the market capitalization. This is a record for Hyacin Industry. Minjun said quietly to Hyacin. And then it dawned on him, and he shouted, Hyacin Industry. Changpul was also surprised and said that this company is the boss of Jiang Tijin. Minjun pointed to the radio with a calm face and explained that this is a common occurrence for such bigwigs. But will they cope while the boss is away? Changpul sat with a thoughtful look and suggested that maybe Jiang Tijun had approved everything before he disappeared. Minjun crossed his arms over his chest and thought. He asked if Jiangpul was hungry. Minjun suggested they eat together. Jiangpul asked what is this. Minjun replied that it was a ham and cheese sandwich. He added that he heard that Katerina made it for herself. Changpul asked in surprise, does she know how to cook? Minjun replied that he couldn't vouch for that. They stopped near a bookstore. Minjun went up to his office and put all the evidence and papers on his desk. A little while later, Minjun thought that they were basing it on the information that guy said. Minjun once again visited Jang Tijin's house to find the secret storage, but found nothing, and the frying pan is silent about it. They returned to the office to discuss further actions. Minjun sat on the sofa in the office, throwing his head back, and summed up. He said that that was all, and it was time to give up, because he would lose even before he got anything. He said that he would visit the immigration bureau tomorrow. He was interrupted by Katerina, who burst into the office shouting joyfully that she had arrived. Minjun noted her presence, and Jiangpul turned to her with a surprised look and said that if we are talking about demons, then here is one of them. Katerina asked in surprise why Uncle Chanpul was also here. Chanpul, irritated, asked why she called him that. Katerina indifferently asked if he had seen his face. She walked up to the table and, leaning over the frying pan, asked what was doing here. She added, did the two of them really want to cook something delicious without her? Minjun said with an indifferent face that if Katerina touched the frying pan, she would want to wash her hands. She asked with confusion, what is this? Jiangpul became nervous. The frying pan made a smiling face when Katerina took it in her hands and said that she was glad to meet you. Katerina shouted in surprise, what does this mean? Is this really alive? The frying pan told Katia that she could call it stupid. Katerina almost called the frying pan stupid, and then, a little nervously, she asked it to stop and asked if it didn't have another name. She added, is it okay to call it retarded? The frying pan answered, beaming with joy Dignoff Alchitikyu. Katerina began to figure out how to use the frying pan, and Minjin told her not to even think about taking it away. Katerina agreed and asked, what's wrong? What kind of problem? Minjun answered in the negative. Katerina said with a smile that something was definitely going to happen. She added that she was glad she took it with her, and it was no wonder she was so eager to have a drink. Minjun said that he was not in the mood to drink, and Jianpul, waving his hand, also refused, saying that he was driving. Katerina rummaged in her bag, and then took out a red bottle and joyfully exclaimed that this was a 37-year-old Kingsley Astan, the collection of the gnome maestro. 
Changpul and Minjun immediately headed towards the exit, discussing the snacks they would take with the alcohol. After some time, there were a lot of snacks and drinks on the table, and those who organized this feast were relaxing, being slightly drunk. Minjun was relaxing while sitting on the sofa. Changpul pitifully asked why Katerina only calls him uncle. At that moment, drunk, she looked at him with raised eyebrows. Night fell, Minjun fell asleep right in the office on the sofa he was sitting on. He thought he felt like a corpse. Was he poisoned? Afterwards, he realized that it was just a slight hangover. Hangover. Why did he drink? Crown Prince Graham forced him. Minjin remembered that it was 250 years ago. Memories flashed through Minjin's head. He thought that he was here now. Waking up to the morning sunlight, he raised his hand. He thought that he was here on Earth and his name was Yi Minjin. Dongchul hovered over him with a smile and greeted him. Minjun was lying on the floor and turned his attention to Dong Chul, saying that it seemed like it wasn't morning anymore. Dong Chul brought the mail and Minjun said that he doesn't have to bring it every day. Minjun opened one letter and said that it was on time. It was a letter of demand to appear. It stated that it was related to the current mission and there were a couple of points to correct. Below was a request to visit the headquarters as soon as possible, and if there are any problems or questions, Minjun can contact the secretary. Next was the secretary's number, the letter was stamped with a dragon, and the sender was Jenkinson. Minjun said out loud Jenkinson's request for a visit. Minjun thought that something must be going on. Some time later, Minjun visited the headquarters of the Jenkinson company. He was greeted by five men in uniform, and one of them asked Minjun to wait, addressing him as Agent Yi Minjun. This man asked Minjun to follow here. The headquarters building looked like a huge glass skyscraper with a large Jenkinson logo. Minjun assumed that he was called because of what they discovered yesterday with Jiangpul. Minjun was invited to enter. He thought that this was the CEO's office. In the office there was an elf with short hair and glasses. She said with a smile that she was already tired of waiting. Her name was Blair. She is the chief secretary of the Jenkinson Corporation, and Jenkinson himself is a dragon. The morning of the same day before Minjun's visit to Jenkinson's company, Minjun stood in the office kitchen, cutting potatoes with his purple knife. Katerina was very surprised while brushing her teeth when she noticed Minjun. She asked why didn't he take another knife. He replied that this knife is the best. Katerina began to say loudly that she had heard that this knife was used as a relic for human sacrifice. She imagined a terrible picture of how the shaman was going to plunge this knife into her. Minjun smiled as he looked at the knife and asked her not to worry because he could neutralize this knife with magic. Having calmed down, Katerina said that everything was clear to her. Minjun turned his head and turned to Jiangpul, suggesting that they try looking elsewhere today. Jiangpul agreed with him while watching TV and added that he would only need to do one report before that. The TV announcer was reporting news from the entertainment industry. Actress elf Miss Rent Zerafi was chosen as Ex Mi's muse and is currently finishing filming a perfume commercial. A beautiful elf with blonde hair was shown on TV. Next to her was a golden bottle of perfume. The announcer continued to say that she was introducing a new scent with elf body odor. Jiangpul blushed a little, and Katerina turned her attention to the TV, tying her hair. She sat down on the sofa and began diligently typing something on her phone. Jiangpul said that he didn't even know how great the body of elves smelled until he tried this perfume. Katerina puffed out her cheeks and, clearing her throat, turned to Minjin. She asked why there was no such aroma coming from him. She clarified, he's an elf in the prime of his life, isn't he? Minjin continued cooking, hesitating a little. He replied that this aroma would not be felt, because he was only a quarter elf. Minjun is currently at headquarters. Blair said they had not seen each other for a long time. Minjun sat down at the table and asked with a calm face, What happened? Blair adjusted her glasses and began to talk about how the case of the disappearance of Chairman Jang, which was assigned to Minjun, became extremely interesting to Chairman Jenkinson after he was told the identity of the arrested HS member. She was assigned to contact the agent assigned to the case. Minjun looked away. Blair asked who he thought was the dragon who hired the member of the criminal organization. Blair pressed a button on the remote control, and three profiles appeared on the screen. She said they believe these three are the prime suspects. 
The first profile belonged to a blonde guy named Halisbade. The second suspect was a woman named Vitravia. She was pregnant. The third suspect was a girl with short hair named Edeline. Minjoon realized that he thought so, but he still couldn't understand. Minjoon asked why the chairman did this and why he wanted to see him. Blair, with a serious face and crossing her arms, asked what Minjoon knows about Hyacin industry. Minjoon clarified, isn't this a pharmaceutical company? Blair switched the slide and replied that for others, it may be true. But Hyacin industry, which was led by Chairman Chang Tijun, has a secret mission. Her presentation slide included various tables, map marks, photographs, and a table with a list of secret missions. The 11th task was to research chemical weapons in the southern region. The 12th task was to study unknown genes. And the 13th task was to study the gene of an unknown creature. Minjun said with a calm face that this is a business, and, obviously, they are doing something like that. And she said that there was some problem in their research. The fact is that they were conducting dangerous research on dragon families. Frowning slightly, Minjun thought that he understood everything. After all, dragons are immune to all poisons. They are strong, so maybe that's why Hyacin Industry is interested in them. However, dragons are too proud to allow research to be carried out on themselves. Perhaps the one who attacked Jang Tijun is a dragon embittered by research. And this dragon was extremely proud of his noble dragon family. Minjun crossed his arms and asked with a calm face if they thought the dragon did this. He added that as far as he knows, Jenkinson has always been an attention seeker, so Minjun doesn't think Jenkinson would risk his reputation. Minjun thought for a moment, and then asked why they thought that Chairman Jang Tijun was an alien. Blair replied that they had no evidence because he suddenly disappeared. She switched the slide. The new slide was dedicated to the disappearance of Jang Tijun director of Hyacin Industry. This slide was a photo that Jianpul showed to the bartender. Blair added that he then built the company and his sudden success was too suspicious. Minjun mentally established the fact that Jang Tijun is an alien. He thought, putting a finger to his chin, that the government and the immigration bureau already knew about this. They would obviously deny it, because this was the best scenario for them. Blair closed her eyes and began to take something out of the inside pocket of her jacket. She said that in addition, the investigation would be stopped when Tijun went missing. Blair placed the hologram broadcasting devices on the table and asked Minjun to open it. Minjun obeyed, and the profile of the current director of Hyacin Industry appeared in front of him. She was a brown-haired woman with short hair. Her name was Kim Yongju, and she is the confidant of Jang Tijun, who is currently missing. She is the key to the disappearance of Jang Tijun. The questionnaire also stated that research on dragons would continue. Blair said that Kim Youngju is still doing that dangerous research, and with her power, she can cover up any traces. Minjun explained that she is also quite suspicious. He asked if Kim Youngju is not devoted to Kalia. Why did she do this? Why doesn't she leak all the information to him? Isn't this a tempting way to make money? Blair, adjusting her glasses, suggested that if she wanted to get his place. Minjun asked, Is that why Kim Youngju decided to kill her boss? Minjun remembered Jang Tijun's body hanging on a tree branch and thought that, However, now we are talking about something else, because dragons are involved here, although there is still a possibility of this. Minjun stood up from his seat, leaning on the table, and thought that he should have abandoned all this in the first place. Closing his eyes, he apologized to Blair and added that he should have said this in the first place. Blair interrupted him, saying that everything was happening as expected, and if he was in doubt, he should read this letter. She handed him a letter with a red wax seal bearing the Jenkinson Company logo. Smiling slightly, she advised us to do it right now. Minjun looked reproachfully at the letter and mentally cursed. He sat back at the table and quietly said that he had no chance of not reading this letter. Blair holding her elbows with her hands, smiled. After some time, Minjun and Jiangpul went to Hyacin Industry Headquarters. They were sitting at an oval table in this headquarters when Kim Youngju and her assistants entered the room. She asked if Minjun and Jiangpul were waiting and apologized for being late. Changpul stood up and introduced himself. Minjun noticed the familiar aroma. Kim Youngju sat down opposite them and crossed her arms over her chest and said that she would only speak to the human police. 
Jiangpo, frowning slightly, said that he needed Kim Youngju to remember a couple of things. Minjun looked at Kim Youngju and thought that now he is in such a state that it is easy to drain all the energy out of him, and this woman is saying very scary things. After some time, she asked to end their meeting there. She stood up and apologized, saying that she was very tired today. Minjun addressed her as the director, Kim Youngju. He said that he heard that another manager was missing, but for some reason she chose not to mention it. Kim Youngju, a little nervous, replied that perhaps this manager had simply left and was not in touch. Minjun addressed her again as the director and said that he had a unique ability. Kim Youngju was a little surprised. Minjun asked the director if perhaps she heard the word ISP. Kim Youngju's eyes widened. ISP stands for Interspecific Sex Pheromone. This is an unexplained biological mystery. Mutants that can spread a pheromone that attracts other species are called ISP developers. The system window notified Minjun that he could carry out a special mission on behalf of the organization. Investigate the structure of some special organisms that emit pheromones that attract other species that are unable to interbreed. Reward for completion is 50,000 dalent. Minjun grinned and thought that this would be a piece of cake. Kim Youngju became nervous and Minjun asked her, since when did she have any kind of relationship with the dragon? Minjun crossed his arms over his chest and furrowed his brows slightly as he said that ISP usually only stands out when there is frequent contact with the species. Kim Youngju frowned and started to get nervous. Minjun thought that he and Jenkinson had concerns. They considered the three that Blair showed in her presentation as the main suspects. Then among them, there was a dragon who could be connected with Kim Youngju and is an ISP developer. And it's none other than that girl with the short hair. Minjun asked with a serious face, When did Kim Youngju start talking to Edeline? When Minjun and Jianpo left the office, they got into the police car. Minjun said that he couldn't believe that Kim Youngju just walked away without answering the question. Jiangpo looked at Minjun and said that this was really strange. In addition, he asked how Minjun figured out the dragon. Minjun started to say that it was one of those, but they heard strange sounds from the frying pan and Minjun fell silent. He grabbed it, shouting, What an annoying abomination. Frying pan apologized and said that since they were heading to Hyacinth Industry, he wanted to tell something and couldn't hold back any longer. Ido added that he thought he knew who they were talking about. Minjun asked irritably if the one they were talking about knew. Frying Pan responded positively and said that this is Kim Youngju. Minjun was shocked by this information. He asked again, Does the Frying Pan know director Kim Youngju? Frying Pan answered in the affirmative. When asked where the Frying Pan came from, he replied that Youngju often visited the owner's house until, in the end, she began to come every one or two weeks for an overnight stay. Minjun asked if this was really not a joke. Chongpul shouted in surprise that he heard something. The blue ball in the car began to glow. Minjun remembered that earlier, when Jiangpu was interrogating Kim Youngju, Minjun secretly cast a wiretapping spell on her. A voice was heard from the ball in the car. Youngju told someone that two investigators had just arrived. She asked why her interlocutor didn't say anything about this. And what is she going to do now? How has she still not been able to find one person? Kim Youngju was furious. She shouted into the phone that they had to find him faster than the orcs at the cost of their lives. And is this a dragon if he can't even summon a spirit? Interviewee Kim Youngju responded that being close to spirits is a trait that dragons do not exhibit, so she does everything she can. The interlocutor asked if Kim Youngju understood how many elves were looking for Jang Tijin. Minjun and Chongpul were surprised by these words. Minjun thought that there was a missing elf incident recently and remembered the missing person's search board, where there were many elves. Kim Youngju's interlocutor added that even if Kim Youngju blames them for being useless, one of them still became useful today. She explained that there was an old elf with amazing abilities hiding in the bookstore, and she had come to catch this interesting creature. When she saw him, she reported it to Kim Youngju. Dongchul greeted the client and said welcome. He approached Lakeville, saying there was a buyer here. Edeline hung up the call and said she was disconnecting. Minjun, realizing what was happening, became very serious and tensed up. Chongpul experienced the same feelings and shouted that he had to go to them. Minjun said no. He thought that if they drove 10 kilometers through all the traffic jams in Seoul, it would be too late. 
Minjun turned to Jianpo and asked him to listen carefully. He cut his palm with his purple knife. Jianpo screamed in surprise. Minjun explained that this is warp magic, and as soon as he completely moves, Jianpo will have to immediately head to Hyacin and secure Kim Youngju, while Minjun himself will resolve some issues. Minjun's body began to crumble. Finally, he ordered Jianpo to lock Kim Youngju somewhere until Minjun contacts him, because if something goes wrong, they can use her as a hostage. Chongpo asked in surprise, Hostage? Who is Minjun going to blackmail? Minjun, having almost completely disappeared, asked, Who else if not the dragon? Meanwhile, Adeline entered the bookstore and greeted the elf. Lakefield was reading a book and looked at it indifferently. With a slightly crazy smile, she demanded that he summon the spirit. Lakefield closed his eyes and, slamming the book, said that for a spiritualist, the spirit is his own alter ego and like-minded person. Adeline narrowed her eyes and tilted her head, furrowing her brows. Lakefield said that he would never call upon any spirit near someone he did not trust. Adeline, still with the same unpleasant smile, threw several documents in front of Lakefield and asked him not to talk nonsense and find this idiot as quickly as possible. By idiot she meant Jang Tijin. Lakefield looked intimidating and asked if she had misunderstood his words. Edeline grinned and began to cast magic. Her eyes lit up, and she shouted that Lakefield was an insignificant creature. One could see from afar how the windows of the bookstore flashed with a bright blue light. Lakefield barely resisted her attack. He thought it was a roar filled with the magical power of a dragon, and it literally shook his body and mind. Donchol somehow managed to open the door to the bookstore and, with tears in his eyes, ran to help Lake Phil. Dongchol remembered what Minjun said about how sometimes customers can come in and be quite annoying. He dealt with some, but they would always find holes in the ship, and if those guys showed up again. Donchol was trembling with tears in his eyes and said something about a huge explosion, a black book, and how we need to end this. Dong Chol repeated Minjun's words that you need to carefully pull out the black book with your right hand, and when you can get it out, you need to go down the open stairs. Edeline lifted Lakefield into the air by the throat and asked where they would start. Lakefield grabbed her arm with both hands and clenched his jaw in pain, frowning. Edeline was very surprised to see a flash of magic behind her. Lakefield looked at the light source and thought, this is it. He remembered Minjun bringing different plants to the bookstore. These plants had a barrier for special guests. There was a bright golden explosion that threw Edeline out of the building. Lakeville, leaning on Donchul, suggested that he go to the second floor. Donchul agreed and they fled. Meanwhile, Minjun appeared and praised Donchul for her good job with a smile. Donchul smiled with tears in his eyes when he saw Minjun. Edeline sat on the ground, slammed into a stone fence, and, having come to her senses, swore at her offenders. With a terrifyingly enraged face, she shouted that she would tear them all to pieces. She noticed a flash of red magic in the sky. It was Minjin. Edeline looked at him with a bright smile and asked, Is he in charge here? Having heard nothing in response, she shouted with rage, Is he deaf? Minjun created a protective barrier, hovering in the air above the bookstore building. He calmly replied that this was not so, and then, with a face full of rage, swore at her. Minjin called her by name and specified her age. She is 64 years old. Six years ago, she received temporary citizenship and moved to Earth. She did not have the opportunity to obtain official citizenship due to problems with measurements. Edeline was furious. She was trying to understand how this bastard knew this. Minjun asked with a terrifying look. She doesn't know who he is. He added that she was acting like a scared child, and it was obvious that she wasn't even familiar with the customs of dragons. His words made Edeline become very angry. She looked at him ready to attack. He asked her in a calm voice if she wanted to show her real face. Minjun added that he is sure that the Elder Dragons will not like the troublesome fool. Edeline looked straight ahead, feeling the civilian's eyes on her. Minjun began to move jerkily through the air, ordering Edeline to follow him, because he knew one place. Edeline said with a crazy smile that she would make him regret it. A night later, they found themselves in the forest. Minjun sat on a stone and with a crazy smile said that the elder dragons clearly frightened Edeline, since she was so scared and followed him. As soon as he mentioned them, Edeline laughed, scratched her head, 
and said that she had the impression that Minjun had led her into a trap, but now he was definitely in great danger. She said the last words with a terrifying look. A huge column of luminous magic rushed from the place where they were into the sky. Adeline transformed into a fearsome purple dragon. She attacked Minjin. He managed to dodge and looked down at the trail she left when she attacked him. He thought that it had been a long time since his last dragon hunt, and his arm was recovering too slowly. But this is not surprising, because deformation magic is quite expensive. Minjin thought that since he doesn't use his left hand anyway. He took a knife with his right hand and cut off his left hand. Purple magic flowed from the place where the hand was. The dragon screamed furiously, preparing for another attack. The purple streams of magic transformed into a new hand. Minjun clenched her fist and looked at her, and then decided that Edeline would pay for all the mess that she created on his territory. Edeline began to attack. After a moment, she was very surprised. Minjun was right under her muzzle and struck. He thought that Edeline might not even expect mercy. Even though she is a dragon, the blow manifested itself in explosive force, causing Edeline to stagger back slightly. She thought, how can a person move like that? Her eyes lit up with a white light, and she decided that then she too would use all her powers. She opened her mouth wide and began to accumulate energy to strike. Minjin looked at her in surprise and shouted, Is she really crazy to use dragon breath here? Minjun moved behind her head and loudly asked if she wanted to set the entire forest on fire. Minjun thought that of the six brains of the dragon of thinking and magic, only the hindbrain is responsible for balance, and it is necessary to aim there. Trying to cause a concussion, Minjun hit the right spot, slamming Edeline into the ground. She was smoking and lying on the ground with her mouth wide open. Minjun happily decided that it worked. Now the outer layer covering the entire body of the dragon is weakened due to the concussion. Minjin threw his purple knife at the dragon, piercing the scales, deciding to cast a curse. Edeline screamed heart-rendingly. Minjun explained that there is a blind spot that can cause paralysis. He stuck his fingernail into this place, shouting that it was here. Edeline had tears in her eyes. She started screaming that she didn't want to die. She moaned in pain as Minjun threw multiple punches. He raised his bloody hand and said that if Edeline was stupid and weak, then she did not deserve to live. Edeline was trembling in pain. She asked how dare he. Minjun was ready to finish her off when a voice was heard in his head demanding that he stop. Minjun froze and, raising his head, realized that this was the magic of telepathy. The voice asked him to think carefully, and he would like Minjun to stop there. A blonde man in a brown suit with a vest instead of a jacket stood and watched Minjun through the magic window. Minjun resolutely replied that he was afraid that he would not be able to fulfill the request. He addressed Chairman Jenkinson. Minjun explained that this vile creature had invaded his territory. Jenkinson replied that he understood. Minjun squeezed the knife in his hand and then asked not to stop him. Jenkinson responded that it was a racial issue and he had no choice. He addressed Minjun by name and asked him not to force himself to be more petty than he is now. And should he remember the dragon code? Minjun was pierced by the thought of this. The draconic code supersedes the laws of mortals. It says that only a dragon can kill another dragon. Breaking this code means declaring war on all dragons. Minjun said that it must be hard to be a dragon, especially one like the chairman. Jenkinson again addressed Minjun by name and suggested that they tell the truth because no one was listening to them. Minjun gritted his teeth, and then shouted furiously that this wouldn't have happened if Jenkinson had done his job properly. Jenkinson remained silent. Minjun put his foot on the dragon and asked with a terrifying face if he should remember the dragon code. He added that it was his business, and he was simply dealing with whoever dared to touch his property. Jenkinson covered his face with his palm and said that he was asking Minjun to listen to him as an old friend. He was polite looked up at the sky and said that this would not stop his anger. Jenkinson asked if they should take care of this. Minjun replied that he would just take some of the creature's blood. He added that it might shorten her life, but it was still better for her to die. Minjun asked what Jenkinson thought about this option. Jenkinson crossed his arms over his chest and, exhaling heavily, agreed. He added that he would send a team of paramedics. When the orderlies arrived, Minjun's hand had already healed. 
One of the orderlies said that Minjin did a good job, and they will take care of the consequences. These were people in yellow protective suits with gloves and masks. Minjun reasoned that internal organs, lymph and skin are highly valued. One of the orderlies was putting dragon scales into a bag with tongs. Minjun continued to argue that the sale of these organs is prohibited by law. An excavator arrived at this place, and the orderlies set up a whole camp near the corpse of the dragon. Minjun mentally explained that the bureau would take all the leftovers after the battle, leaving not a single drop. The body parts alone will cost a couple of million. Minjin held a test tube with dragon blood in his hands and looked at it. He thought that these were all trifles compared to the blood of dragons. Minjun brought up a system window with account information. The system notified that an old friend sent 10,000 dalent to Minjun's account. Current balance is 31,523 dalent. Minjun began to walk away with his hands in his pockets and thought that he received half of his entire balance for this case. The phone rang. It was Jiangpu who said that he had just confirmed the transfer to his account. Minjun asked how is Kim Youngju doing. Jiangpu turned to her and said that he tied her up like Minjun and asked her. They were in an old abandoned hangar. Minjun asked me to send him the address and suggested getting it over with. After some time, Minjun arrived at this hangar and he and Chonpul stood in front of Kim Youngju. A little nervously, she said that they didn't have proof of the phone records. Minjun interrupted her, telling her not to worry about it because he would get a confession from her anyway. He held the happiness bug on his finger. With fear in her eyes, she asked what he was talking about. He suggested we start. After some time, the confession that Kim Youngju made surprised him greatly. ISP is an interspecifics pheromone. After meeting Edelins while they were making love, Kim Youngju realized that she was under the influence of a pheromone. Jang Tijun, while studying her, ISP began regularly taking blood from Kim Youngju. Cheng Tijun researched and determined the principle of the influence of the blood of an ISP carrier on the blood of a dragon. During the research process, he needed as much dragon blood as he took from the ISP carrier, Kim Youngju. Minjun didn't understand. Why did he do this? They didn't have any connection with Edelins. And where did Chang Tijun get so much dragon blood from? Realization dawned on Minjun, and he turned to Jiangpul and shouted his name. Minjun loudly said the name of Chairman Chang Tijun with a worried look. He asked where his other houses were located besides the one in Hanamdong. A short time later, Minjun was riding in a taxi. He thought about the existence of a multifunctional building in Hyundi a condo in Jechong, and a villa in Gachon. The taxi was driving at very high speed. Minjun realized that Jang Tijun also has a villa in Gangwon before Sokjo. Minjun raised the phone to his ear and looked out the window. Blair answered his call, saying she was taking calls in the chairman's place for now. Minjun, with a serious face, asked her to connect him with the chairman immediately. He added that he doesn't care what he's doing now and they should talk. Minjun explained that it was about an illegal immigrant who shares a common ancestor with him. Blair's eyes widened in surprise. At sunset that same day, a black car was driving along the seashore along the highway. She stopped and the back door opened. Jenkinson said that if only he had known that he would have to date Minjun like this, he would have gone along with him in the first place. Jenkinson got out of the car with a serious face and looked to the side, putting his hands in his pockets. This is Fire Dragon Jenkinson, chairman of Jenkinson Company, Senior Dragon. He locked eyes with Minjun, and together they walked to the pier where the fisherman was sitting. Jenkinson wondered why only Tijun disappeared in the middle of the study and used the valuable homunculus in the body for suicide. The answer is very simple, because all the research was already completed. He was pumping out liters of his own blood. Minjun and Jenkinson approached the fisherman and Minjun told him, that's how he set it up, Mr. Tijun. Minjin continued to reason that since Tijun is able to pump out liters of his own blood, this means that Tijun is not a man, but a dragon. Tijun took off his fisherman's Panama hat and exhaled heavily. He stood up and asked, Are they not the clients he was waiting for? Tijun didn't look good. His beard and mustache had grown, and his hair was disheveled. Memories of Tijun. His bedroom at home. Youngju was lying in bed. She woke up to Tijun's voice, saying that he would have to leave soon, so she better start dating others. 
Yeonju got up from the bed and, not understanding what he was talking about, asked where he was going. Tijun ignored her question. Yeonju frowned, tears forming in her eyes. She said that they had known each other for more than ten years and asked them to at least say when, where and why he was leaving. Tijun stood silently near the window. Yeonju covered her face with her hands and asked who she is to him. At that time, she met Edeline. As they spent the night together, Yeonju thought about how Tijin himself told her to date others, something she kept repeating to herself. A few months after their affair, she felt strange changes in her body and decided to take a test. She hoped the child was Tijin's. Afterwards, when Yeonju was lying in bed with Tijun, she told him that she went to the gynecologist and was diagnosed with dragon type ISP. Yeonju reflected that the ISP's discovery was a very unexpected result. Tijun asked if it was true. He said he had one request. Yeonju looked at him in surprise. She thought his words were strange, as if her confession of cheating meant nothing. Tijun asked if he could take her blood. Yeonju sat up on the bed and looked at him in surprise, not believing her ears, and asked again about her blood. She was furious, but in the end she gave him her blood anyway. She thought that if only she could continue to be with him, she would give her blood at any time. She could give him as much blood as he asked for. But everything happened differently. One day, Yeonju was shocked by what Tijun said. She screamed at him not to talk nonsense. A bottle of wine fell to the floor and broke. Yeonju stood in front of Tijun and held the documents. He sat opposite her with a guilty look. She shouted that not only was he suddenly planning to leave somewhere, but he was also giving all his shares in the company to a charitable foundation. There were tears in her eyes again. She frowned and bit her lip. She continued to shout that Hyacinth Industry did not belong to Tijun alone, and they both invested in this company. Tijun exhaled heavily and calmly said that he could not divulge details. Yeonju sent it loudly. Was she wondering who she was to him? Helpful colleague? Betting? Or just a lab rat giving his blood? Yeonju ran away from him, and one day in a bar she sat with Edeline and told her what happened to her. Edeline commented on this saying that this guy clearly hurt her feelings. Edeline asked with a smile if Yeonju wanted to take revenge on him. Edeline added that she would help her with this. Yeonju bitterly accepted her proposal, but she was never able to take revenge on him, because Tijun had already left at that time. Present tense. Minjun addressed Tijun as Mr. Tijun and said that the Immigration Bureau had already searched his place. He added that Tijun used Yangju's ISP to create a virus that penetrates the dragon's immune system and is fatal. Tijun lowered his head and, closing his eyes, said the word virus. Looking at his interlocutors, he said that this is the only virus that can penetrate the body of a dragon, an indestructible body. Sitting back down on the folding chair, Tijun said that, however, the research was not finished yet. Minjun replied with a serious face that even if it was unsuccessful, this attempt is still considered a crime, and this crime is very serious. It cannot be disputed even if Tijun is recognized as mentally ill. Tijun repeated Minjun's last words with a gloomy expression. Smiling widely, he asked if they thought he was crazy. Minjun, closing his eyes, replied that this was not so, and who would create a virus that kills dragons? Tijun's face became gloomy again, and he suggested that maybe he hated dragons. He added that he thought about it for a long time and came to the conclusion that dragons are pests that destroy the social ecosystem in all its layers. All troubles come from these dragons. Minjun, looking at Tijun, thought that such individuals exist even among people, and there are those who claim that the earth could be saved if all people just disappeared. But even people do not kill each other to reduce the population. This was would be madness. That's exactly the kind of madness that was on Tijun's face. Minjun exhaled heavily and thought that Tijun had already gone crazy. Tijun asked Minjun to think about it and repeated his thought that dragons are the scum of society, and no matter how everyone defends themselves, dragons will subdue everyone. Tijun explained that other races, like colorful paints, will all eventually mix with each other, but dragons, like oil, always rise above water. They suppress and dominate other races, polluting society. Tijun turned to Jenkinson. Asking if he was wrong? Jenkinson calmly closed his eyes and replied that he was not interested in Tijun's inappropriate thoughts. Minjun, taking out his purple knife from behind his back, 
turned to Mr. Tijun and asked if he had earthly citizenship. Minjun took the knife blade with his other hand and continued to ask questions. Can Minjun provide permission that allows him to legally be on earth? Tijun replied with a big smile that he had none of it. At that moment, Minjun cut his palm and said that was what he thought. Minjun created a magical barrier and addressed Jenkinson. Jenkinson loosened his tie, saying that he did not want to fight with his species because it was pointless. Taking off his tie, Jenkinson asked with a calm face who Tijun was waiting for here. Tijun looked at how beautifully the splashes of water shimmered in the rays of the setting sun and ignored Jenkinson's question. Jenkinson began to use magic and said that since Tijun refused to answer, then he had no other choice. A magical pillar of light rushed from the ground into the sky, and Jenkinson turned into a huge red dragon. Tijun looked at him and said that, as expected, dragons are fierce. Tijun also turned into a dragon. A storm began in the sea. Lightning flashed. Ninjun said how long it had been since he fought dragons, let alone two in one day. They all rushed to attack. Tornadoes swirled around them. A dragon's roar was heard. A huge flash of magic flashed in the sea. Meanwhile, Yonju was sitting at Tijun's house. It was raining heavily. Breaking news was announced on TV. An unidentified giant typhoon swept along the coast of Sokcho, touching the entire country. The Korea Meteorological Service is currently investigating the cause of the typhoon. Yeonju sat on the carpet in front of the glass door, wrapped in a blanket, looking outside. The news anchor continued to say that they strongly advise residents living around Sokcho to familiarize themselves with the disaster evacuation plan and refrain from walking. Yeonju said Tijun's name quietly. Meanwhile, in the yoga studio for trolls, one troll was practicing. It was a girl with blonde hair tied in a ponytail and an earring in her left ear. Her name was Jiang Mian, she was 42 years old, and she was a yoga instructor for trolls. She heard a loud sound and was a little scared for a moment. Looking out the window, she noticed how a crow crashed into the glass, and cracks appeared along the glass. Several more crows did the same. Mian went to the window, asking in surprise, What is this? She put her hands on the glass and was shocked by what she saw. Outside the window there was a huge typhoon. There were several tornadoes in the sea. Thunder roared and lightning flashed. And the crows that crashed into her glass began to fall. Mian shouted, What is this? Cobblestones began to break off on the cliff. Minjun was missing both arms and was floating in the air. Jenkinson addressed him by name and said that Tijun was stronger than he seemed and he truly deserved to be called an elder dragon. Tijun was in the air right above them. Minjun began to grow his right arm with a calm face. Jenkinson, meanwhile, added that he still can't fall on his face, so he will show Tijun the power of a real elder dragon. Jenkinson began to accumulate energy, and then the fiery stream was directed towards Tijun. Tijun prepared an electric current in response. These two forces collided. Meanwhile, Minjun grew both arms, the whites of his eyes turned black and his irises turned red. Minjun, exuding dark magic, rushed to attack. Tijun, with a frightened look, remembered Yana for a moment, and then was cut along his entire torso. Minjun was merciless. He cut off the wings and ran the knife from the muzzle to the tail. Their consciousness was transported somewhere. It was raining in this place too, but it was soothing. Minjun, with a calm face, thought that this was a place where the last of his strength was spent before death. Minjun and Tijun were sitting at the bus stop. Everything around was calm and peaceful. Minjun began to speak, holding out his hand as raindrops began to fall on it. He said this is the place. But before he could finish speaking, Tijun interrupted him with a question. He asked, calling Minjun a person, isn't he in his body? Tijun was also calm. Minjun replied that he was not in his body. Tijun looked at him intimidatingly and said that this is great, and then Minjun himself will decide what to do with the information that Tijun will now tell him. Sometime later, heavy rain continued to fall in this place. Tijun explained that the last time the will was in a private safe at Changshin Main Bank. A bus was approaching the stop. Tijun stood in front of the open door of the bus and said that he really hoped that Minjun would still get acquainted with this will. Minjun asked Tijun to tell him one more thing about his plan before he left. 
Minjun asked who helped Tijin. Tijin replied that he didn't know them, and he simply accepted help from them so that his virus could spread without reaching the periphery. Tijin got on the bus and it left. Minjun looked after him with annoyance. In reality, the body of a huge purple dragon was floating in the sea, half submerged. Because of the body, the water began to become covered with bloody stains. The next day it was clear, Minjun went to the flower shop and bought a money tree. Minjun was thinking at this moment that, as expected, Jenkinson was never able to hide the consequences of this battle, and Tijun revealed one secret before his death. He infected the body of the homunculus with a virus, which was disguised as a corpse, and the virus was not simple. The magic works when it comes into contact with temperatures above 500 degrees. If the corpse had been cremated, the virus would have started to multiply and then mix with the dust and spread everywhere. But this did not happen because Minjun took the corpse to the Immigration Bureau. There, this virus will be studied when the body is examined. Minjun thought about this as he rode in a taxi that evening. He sat in the office in front of the computer and wrote a report. He continued to think that, however, even before he took the body to the bureau, a guess flashed through Minjun's mind. He thought that it was better for him to leave his body. Although he rarely relied on his instincts, the experience accumulated over 800 years told him that now he had to act contrary to his instincts. Minjun held a test tube of blood in his hands. He thought that this virus only affects dragons. How could this be useful to him? Then, before his death, Tijun told Minjun that the human smell gave him away. Tijun then asked if Yonju was okay. Minjun replied that it was. Tijun, looking down, said that everything was clear to him. And she was always anxious, always afraid to be alone, which is probably why Tijun confused jealousy with manipulation. He added that Yonju stabbed him in the back three times, the first time when she admitted to cheating on him with a dragon for months on end, the second time when she used drugs on him, treating him like a lab rat, and the third time when she called him greedy for other people's goods, greedy. Tijun kept talking about how she once almost kidnapped him along with that stupid dragon. Tijun smiled widely and said that it seemed like he was a terrible man if she wanted to kill him three times. Minjun returned from his memories to reality and wrote a report. He decided to take stock. Tijun intended to donate his share of the shares of Hyacinth Industry to a charitable foundation. The heir to all his assets, including accounts, mutual funds, works of art, jewelry, patents, real estate, and the like, is the human woman who maintained contact with him until his death. Minjun thought what a fool Tijun is. He added that Tijun is pathetic if he can't express his feelings because it won't matter after death. On this day, Yoju stood on the seashore, watching the sunset. In her hands was a will. She was shaking all over and dropped her hat. She thought that Tijun had left her forever. Yonju bent down to pick up her hat and pressed it to her chest. She thought that even though she hated Tijun, even though she tried to kill him, she never stopped loving him. Tears rolled down from Yonju's eyes. She mourned Tijun, saying his name, and then called him her boss. Some time later, Minjun was sitting in the office. Cards lay on the table in front of him. He sat with his arms crossed over his chest and said thoughtfully, Why is he so unlucky? It was fortune-telling using KH Vadu cards. The map said the weather forecast would be too hot without rain, but to watch out for sudden storms. The result of fortune-telling about relationships is the possibility of reuniting with a person whom you have not seen for a long time. There was news on TV. The International Federation of Alchemists agreed to increase gold sales to 10 tons per day, causing the price of gold to drop by 7%. Forecaster Lee Yunio will talk about weather and natural disasters. A girl with curly black hair said hello, and then said that from the afternoon, it would rain lightly throughout the country. In terms of natural disasters, a magnitude 2.6 earthquake will hit the area around Jongzengbukdu, Yenchen. Yunio pointed her palm at the places on the map that would be affected by the earthquake. She added that weather sensitive people should prepare. Minjin took one card in his hands and, getting angry, said, It's a nasty drought. It will still rain, and the health forecast may also be wrong. Minjun mixed all the cards. He thought that before he came to Earth, he predicted the future with the help of divine power, which was from another star, where it is used for research, so things may be a little different here. 
he collected the cards into a deck. And the last card in the deck was the Relationship Fortune Telling Result card. It said that there was a possibility of reuniting with a person whom Minjun had not seen for a long time, and he focused on this card. After some time, the red car was driving at a very high speed. Katarina was driving. She was taking Minjun somewhere. When she parked, she informed Minjun that they were there. He felt nauseous. He shouted as he got out of the car, Can she drive slower? Katarina, with a relaxed look, also got out of the car and said that if something doesn't suit him, then let him get a license. She asked if they were planning to go shopping today, right? Minjun responded positively, putting his hands in his pockets. They approached a low building, at the entrance of which hung a huge poster of Rent Seraphy, which advertised a perfume with the scent of an elf's body. This place was the eastern branch of the Witch Corporation. Katarina and Minjun went inside. At the entrance one could immediately notice many small shops with display windows that sold perfume and various jewelry. Two girls with the same appearance, but different eye colors, approached Katarina and Minjin. They had green hair and wore formal suits with skirts. One of them greeted Agent E. Minjin. She said that they were waiting for his visit, and the goods he ordered were already waiting for him. Katarina looked at Minjun with confusion. They came to the VIP room. Katarina was delighted. She shouted that there was everything here, from the highest grade stones to fossilized mold enzymes and dried brain slugs, neem snail secretions, and even the sap of a fairy tree. She looked at various jars, test tubes, and bottles with magical attributes. Katarina asked loudly, Aren't these powerful magical catalysts that allow you to maintain spells? She added, Are there other similar things besides what Minjun already wants to buy? Katarina looked back at him and Minjun replied that he was thinking about something simpler. He watched Katarina's vivid emotions with incomprehension and indifference. He thought that Katarina could not even imagine something like this. He wondered how much fresh dragon blood he needed to defeat Adeline. He remembered her irritated face. The employee of this place said with a friendly smile that she would help Minjun with the payment of three billion one. Minjun handed her a small piece of paper with notes and said that he would like to entrust this girl with processing some items. The girl still kindly said that the process would take about an hour, and would he like to wait in the lounge area. Minjun turned to Katarina and said that he would like to look around. Katarina immediately agreed with him. As Minjun walked down the corridor of this building, he was noticed by a man with a beaming smile. The man had green skin and red hair and was wearing a suit. He asked if he was Ye Minjun's agent by chance. Minjun, with an indifferent, even slightly intimidating face, answered positively, and then thought that he had already seen him somewhere. But where? The man approached Minjun. He was two heads taller. He bowed and introduced himself. Yung Namju. Minjun thoughtfully said his name, and then remembered that he was the lawyer in the Tijin case. Minjun informed him by pointing his index finger at him. Minjun remembered that from Tijun's will, this lawyer helped Minjun write those reports. Melju handed him a business card with a smile and apologized for not being able to give Minjun enough time due to his busy schedule. He added that since fate brought them together, would Minjun want to talk a little? They sat down in the recreation area on a chair at a table near the window. Namju asked if Minjun is an agent from the Immigration Bureau. Minjun responded positively. Namju added, Doesn't Minjun do private orders? Minjun, raising his eyebrows, replied that he was sorry, but if this was not some special occasion, then he had to refuse. Namju bowed his head and apologized with a smile, saying that he didn't know about it, and in fact there is one problem, not just for him, but for his client. Minjun also bowed, apologizing, and Namju, waving his hands, said that there was nothing wrong with it, and let Minjun forget about it. Minjun stood up from his chair with a smile, saying that he had one more thing to do on the third floor, so he had to go. He left another one of his business cards and said that it was in case Minjun changed his mind and to contact him then. Minjun followed him with his gaze, and then thought, is this really what he guessed about? Although this may not be the case, because he only met this troll a few days ago. Minjun returned to the VIP area, where the employee of this place was already waiting for him. She held a black case in her hands and announced with a smile that Minjun had returned. Minjun took this case, and when he was about to leave, he noticed Katarina. He asked why she was still here. 
Afterwards, he suggested returning. They walked towards the exit together, and Katerina looked with suspicion at the black case in his hands. Concerned, she called him by name, and then asked if he had committed any crimes or engaged in personal data laundering before. Minjun was very tense because of these words, and after being silent for a while and looking away, he answered her with a slight smile. Does he look like someone like that? Katerina raised her index finger up, telling him about her reasoning. She considered both of these options, although there are also options that he lived a completely innocent life, or was never involved in serious incidents. She concluded that she thinks Minjun is quite ordinary. Minjun looked at the system window in front of him and thought that Katerina had good intuition. The system window was his profile. Katerina looked at him worriedly, placing her hand on her chest. She asked if he could say something. Minjun asked her in surprise, what exactly? Katerina bit her lip, frowning, and then shouted that, speaking of this, isn't he a woman? Minjun's pupils constricted. He looked at her worriedly and asked what she was talking about. Katerina, blushing just a little, explained that he was simply hiding a lot. Grabbing her head, she shouted again, is he really not a woman? With a serious look, she asked him to answer, because if he seriously changed his gender, then this would cross all boundaries. Katerina created a drama out of nowhere. Minjun was already asking with irritation what she was even talking about. Meanwhile, several people in dark glasses and suits entered the building. They laid out a red carpet and stood with their backs to it, guarding it. Another guy with dark glasses and blonde hair walked along this path and, waving his hand, shouted that the Delta Brigade was ready and the Alpha Brigade was ready. He stated that the chairman would be there soon. Minjun thought with a calm face, which chairman are we talking about? An old man with a cane appeared. A middle-aged woman stood next to him, and behind them stood countless men in suits and dark glasses. The previously mentioned green-haired girls politely greeted the chairman and bowed to him. Katerina also bowed down, and Minjin still stood with an indifferent face, one hand in her pocket. This chairman looked up at Minjun, and then was very surprised and walked towards him. Everyone around was alarmed because of the chairman's actions. Minjun asked worriedly what's going on. On the way to him, the chairman tripped and fell on his stomach. Everyone around was worried. One of the guards called Minjun a brat and asked what right he had to behave like that towards the chairman. The chairman was trembling all over, but still stood up, asking his people to stop. He asked if Minjun is Mr. Minjun? Minjun responded positively, and the chairman smiled happily and called him sis. Katerina, opening her mouth wide, stated that she knew so. Meanwhile, in the Jenkinson company office, the two employees looked at Blair in surprise. Blair said with irritation that she seemed to ask not to call her while she was at work. She addressed Larissa, a small girl with wings, long blonde hair and pointy ears, wearing a shirt and skirt. It was the fairy Larissa Andriva. She was the head of the real estate security department at the Jenkinson Company. She looked away indifferently and sat down on the table, crossing her legs. She lit her pipe and blew out bubbles. Blair crossed her arms over her chest and asked why Larissa came so suddenly. Larissa calmly answered that she had found traces of someone, someone who had entered Vault B-39 on Mount Buchan. Blair was shocked by this information. She grabbed Larissa's hand and began to loudly ask what kind of idiots would enter the territory of the Elder Dragon. Larissa looked away indifferently and said that, apparently, they are very confident in themselves. She added that that is why it is quite dangerous. If they did this while the chairman is absent from the ground, then they will definitely begin to act soon. Blair, adjusting her glasses, said that she would inform the chairman about this, and for now let Larissa strengthen the security near the vault. Larissa fluttered next to Blair and said she didn't think that would be enough. Blair looked at her with a frown and said that they had someone they could turn to for help. Blair remembered Minjin. Meanwhile, at the eastern branch of the corporation, which Catherine was perplexed as to why the chairman of this corporation called Minjun a little sister. The chairman apologized and said that he was used to calling the teacher that way because he explained that the guys constantly called each other sisters about 35 years ago. Minjun closed his eyes and calmly said that they had not seen teacher Omansik for a long time. Manzik laughed and was surprised that Minjun remembered him. He added that he simply runs a small alchemy shop. 
All the people next to and behind him were very surprised when O Manzik called the corporation an alchemy shop. Manzik asked Minjun, addressing him as Master Yiminjun, if he was still studying magic. Minjun closed his eyes and replied that he quit teaching and now just works at the Immigration Bureau. Manzik screamed when he heard this information. He said with regret that to think that teacher Yiminjun is now an agent, a person who wouldn't hurt a fly, doing such a cruel job. The woman who was with Manzik held him by the elbow, and then looked at Minjun with regret. She asked if he was an agent from the bureau, and added whether he accepted private orders or only from legal entities. Manzik addressed her as a daughter, and with a dissatisfied face asked what she was saying. She clasped her hands in front of her and looked at him, trying to say something, but he interrupted her, ordering her to stop it. He said that it seemed that he had some unfinished business on the third floor, and invited all his companions to begin completing them. He started to leave, but finally looked back and turned to teacher Yiminjin. Minjin looked around when he heard his name, and Mansik said with a smile that he was glad to see you, and they should drink tea together sometime. Sometime later, Katerina and Minjin were driving back. Katerina asked where exactly Minjun taught, and he replied that he taught at the first Korean educational institution, the Gosung School. Katerina was still driving fast and asked, So Minjun worked as a teacher together with this Manzik? Minjun replied that it was so. Katerina interpreted this as an epic story about a double life. She said that the life of a teacher is during the day and catching illegal immigrants at night. She exclaimed that a book should be written about him called Teacher by Day, and a thunderstorm of illegal immigrants at night or something like that. Minjun played along with her with a tired look, saying that this is a hero. He paused a moment and added that he was sure the government did not want to bring up his past. Katerina was a little surprised and asked if that's why he doesn't like to talk about his past. She exclaimed, All this is due to the fact that this is the past, which the government itself does not want to remember. Minjun told her to look at the road. Katerina smiled and continued to fantasize about the hero who laid the foundations for capable Korean boys and protected the earth from dangerous criminals. She told Minjun that he is not that simple. Minjun looked at her and thought that there is one truth that neither Katie nor anyone else knows. The truth is that the land has already been taken. Minjun began to tell Katerina that some people say that the darkness that swallowed the earth appeared because of dragons. But the ones who actually control the land, controlling these dragons like chess pieces, are the committee. This is a secret organization that controls this planet from behind the scenes. October 24, 1945, creation of the Und. Katerina said that this day was the first time when people and aliens came into contact. Minjin replied that this was true, and the committee waited a long time to create a Un for Earthlings. The committee appealed to the leaders of the Earth to accept a huge number of aliens from other dimensions to accept such a large number of immigrants. Katerina interrupted him, saying that they had reconfigured the concentration of mana on the ground. She explained with a slight smile that she had read this in a book once. Thanks to the reconfiguration of the concentration of mana, very capable individuals began to be born among people who could use magic and control spirits. She added that they were able to move the land or something like that. Minjun crossed his arms over his chest and looked to the side in thought, repeating the word advance. Minjun thought that the books must have left out the bad parts. The car stopped and Katerina said that they had already arrived. Lakefield and Donchul met them near the bookstore. Lakefield was sitting in a wheelchair with Donchul standing behind him. Minjun thought that the first target of the group migration was the elves. People invited elves for their appearance and knowledge of magic. Lakefield asked where Minjun was. He replied that he was shopping at the store. Donchul looked at him with admiring eyes. Minjin continued to recall that the path along which the elves moved to the ground was used not only for its intended purpose, Minjun went up to the office, and Katerina followed him. He continued to think that criminals from other dimensions began to use this distant planet Earth as a refuge, or simply believed that it was a new gold mine and began to come here. Minjun told Katerina that she can finish for today, or does she still have things to do at the office? Katerina responded enthusiastically that she wanted to listen to more of his stories over tea. Minjun, looking annoyed, told her to take the cup and leave. Katerina, finishing her tea, asked if it was true that he wouldn't tell anything more. 
Minjoon answered negatively and added that she should finish her tea quickly and leave. There was a knock on the door. Minjoon was surprised by this and asked who was there. He added with a calm face that he was not waiting for anyone. Minjun opened the door and, seeing who came, thought that this is what the card said, and it seems that Minjun has not seen Bradley for 100 years. He was a smiling guy with a short haircut and light brown hair. He is an agent of the Earthly Dimension, the American branch of a Sif 174,245,100. on He addressed Minjun by name and said that they had not seen each other for a long time. There were already three cups of tea on the office table. Katarina, introducing herself, said that she was pleased to meet you, and then she asked Bradley about the reason for the visit. Minjun explained that they worked together once. For Katarina, this clarified the situation. Bradley said that Minjun is too callous, and he doesn't talk about others anymore, but at least once in his life can Minjun call him by name. Bradley looked at Minjun with his blue eyes with a smile and asked if that girl called Minjun. Minjun crossed his arms and asked, Which girl? Katerina looked at him suspiciously. Bradley was very surprised and asked if she had never contacted Minjun. Minjun replied that it was nothing like that and she did not contact him. Bradley said it couldn't be that she never called Minjun. Minjun took the cup from the table and asked who Bradley was even talking about. Bradley asked in surprise, What do you mean about whom? He clarified that he was talking about Dell. Minjun tensed and was very surprised. His heart skipped a beat. He bit his lip. He asked why she would even call him. Minjun's hands were shaking, so that the tea from the cup was about to spill. Katerina was a little concerned about his condition and asked what was wrong. She added, who is this? Minjun remembered how he and she were covered in blood. He was badly injured, and she was holding him. She was a girl with short hair and rather large breasts. Minjun explained that she used to be his wife. That night, Minjun and Bradley went to a bar. They both ordered a double gin and tonic. The monster, who looked like a tree, took a bottle from the shelf and poured it into glasses. Bradley smiled, taking his glass from the branch of this tree, and loudly said, How interesting that the bartender is a tree. He raised the glass to his lips and said with a smile that he was drinking to Mother Nature. A moment later he began coughing violently, shouting that the alcohol was burning his throat. Minjun looked at him with bewilderment and then looked into his glass with a smile and asked, Doesn't this remind of the old days? He reminded Bradley of a previous dimension where they worked together. Bradley, exhaling heavily, leaned on the bar counter and said that Minjun was right and all the alcohol there was so strong that it was impossible to distinguish real alcohol from burnt alcohol. Minjun snapped his fingers, used magic, and said with a calm face that since Bradley had already drunk, he could start. Minjin put up a soundproof barrier. He asked what a U.S. agent was doing in Korea. Minjun learned that Bradley was accompanying the princess. Bradley explained that this is Princess Vermi from the Jilanko dimension. Minjun remembered that I think this was broadcast on the radio a couple of days ago when he and Jiangpul were driving in the car. He asked why the American Bureau was even escorting the Jilanko diplomatic party arriving in Korea. Bradley, remembering the princess, explained that they were probably worried that their guards from Jelanko would not cope. Minjun imagined a fair-haired, beautiful princess in a white dress and knights in metal armor standing behind her. Minjun said that therefore the reason why the Korean government asked for help from the states was because the number of escorts requested was so huge that the entire Korean branch was not enough. Bradley smiled as he looked at Minjun and said that there is still a rumor that this is to pave the way for the 8th group to immigrate. Minjun asked again, Eighth? He added that only 40 years had passed since the witch. Minjun asked to wait, and then clarified that the height of Princess Vermi's race is on average about 3-5 meters. Minjun introduced the giantess princess. He added that because of this, the migration of the eighth group would probably not happen. They are even taller than trolls. Bradley spread his hands and said with a smile that even if we take into account the height of earthly buildings, it would still be difficult to implement, and therefore there are rumors that the committee is intensively preparing. Bradley asked, Isn't that interesting? Minjun, with a calm face, answered positively and said that he would still be more interested in listening to something a little different. He clarified that he would like to know about that girl, Dell. Bradley put his hand to his chin 
thinking, and said that he didn't know the details very well. But when they completed the mission in the previous dimension, Bradley and Minjun went to Earth, but Dell was sent somewhere alone. Bradley crossed his arms over his chest and said with a smile that if his memory serves him correctly, then her payout amount was somewhere around 500,000 Delanta. Bradley said he has no idea how she got all those talents. He added that he only knew that they were separated from her in the dimension, and a couple of days ago she was released, and since she paid for everything and left, Bradley thought that she would try to find Minjun. Minjun was shocked by this information. He asked again. She was released. He shouted that it couldn't be that she had already given away 500,000 Delanta. Bradley waved his hand and said that this was just his guess, and maybe she achieved heights there and was released on parole. Minjun asked what heights. With a worried look, he asked how Talisha was. Bradley looked at Minjun with a sad face and remained silent. A realization came to Minjun. He said out loud, What does it mean Dell has already regained her memories? His face looked very worried. Bradley took him by the shoulder and asked him what was wrong. Is he worried because she's his ex-wife? Bradley chuckled nervously and remembered that Minjun liked her so much that he immediately got married. Minjun gritted his teeth and frowned, asking how could he know that this would happen. He added that for the first 80 years she was normal and loved so much that she wanted to kill, saying only that this was the only way to liberation. With these words, Minjun threw back his head and exhaled heavily. The system window in front of him stated that the prisoner was the property of the committee, and damaging the property of the committee was punishable according to the property protection law. Minjun, closing his eyes, said that if she had killed a prisoner like himself, or like her, she would have added property damage to her charge. She would be sentenced to soul execution, and Dell, who believes in the rebirth of souls, clearly would not want such an outcome. Bradley continued to smile nervously, trying to support his friend, and said that then the first thing she should do is get rid of her status as a prisoner before trying to kill Minjun, and then go back to prison. Minjun looked up with regret and said that he would never forget what she told him when they broke up in the past dimension. He remembered how she, with a blush on her cheeks and a smile, asked him to wait for her and added that she would come to him soon. Minjun lay down on the bar counter, facing away from Bradley. Bradley, still nervous, suggested thinking logically, because she could die like Talisha died. Minjun ignored this statement, and Bradley realized that he had said something stupid. Minjun got up from his seat and said that it was late, suggesting that they go home. They both walked out of the bar, Minjun leading the way and Bradley following behind him. Bradley scratched the back of his head and said, Speaking of Talisha, he said that Minjun will definitely not end up like her. Minjun thanked him with a smile and said that they would see each other again. They separated. Minjun mentally repeated Bradley's last words. He reflected that the Republic, which occupies the territory of the planet 36, 145 space stations, is called Ashtol. Minjun remembered a man with a cane and long hair who had blue eyes. Minjun remembered that this place had long been under the control of a dictator, who was a man who instilled only fear. He trampled and killed everyone who did not obey. Minjun remembered the most famous cases on the industrial planet Z-21, which was under his control. One day a tragedy occurred. When the dictator learned of the government's hostility, he stopped food trade to the planet which was 99% dependent on food imports, people dying of hunger began to eat each other. Hell began in which people hunted for the sake of survival, and when the events on this planet became known to others, people from all over the Republic could no longer endure and staged a coup d'etat. This dictator was covered in blood, and when he crawled to the control panel, he called the people vile servants and asked if they thought that he alone would die today. Minjun continued to reason that, Backed into a corner after the coup, this dictator pressed the button, and then more than 90% of all the Republic's power plants exploded and scattered into dust throughout the galaxy. The highly developed civilization of Ashtol suddenly reverted to a primitive state, while the citizens, finally freed from the yoke of a cruel ruler, were still unable to escape suffering due to destruction and war. They suffered from hunger, both children and adults, while the inhabitants of that planet were dying of despair. The committee sent a group of prisoners to rebuild the destroyed dimension, and those prisoners restored Ashtol in 300 years, 
and Minjun joined the reconstruction near the end and met Del there. And the prisoner who achieved considerable success during the restoration of Ashtol was the mother of the citizens of Ashtol, Talisha. She was a girl with long blue hair and blue eyes. Her dispatch agency was Spatial Intelligence, Resettlement Committee. Her place of work at that time was Ashtol, and the payoff for her immediate release was the amount of one 200,000 Delanta. Minjin remembered one incident when a man covered in blood walked towards his daughter with a huge knife. She was covered in dirt and very thin. The man addressed her kindly and asked for forgiveness. He said nothing could be done, and they had no other choice. The girl looked at her father with indifference. The man was also very thin. He swung a knife at her and said that they had nothing to eat, and because of this they did not need extra mouths. Tears flowed from his eyes and he continued to talk about how he was her stupid father and she could blame him even after death. Talisha saw this and looked on with a face full of regret. Minjin recalled that this place was Earth. Talisha watched as the father killed his daughter. And Minjun recalled that in the early stages of the deployment, people killed each other simply so that they could have lunch. Talisha watched this, biting her lip. Minjun explained that she was plunged into chaos and despair. What should she do in such a place, because she could not understand how she could help all these people? But in the bitterness great hope was discovered, as if a small sprout had emerged from the ground. When the emaciated children joyfully stuffed their cheeks with the food Talisha gave them, or when the cured beggar woman kissed Talisha's hands while tears of gratitude flowed down her cheeks, and even the moment when they saved a family captured by bandits, and they desperately shouted the names of each other friend. For this they conveyed eternal gratitude to Talesius. Talesia stood in front of the crowds of the people of this place, and they shouted her name and called her their mother. In return, she loved them with all her heart. Minjun recalled all this while sitting on the couch in his office with a can of beer. He remembered Bradley's words that Minjun would never be like Talesia. Minjun widened his eyes as he mentally said her name again, thinking that she was not just a warrior or an outstanding engineer. Her abilities lay in exceptional administrative skill and politics. She gained control of the committee by obtaining a large amount of resources and personnel from the central region, and quickly restored the economy in Ashtol. The problem was not only this, but also the fact that the barrier that protected the planet from alien robbers was destroyed due to the explosion of the dictator. The planet was constantly attacked by alien bugs. A team of prisoners constantly fought against these monsters. Minjun recalled that Talisha also demonstrated her superior mercenary skills with the help of prisoners when she took in Del who was trying to dislodge these monsters that had broken into Ashtol and tried to completely destroy them to protect the refugee evacuation line. At that moment, Minjun doubted her. He reasoned with a calm face that Talisius' ability to govern was more amazing than anyone else's. Her attitude towards every citizen as a member of the family made an indelible impression on many, and everyone sincerely respected and loved her for this. However, 300 years ago, Talisha, bursting into laughter with tears in her eyes, thanked her allies very much. Minjun remembered that thanks to her deposits in Ashtol, she became the owner of a special amnesty, and as the owner of a special amnesty, she was immediately released regardless of the remaining ransom amount. One of the prisoners who was on the same team with her said that it was the first time he had seen someone actually receive such a status. Another girl from the Allies hoped that Talisha would not forget them. Talisha put her hand on her chest and, nodding, happily said that, of course, she would not forget them, and even if she left Ashtol, she would definitely return, because she would like to live here. She turned around and said that she had to go now. Closing her eyes, she leaned over, and everyone looked at her a little worried. During the first stage of release, prisoners regained their memory. Talisha sank to the floor. Remembering everything, she began to tremble and get nervous. She imagined that her hands were stained with blood. She denied everything she remembered and was shaking violently. Everything she felt and remembered frightened her. She began to scream heart-rendingly, clutching her head. Minjun, worried, shouted her name and asked if everything was okay and what happened. He rushed towards her with a worried look. Talesius' face was very frightened. There were tears in her eyes. She apologized nonstop. When Minjun tried to touch her, she immediately jumped back, ordering him not to touch her or come near her. With tears in her eyes, she begged them to let her go. She repeated please over and over again to let her go. 
The committee complied with her request. She left Ashtel in a hurry without looking back, and a few days later, Talesia committed suicide. Although the committee never told the other prisoners exactly what kind of memory overtook Talesia or what crime she committed and why she became a criminal. Minjoon remembered her pleasant smile and frowned, thoughtful. He again remembered Bradley's words that Minjoon would never be like Talesia. Minjoon exhaled heavily and stood up from the sofa. He again remembered that the amount of her ransom was one two million Delanta. Minjun's net worth exceeded five million. Minjun walked to the window and looked out of it. He mentally told Bradley not to worry, explaining that no matter how terrible his memories were, he would not repeat the same fate as Talesius. Minjun mentally promised this. Meanwhile, a spaceship was approaching Earth, and Dell was in it. She turned to Minjun with a smile, asking him to just wait because it wouldn't take much time. She smiled. There was a blush on her cheeks. Television news on Earth. The news anchor was talking about how gold prices had dropped 20% over the past year. The visit of Princess Vermi is expected to lead to a mass migration of the Sultan tribe. This appears to be due to the fact that Sultan produces gold through biogenic synthesis, which is known for its high quality, compared to gold obtained alchemically. The guy with glasses was watching the news from his phone. He asked, Are these vile emigrants again? He added that soon there will be no normal people left, and wherever you look, there are only emigrants. This guy was standing in a crowd of goblins, beastmen, elves, orcs, and trolls. He said, adjusting his glasses, that he was sick of it. Someone shouted, drawing attention to Buck Hansen. The whole crowd looked away, including this guy with glasses. He opened his eyes wide, seeing multicolored nebulae in the sky, rushing somewhere into the mountains. The guy asked, what is this? Meanwhile, in the office of the CEO of the company, Jenkinson, Blair and Larissa looked at Jenkinson guiltily. He looked at them with contempt through the magic window, holding in his hands the documents he had just studied. He continued talking about the treasure of District B-39 in Buck Hansen. He asked, have they really lost everything? Jenkinson added that the culprit left no trace and could not be traced even with the help of fairies. He had a terrible grin, and he clarified this information. Blair and Larissa trembled before him. Blair confirmed this information, addressing him as Chairman Jenkinson. He squeezed all the papers he had in his hands and burned them with magic. He stood up and began to walk towards them asking if they didn't understand why he personally came to the committee headquarters and had been puzzling over all this for several days now. Because of the materials that were stored in that warehouse, they lost these materials. Jenkinson looked very intimidating. He loosened his tie and turned to Larissa, asking if she knew how much money he spends on her. Larissa, all sweaty, asked, stuttering, how much? He replied, ten billion. This figure sounded very scary. Jenkinson was furious. He said he didn't consider it a waste until now. He added angrily that Larissa believed that she could boast of her knowledge in the field of spirit research. He said how hard it was for him to restrain himself from ignoring the doctor's advice. Gritting his teeth, he replied that it was very difficult. Larissa, a little surprised and still very nervous, asked what he meant. Jenkinson explained that the doctor advised abstaining from eating protein to live longer, and he had not heard these words for a long time, but... Jenkinson opened the dragon's mouth. His tongue slid around Larissa. She had never been so scared in her life. Jenkinson explained that if he were to start eating meat again, having a fairy as a first course would be very welcome. Larissa sank to the floor and burst into tears. She asked for forgiveness and said that this would not happen again. Jenkinson turned his attention to Blair Campbell. He told her that the elves did not trust creatures beyond the line they themselves had drawn, but he still hoped that Blair would be above his kind. However, even in such a situation, he did not contact them using elven methods. Jenkinson added with contempt that even if he was his most useful ally, if Blair could not get over the heads of his race, there was no point in leaving her. Blair, troubled by these words, swallowed her saliva. Jenkinson said that he may not know the motives of the criminals, but one thing he is sure of is that they are all trying to leave Earth as quickly as possible, so he will inform the committee about this so that they close all dimensional exits on Earth. With a very gloomy and intimidating look, 
Jenkinson addressed Blair by his last name and ordered her to contact him. He added that she should tell him that Jenkinson agreed to any conditions. He asked her to make a note of this so that as soon as she finished this dialogue, she would immediately contact him. Blair, stuttering, said it would be done. The magic window closed, and Jenkinson exhaled heavily, leaning against the table and crossing his arms over his chest, lowering his head, saying what a big problem, and that he didn't want to burden him even more. It was about Minjin. At this moment, he was playing Badak with Jiangpul. Jiangpul told Minjun about the traffic control. Minjun asked who came up with such nonsense. Jiangpul, with a regretful face, said that they were unlucky. Minjun, looking at the black and white chips, frowned and said that even if Princess Vermi is strong, why control all of Seoul? He continued to speculate that they were hiding the details of the princess's movements so that she would be difficult to track. Jianpul crossed his arms over his chest and nervously asked what Minjun was looking out there. Minjun looked intently at the game board, and Chanpul said that Minjun was only stalling for time in this way and asked him to quickly make his move. Minjun straightened up and asked Jianpul with irritation, Will he play Badak all day? Is he going to catch the criminal? And when did Jianpul learn to play so well? Minjun took out his wallet from his bosom and took out a bill from the wallet. He was clearly annoyed at his loss, and Jiangpul said that given Minjun's age, he had plenty of time to get better at the game. Jiangpul asked with a happy expression if Minjun had finished his beer. He added that he was going to buy himself another jar and would grab Minjun too. Jiangpul waved the bill, and Minjun was very annoyed and annoyed. Leaving the office, Jiangpul smelled a disgusting smell and looked at the kitchen in surprise. Katerina was diligently frying something in a frying pan. He watched this with fear in his eyes. What was in the frying pan could hardly be called food, and this frightened Chongpul very much. The frying pan made very strange sounds, and Jiangpul was very frightened by it. He returned back to Minjun and asked Katerina to keep this frying pan for herself, because it could not be washed anyway. Jiangpul thought about how intimidating Katerina looks when she cooks, and explained that while looking at the frying pan, Katerina remembered her feminine duties but did not remember that she was very bad at them. Minjun said with a determined smile that stopped talking and it's time for the legend. He was holding a chess set in his hands. The telephone was heard ringing. Minjun shouted with irritation, who is calling at such a decisive moment? He took the phone. Minjun asked in surprise, what does Blair need at such a time? Chongpul asked in confusion, who is this? Minjun answered the question and said that he was a good-for-nothing elf who had gotten himself into something again. Some time later, Minjun, Larissa, and Blair were in front of the gate of Vault B-39. Larissa said that, unfortunately, she herself did not see anything. Blair quietly added that everything was as expected. Minjun explained with a dejected look that even a fairy who can directly communicate with the spirit world is not able to find evidence. Larissa, clutching her head, asked, does he mean that they have no way out at all? Minjun asked if they tried anything else besides talking to the spirits. Larissa lay down on Blair's head, and Blair said that not much time had passed since the fire was put out, so she didn't have time to do much. But she called one person with psychometric abilities. However, this also did not help. Minjun, looking at the gate, said that residual thoughts can be easily erased with magic, especially with such large scale spells. And Larissa, taking the elbow of the other hand with one hand, said that this is why she is trying to get in touch with the world of spirits. They have already called psychokinetists, but even they have no idea what is happening. Minjin said that looking at this protective barrier, it seems that the spirits could not even come close to this place. And even if they existed, they would be carried away by this spell. Minjin remembered that last night, the news reported that the forest fire in Buck Hansen was not real. It raged in this place for six hours. Maybe this is another dispute between the family and Jenkinson. But it turned out that it was a ritual for that to create a powerful spell. The spell was so powerful that it not only destroyed the barrier, but also absorbed everything material as if nothing had happened. Larissa, raising her index finger up and a little nervously, turned to Minjun, calling him a friend, and suggested that maybe we should turn to the druids? She added that since they are associated with mountain animals, then maybe they saw something. Minjun explained that in such situations, all surviving animals run as far as possible, 
and even if you call them, they will not come. Larissa was angry that her proposal was rejected so quickly. But still, this gave Minjun an idea. The surviving animals ran away, and there was no one left in the area. But what about the animals that are already dead? Minjun cut his hand with his knife and used dark magic. Blair, shielding herself from the energy flows, asked what it was while Larissa held on to her hair so that she would not be carried away by the energy flows. A deer appeared before them. Blair asked what it was. Minjin replied with a slight frown that this is a spirit whose soul died in suffering. The beast transferred its pain and resentment to this spirit, and even if magic were involved here, sweeping away the remnants of thoughts and even souls in its path, they will always remember the moment of their death. They will never forget it. Minjin saw the memories of this animal, how several people in capes with hoods stood near the gate to the vault. One of them asked if everything was ready. Another responded positively and explained that the latest installation was complete. Someone said that this is good and that all preparations have finally been completed to expel the vile aliens from Earth. The deer stood and watched everything that was happening. One of the people in capes called on the brothers to work. He created a spell with his right hand and shouted that it was for the peace of all people. A multicolored haze appeared around him, the one that caused a multicolored trail in the sky. Present time, tattoo parlor. The man who was getting the tattoo at that moment. Through his headphones, he listened to a voice that said that he missed the times when only the human race was called people. The blue-haired tattoo artist's hand twitched, and the client groaned in pain and asked to be more careful, because he had asked earlier. The man continued to listen to the voice in the headphones, which said that everyone was fed up with him with their tolerance, and who would fight for their rights. For human rights... The tattoo artist's client squeaked in pain again. After some time, this orc, who was a client, left the money and, on his way out, cursed, looking at his hand, and said that it still hurt. He kept saying that he came for a unique sketch. He turned to the master and said with irritation that if there is an infection, then the responsibility lies with the tattoo artist. The tattoo artist with a tight smile said the instructions, Do not smoke. Drink or go to the sauna for a week and apply the ointment he gave. The tattoo artist's name was Du Young Siok. He is a man who works as a tattoo artist and has purple hair and glasses on his face. The client opened the door with his foot and left the tattoo parlor. Young Siok continued to listen about how human rights should exist as a word only for humanity. Young Siok annoyedly called his client a dirty animal. A little further down this street at the same time, there were two huge red buses and police cars. The goblins tearfully begged for forgiveness. A policeman with a red stick in his hands shouted at the goblin to get up and quickly go to the bus. The goblin covered himself with his hands and continued to apologize. The policeman shouted at him, raising his stick and was about to hit him, but Jiangpul stopped him, asking him in concern what he was doing. The guy drew attention to the inspector and said that he had misunderstood him. The policeman explained that he heard that goblins are like young children, but... Jiangpul interrupted him, asking him to stop. He knelt down on one knee and told the policeman not to say anything like that anywhere else, because he was a police officer. The policeman was a little ashamed of this, and Changpul extended his hand to the goblin and turned to them all, calming them down with the words that it was not really that scary. He explained that they could take a bus to the camp, and there was free food there. He said they could come back later. One of the goblins took Jiangpul's hand and trusted him. After some time, someone shouted, Did everyone get on the bus? Hearing a positive answer, he loudly said that then they were leaving. Jiangpul followed the bus with his eyes and said that even if it was because of Princess Vermi, yesterday they regulated all traffic from the terminal to the hotel, and now they even patrol the outskirts, and every day it's getting worse. Jiangpul's phone rang. It was Minjun, asking if Jiangpul was busy. He replied that he wasn't too busy if Minjun just wanted to chat. Minjun asked if Jiangpul remembered the day when they visited the orcs in the area. When else was that idiot caught? Jiangpul responded positively. Minjun asked, among all the trespassers they asked for directions, there was one orc with a tattoo, right? and his name was Kang Kamchen. Jiangpul replied that Minjun said almost correctly and said the name Kim Yushin. Afterwards, Changpul asked what was wrong with him. Minjun was sitting in the office at that moment, studying documents. 
He explained that he is not talking about himself now, but about his tattoo. Minjun asked if Jiangpul could ask him where he got those tattoos. Changpul said that it was not a problem, but wondered what was wrong with the tattoo. Minjun, taking one piece of paper in his hands and reading the information from it, said that this inscription is in one ancient language, and translated means vile orcs are just wasting oxygen. Jiangpul bit his lip and was furious at what he heard. Meanwhile, Yang Siak was sitting on the sofa in his tattoo parlor and said out loud that today was an important day and maybe he should close the salon early. Yang Siak reiterated that this day is important. He left the tattoo parlor and closed the door, wrapping the door handles with a chain and lock. Yang Ziak started swearing at the birds, shouting that the nasty crows had turned up the whole trash can again. He added, Why are they still here? With a dissatisfied look, Yang Ziak said that they ruined his whole mood and called the birds names. Yang Ziak continued to listen to someone's voice in his headphones, which said that immigrants from another space are only taking away jobs from their citizens. The voice asked to remember that immigration policy is designed to support slavery as an important economic factor, and, of course, let people remember that those who choose to come to them have a home somewhere. But the earth is all that people have, and if they lose it, they will have nowhere to return. Meanwhile, Minjun took the raven feather in his hand. Yong Siak continued to listen to the voice. It said that as long as they have more and more allies, they can fight this propaganda. And so far the greatest threat to them is represented by two races. Yong Siak muttered quietly that this was absolutely true. The voice that dictated this belonged to a masked man. He explained that the two races were dragons and orcs. The masked man began to shout that dragons are scaly, vile creatures. They constitute a social disaster. After all, they all obey them. The masked man grabbed the microphone and furiously shouted that they must resist, overthrow, and drive out the dragons. He continued waving his hands and saying that orcs are just animals that breed like cockroaches. They are a biological disaster and people should exterminate them all. The man calmly continued that, however, they recently received news about another race in addition to those two. A whole hall of people in formal suits and masks listened to this man. They were surprised to hear about the third race. The man, looking up somewhere, said that when he first heard about the eighth mass immigration, he could not contain his surprise. This man switched the slide and asked, does anyone present know about the biological characteristics of this race? He added that the name of the race is Shutin. The man said that they lay eggs almost every day, more than 10 eggs at a time, and they can also reach 3-5 meters in height. The man asked with pretension how much of their taxes would go to adjust the infrastructure for this race. The man bent over, hugging himself with his arms and asking, and what if they are the same as orcs? He quietly added that the thought made him shiver. He asked what if they are also strong and commit crimes on every corner. This man raised his index finger up and said with a smile that therefore their association would use any methods to stop the immigration planned by the committee and first of all they must deal with one alien. And this alien. Events are transferred to the hotel. Bradley stood at the entrance as the woman, who was half his size, said she hoped for cooperation during their stay at the hotel. The woman introduced herself. Her name is Olga. She was a short woman with a mustache and a suit. She said that she would be a translator for them, and then asked Agent Bradley to follow her. Bradley chuckled quietly and looked away. As they walked through the hotel lobby, he asked how Princess Vermi was feeling. Olga was silent for a while, and then said that, to be honest, the princess was very worried right now. Olga added that she thought Bradley was aware of the important negotiations between the Korean Committee and the Jelanko Kingdom regarding the level of security. Olga said that, despite this, they are very glad that they can appoint such a professional as Bradley as head of security. Bradley laughed and said that the princess still believed that security was not enough. Olga answered with an important look that Vermi was simply quite sensitive by nature, and the main thing was that Bradley did not think badly of her. They stopped near a huge door with the number 1825. Olga pointed to the door and said that here she was forced to leave Bradley and the princess in this room. Bradley knocked. He opened the door slightly and noticed a three-meter figure with a green tail wrapped in a blanket inside. The reptile, noticing the newcomer, became frightened and opened its mouth, growling heart-rendingly. This was Princess Vermi of the Shootin' Race. 
Her head resembled a crocodile, and her body was anthropomorphic. Bradley and Olga are covered in drool from head to toe. Olga, wiping her face with a napkin, said that Vermi expressed joy at meeting Bradley and looked forward to working together in the future. Bradley smiled nervously and agreed with her, asking Olga to reassure Vermi that she had nothing to worry about. Vermi beamed at his words, and drool flowed from her mouth. That night, in the old brick building, someone approached Yangsiak, saying that his test was almost over, and if he successfully completed it, he would become a member of the fraternity. A rat ran through this building, and Yang Siak and his interlocutor were sitting on two sofas opposite each other, with a table between them. Yang Siak stuttered and agreed with his interlocutor. The interlocutor said that before that he would like to talk about something. This man, wearing a gray sweatshirt, hiding his face, placed several photographs of orcs with tattoos on the table in front of him. Yang Ziak took one of them in his hands and said this. The interlocutor interrupted him, saying that Yang Ziak understood everything correctly. We are talking about the tattoos that Yang Ziak gave to the orcs. Yang Ziak again stammered and asked, What's the problem? The interlocutor replied, These are inscriptions in an ancient language, right? He added that these inscriptions literally mean slave, genitals, animal, idiot, excrement, and so on. Yang Ziak replied that it was. The interlocutor said that, of course, the orcs do not even suspect this. He added that in the past dimension they were treated like slaves, and the illiteracy rate among them was 99%. Yang Siak became nervous and asked if this could cause difficulties in joining the fraternity. The interlocutor replied that, to be honest, there were suspicions that they might get caught because of this or that someone would find out about it as easily as they did, but everyone in the end agreed that it was quite funny. The interlocutor snapped his fingers, and all the photographs burned. He said that Yang Ziok should not leave evidence in the future, and the salon would have to be closed. He also asked Yang Ziok to open a salon in another location, and they would help with all the necessary equipment. Yang Ziok agreed, saying that he understood. The man in the hoodie suggested that we begin in this case, and it's time to go through the last stage of joining the fraternity. Yang Ziok agreed with a joyful smile. Together, they approached the magically sealed doors. Minjun became nervous when he saw the contents of this room. It was a torture room. On the bloody table lay axes, tongs, knives, various scissors, and cutters. There were also orc skulls that were used as candlesticks. On a pedestal in the form of a cross lay a young orc with his mouth gagged and his hands tied to this pedestal. He cried and moaned in fear. Around this orc stood three more people in robes and hoods. The man who brought Yang Siak handed him a dagger with a smile and asked, Does Yang Siak understand what needs to be done? Yang Siak took the dagger in his hands with a nervous face. The guy in the hoodie told him to show his anger. He added that let justice prevail. Yang Siak resolutely walked towards this orc, convincing himself mentally that he could do anything, and it was like slaughtering a rooster. He repeated to himself that orcs were not people. The tied orc tried to scream in fear, but only muffled groans were heard due to the bandage on his mouth. Yang Siak remembered how he was hit by one of the orcs and thought that they themselves almost killed him several times, and everyone would be better off without them. The guy in the hoodie told Yang Siak not to hesitate and just return the favor. Yang Siak looked at this orc with madness, swung his dagger, and screamed. When the blade was a few centimeters away from this orc, something happened and Yang Siak's hands were cut off. At first he was surprised looking at the stumps with incomprehension, and then he screamed heart-rendingly in pain. Someone else entered this room. The robed people screamed, Who did this? The man in the hoodie, nervously, thought that he hadn't even noticed a single crack in the protective field, and he didn't know who it was. But it was definitely high-ranking wizards. With apprehension, he began to say that since the person who entered was able to track them down and destroy the defense, it seems that he knows a lot about them. The man in the hoodie was ready and added that he thought that he knew perfectly well what would happen if he decided to joke with them. It was Minjun. He entered the room and asked intimidatingly, What? His eyes were red, and he was full of rage. The moment when Minjun, Blair, and Larissa were near Vault B-39. Minjun then said that he was only doing what he had to do, addressing the press secretary. Blair bowed to him and said that she understood him perfectly, which is why she was asking. She added that no one can be trusted now. Minjun remained silent, 
watching as Blair bowed, and Larissa fluttered not far from her. Minjun then thought that his subordinates were still alive, and Jenkinson seemed to have lost his grip. Minjun asked, Don't they know what kind of people they are? He added that even the elders failed, and they want Minjun to take over. Blair responded in the negative, and said that she only wanted to ask Minjun to find their traces. She added that she hoped that Minjun could do this before the chairman returned to Earth. Minjun asked, when is he coming back? Blair replied that in about a week. She straightened up and, adjusting her glasses, said that the spatial terminal may be closed for today, but they could not allow the Brotherhood to get rid of the evidence in the meantime. Minjun looked at her in surprise and asked, Is the terminal blocked? Minjun thought that he had not heard anything about this. He looked away in thought and thought that this was a fight for human rights. He remembered what was in the spirit's memories. These people shouted that the party was from the people and for the people. They shouted that originally people lived on Earth, and one of the members of this brotherhood suggested that the brothers start. Minjun thought that he understood from the spirit's memories that they call themselves a brotherhood because of their actions. They are sure that the Justice Association is a bunch of terrorists with Nazi inclinations. The so-called justice spread throughout the world, organizing many branches, and the last straw was the failure of the operation led by the dragon, and after that it became almost impossible to find their top. When asked by Blair, Minjun replied that he agreed, but they must understand that it will not be easy. Blair and Larissa lit up with happiness when they heard that Minjun had agreed to complete this mission. Minjun exhaled heavily and indifferently said that he was sure that they were aware, but he demanded compensation. Blair took a wooden box out of her pocket and said with a smile that she would prepare everything. She opened the box and explained that it was a blank check and Minjun could use it for both earthly currency and talent. This check has already been signed. Minjun was very surprised, repeating her words. Minjun thought, does Jenkinson really trust him that much? And is this normal at all? Minjun scratched his head and looked a little nervous as Blair and Larissa celebrated the fact that he agreed to complete this mission by clapping their hands. Minjun thought that he couldn't use it, and then turned around and told Blair that he would contact them as soon as he found something. Blair bowed again and loudly agreed with him, thanking him. As he left, Minjun thought that it wasn't that bad. He realized that he didn't know who was in charge of the fraternity. But this guy, Yongseok, caught his attention. Minjun thought that he should visit him and try to find out something. The more he finds out, the more zeros he can draw on the blank check. In the present time, Minjun teleported the tethered orc behind him. Sitting on the floor behind Minjun, the orc looked around and was very surprised. Minjun looked at him and said that he was free. The guy in the hoodie didn't understand what kind of spell it was. He thought, is this even possible? All the people in robes and he himself began to worry. One of the hooded men started to address the guy in the hoodie, but he waved his hand and told him to stay calm. He thought that Minjun seemed to be a master at this, and the guy in the hoodie didn't think they could win even if they all attacked at once. However, this guy smiled as he began to cast the spell. He said that Minjun would still regret crossing their path. This guy was thinking that they had secretly obtained a magical shield from the witch community, and with it they could reflect any spell back at the attacker, and no matter what spell Minjun cast, he would get hurt. Before he could finish his thought, he noticed how one of the members of the Brotherhood had his head torn off. The guy looked with a frightened look at the headless body, from which blood was gushing. Everyone else got nervous too. Minjun stood with his hand outstretched forward with an intimidating look and said that even one mouth would be enough for him to get information. The headless body fell forward. This Brotherhood member's magic shield was broken. The guy in the sweatshirt thought with fear. Was he really able to break the witch's defense? His eyes were filled with fear. He thought that if Minjun is not a dragon, then they will definitely be able to defeat him, right? He wondered if it could be that Minjun is a dragon. Meanwhile, at the hotel, Olga told Bradley that the princess eats 20 kg of raw meat at a time, six times a day. She added that she should let the security chief check that the food is not poisoned. She also asked not to forget that Bradley would be staying at the hotel for a few days to rest from the road. And one more thing. Bradley looked at Olga. Olga explained that once a day, when the princess lays eggs, there should not be a soul around her within a radius of at least 10 meters. At this moment, the princess is emotionally unstable, 
and Bradley should keep this in mind. Bradley asked, This usually happens around 8 o'clock in the morning, right? Olga replied that due to the difference in time zones, everything may happen irregularly. They both looked at Vermi, and Olga explained that, as Bradley may know, shootin' women lay unfertilized eggs if they do not have a mate. The shell can be used to make metal with a high level of ductility and malleability. Olga continued that, in other words, this is a sacred ritual for the production of gold. She asked if Bradley understood everything. Bradley smiled and said he understood and added that he would be careful. Meanwhile, in the abandoned building where the fraternity members and Minjun were, one of the fraternity members lifted his hood and addressed the guy in the hoodie, saying that he would buy him some time. This guy thought that black magic is much more powerful when the caster fuels it with his own pain. He decided he was going to get out, no matter the cost. This guy had scary sharp fangs instead of regular teeth. He bit his hand and used dark magic. He thought that the most powerful black magic was still self-sacrifice in its original form. Years of life in exchange for salvation. He used a curse from his own flesh and blood. Minjun looked at him with an indifferent face and decided that if so. He whispered a spell, and this guy's head exploded too. The guy in the sweatshirt was enveloped in even greater fear. He said it was impossible and asked Minjun how he did it. This guy stuttered from fear. Minjun with a calm face said that he was already going to breathe fire, and Minjun simply cursed him to make him more flammable. The guy in the hoodie was getting more and more afraid. He thought that Minjun was crazy, but his brother still bought him time and he completed his last spell. A huge magical purple creature appeared behind the guy in the hoodie. The guy in the hoodie laughed loudly, spreading his arms, and shouted that Minjun must know about this if he calls himself a magician. This guy explained that this is a monster that absorbs everything material and spiritual. Shadow monster. He added that unless Minjun is a real dragon. Before she could speak, the head of this monster was cut off. The guy was in complete shock and realized who was standing in front of him. Minjun said that it finally dawned on him, and now they will talk. Minjun looked very scary and gloomy. After some time, this guy opened his eyes, and the first person he saw was Minjun. He sat with his head resting on his hand. When this guy opened his eyes, Minjun asked if he was awake. The guy was shocked. He sat with his hands tied and began to twitch. He was sitting on the couch and Minjun was sitting on the table in front of him. The guy asked why the Oslo school principal is against the Human Rights Alliance. Minjun asked again, Oslo? Theo Christiansen is a fugitive wanted by 26 states and 8 elders. He is a master of the Oslo school and a notorious black magician. Minjin thought that this guy had mixed them up, and looking at the happiness bug on his finger, he quietly muttered that everyone has the right to make mistakes. The happiness bug flew into this guy. The guy in the sweatshirt started shaking and then sneezed this bug. Minjun was surprised, asking if even the lucky bug doesn't work. He added that this guy is clearly stronger than other members of society. The guy asked Minjun not to waste time and just kill him. He added that maybe he is not as strong as Minjun, but still he is also a dark magician, and even under torture he will not speak. Minjun stood up and, brushing off his knees, asked, Is that so? He added that then he should torture this guy so that he finally talks. Minjun casually touched his finger to the blade of his knife and said that although it would be easier to stick a bug in this guy's brain and let him die in peace. The guy, a little nervous, grinned and said that Minjun can bluff as much as he wants, but he won't open his mouth. Minjun calmly said that he recently met a dragon. He added that this thousand-year-old gentleman tried to escape to another dimension when he was being chased. He died because he was just one day late. Minjun explained that this is why he considered him the most pathetic creature in the world. Minjun came close to this guy, and he looked at him with a surprised look. Minjun said that despite this, it seems that this guy is about to take this title away from that dragon. Minjun looked with contempt and arrogance, and this guy thought with fear, what kind of facial expression is this? Minjun put the blade of a knife to the eye of this guy, who had already begun to tear up, and said that he would regret that he was born. Some time later, Minjun was riding in a taxi. He looked at his check. He called Jenkinson headquarters. In it, he said hello and introduced himself by his name. He said that, unfortunately, 
he was unable to obtain any information about the incident at Vault B-39. Due to the specifics of the organization, Minjun cannot know the details of the operation in which he is not involved. However, today has brought its fruits. The human rights community will soon throw something out. Minjun said he doesn't know whether it will be a murder or a kidnapping. But their next target is the princess. Minjin added that in order to prevent the mass migration of the big shot, this brotherhood will also take part, and among them there will obviously be a vault thief. Blair answered the call and said she understood him. She apologized and asked if there was something else she could ask Minjin. Minjun asked what happened. After the conversation ended, he thought that their requests seemed to be getting bigger and bigger. But then he will simply start charging for his work. And if Jenkinson doesn't have enough money, he'll simply borrow from someone. Minjun arrived at the hotel. Olga greeted him, asking if he was Yiminjun's agent. Olga, hearing a positive response, introduced herself, explaining that she was a translator, and said that she was surprised that the Immigration Bureau had suddenly reduced security personnel. They were walking in the hall and Olga asked that they say that Minjun is the highest paid agent in the Korean Immigration Office. Is that true? Minjun replied that it was. Olga explained that the princess was also completely satisfied. Minjun repeated the plan of action in his head. They will catch the associates of the Human Rights Association using the princess as bait, and the princess will be completely safe. It seems Jenkinson and Blair are playing a dangerous game, and whether Minjun succeeds or fails, he will still get paid. So Minjun won't lose anything. And even if this case causes political turmoil, the committee will protect him, because the prisoners are the committee's valuable property. Minjun and Olga approached the door. She knocked, telling the princess that it was her and a new member of the security team had arrived with her. Olga apologized and opened the door. In the room, the princess was sitting on the sofa, and Bradley was sitting in the chair next to her. He whispered the name in surprise. Minjun? Olga noticed that they knew each other. Minjun greeted. The wind blew from the window and Minjun introduced himself. Vermi began to drool. Her heart began to flutter and she blushed. A strange smell began to spread throughout the room. Minjun touched his nose with his finger and thought in surprise, is this really a pheromone? He also realized that the sound of a rapid heartbeat could be discerned, and the room was definitely filled with a pungent smelling pheromone. Vermi stood up, looking at Minjun. She was smiling but with a crocodile face, it was a scary sight. Minjun, a little nervous, looked away and thought that this couldn't be true. Vermi began wagging her tail and screaming loudly in her language. Olga was surprised, asking loudly, so suddenly. Bradley, surprised, asked what the princess said. Olga, a little nervous, replied that the princess wanted this man to work in gold production. Bradley asked what? He added, they already did this this morning. While Vermi began to create the egg, Olga said that this was true, but something happened. Sometime later, Minjun walked to the window and looked at the bright sun in the clear sky. He thought that scorpions now lay eggs, even when the sun is at its zenith. As far as Minjun remembers, it used to be different. Bradley approached Minjun, saying that he did not know that an immigration bureau agent would be sent to help him. Minjun turned to him and addressed him by name. Afterwards, he looked at Olga and said that they would talk and return. Olga responded positively. They both went out onto the balcony. Bradley was very surprised by Minjun's words about the human rights community. He asked loudly, almost shouting. Minjun put his index finger to his mouth, asking him to be quiet. He shushed him. Bradley looked down worriedly and said that he had suspected it, of course, but he didn't think they would actually do it. He said loudly that this could ruin everything. Looking at Minjun with suspicion, Bradley said that that's why they sent someone like Minjun on purpose. Bradley asked, Is this the princess's secret? Minjun immediately thought about it and said that then he needs to check the terms of the contract again. They heard loud screams. Minjun was surprised and turned around. Bradley was told that there was nothing wrong and that it was just bullshit that the princess made up. Minjun asked, Seriously? He thought that. It seemed... He had already encountered something similar, and those screams that he had heard before arriving on Earth, those screams. Bradley explained that they were in pain. The Sultan women told what they have to go through every day, 
It's like a curse from nature. Minjin mentally repeated Bradley's words. He thought, has it always been like this? He realized that for some reason, it didn't seem that way to him. Minjun was worried about his thoughts. He did not understand where this knowledge came from, whose it was, and why he knew all this. Bradley repeated his name loudly. Minjun woke up and looked at Bradley. He, leaning his back on the balcony, asked what Minjun was thinking about and did he hear what Bradley said. Minjun apologized and they continued talking about work. The next day, Minjun and Bradley were waiting for the princess on the first floor of the hotel. When the elevator doors opened, a very bright golden glow could be seen. Bradley covered her eyes with her palm and asked, what is this? It was Vermi. Her scales were completely covered in gold. Olga, squinting at this bright glow, decided that it seemed Vermi had been choosing an outfit for a long time. There were no parties today, and Vermi probably had her whole day scheduled by the hour. Vermi began to turn her head around, looking for Minjin. When she saw him and realized that he was also looking at her, she looked away and blushed. Minjun looked at her in confusion and was devastated. Olga approached Bradley and Minjun and said, addressing them as agents, that she had something to tell them. Before Olga had time to say anything, a large armored black car with a machine gun on the roof drove up to the hotel. Bradley asked if transport was suddenly chosen instead of teleportation. Minjin said that a good car had been prepared for those arriving from Sultan. Bradley thought, holding his chin, and said that perhaps the princess would change her mind and want to walk around the city. It is true that the princess came for mass immigration. Seriously, isn't she trying to be the first to see what a suitable dimension for immigration looks like? When the princess approached Bradley and Minjun, Bradley said that they had separated the diplomatic delegation and security personnel and had also finalized the crew arrangements, and the translator, himself, and his friend Minjun would be traveling with the princess. Olga translated everything that was said for the princess. Vermi blushed, closing her eyes, and said something, to which Olga replied that she would fulfill her request. She turned to Minjun and Bradley, saying that she apologizes a thousand times, but wants to ask if they can tell which of the two is stronger. Bradley didn't understand the question at first and then answered that, of course, it was Minjin. They got into their cars and drove off. Vermi, embarrassed, looked at the ceiling. Minjun sat next to Olga and remembered her words before they got into the car. She said the princess said she didn't like to be upset and wanted to keep the number of people accompanying her to a minimum, so Bradley would have to go in a different car. When Olga reported this, Bradley embarrassedly pointed at himself and said that he was actually in charge here and Minjun was very surprised. Thus, only Olga, Minjun, and Vermi, the three of them, were traveling in the car. Vermi looked at Minjun and saw him like a handsome prince with flowers and stars. She grabbed her chest and, squeaking something, kicked her leg. Olga was frightened and, looking at the princess, asked if something was bothering her. Vermi began to answer something to Olga in her own language, and she listened attentively, and then was very surprised. Olga said something to the princess, and then turned to Agent Minjin. With a calm expression, Olga told him that she wanted to inform them both that she adheres to the ethical standards of the translator. She is simply conveying the words of the princess. As she spoke, Minjun mentally asked her not to do this. Olga added that she would convey everything and immediately forget it. So let Minjun be sure that nothing will spread. Minjun was very nervous and with disgust mentally begged her not to say anything. Vermi was very embarrassed and covered her face with her paws. Olga added that she would not talk about anything, no matter what conversation they had. Minjun mentally continued to pray to her that she just would not translate what Vermi was saying. Minjun, dejected, thought that money was the root of all problems. He did not understand what to do and decided to just play along with the princess but would interrupt her if she began to overdo it. The princess, embarrassed, said something, and Olga translated her words, asking, Is Minjun his name? Minjun responded positively. Vermi, covering her muzzle with her paw, asked, Has Minjun ever been to the Jalanko dimension? Minjun said that, unfortunately, no, and asked Vermi to tell him about Jalanko. Vermi, looking at the ceiling, began to say that it was very beautiful there, a silvery blue night, the sky was decorated with two moons. A light wind gently touched the surface of the water, 
where amphibians and plants stretched out relaxed, and four-winged birds, enjoying the aroma of flowers, sing with the arrival of spring. It is a magnificent place and Vermi is very lucky to call this place home. Vermi added that she heard that Minjun is a quarter elf and that he was born and raised here on Earth. She hinted that she wanted to know his age. Minjun replied that he was born in 1945. He thought that a committee had come up with such a biography for him. Vermi was shocked. She asked loudly, Is Minjun really that young? She added that this is not even half her age. She wagged her tail and, sighing with inspiration, asked how long do quarter elves live? Minjun said that, to be honest, he doesn't know. Vermi replied that she understood everything. And then she added, Has Minjun ever thought about living in some other dimension? Minjun leaned his elbows on his knees and decided it was time to end this performance. He started to speak with an apology, but Vermi interrupted him, apologizing first. Minjun looked at her, not understanding. Vermi took her tail in her hands and, turning away in embarrassment, asked him to forget everything she said. She explained her behavior by saying that this was the first time she had met someone so beautiful, and therefore she asked for forgiveness. She asked him to forget all the nonsense that she told him. She was drooling. Minjun still looked at her with confusion and mumbled that he understood her. It gave him goosebumps. Meanwhile, they were driving across the bridge. Vermi, holding her tail in her lap, calmly said that she had never been in the same room with a man from another dimension before. She added that this was obvious to the modest Lady Shooten. She explained that this could cause many of the Shooten ladies to be confused about their emotions. Vermi asked Minjin to think about her behavior today as if she was just a little confused. She apologized again for possibly inconveniencing him with her confused emotions. Minjin said that everything is fine, and the Shooten girls must be under pressure from the cult of fidelity. Vermi replied that Ninjun was right. He asked how long they have had such traditions. Vermi thought for a moment and replied that she had never really thought about it, but since the Shuten history was destroyed in the interracial wars, it turns out that their traditions are at least 800 years old. Minjin thought that something didn't add up. Compared with what he studied about the Jalanko dimension, the information about interracial wars does not match. Laying unfertilized eggs during the day, and the pheromone can even have an effect on other races, and Minjun can also be affected by it. What the princess says is very different from what Minjun was taught, and what if before he became a prisoner, Minjun wondered if that meant he might still have bits of memory from 800 years ago. He raised his index finger to his chin and thought about what had been said about Jalanko being a unified kingdom of many races just like Earth. The Shutans are much stronger than other races, because of this, they were forced to fight other races alone, and in the end, they lost this interracial war. And as a result, the political power of the Shuten sank to the bottom of the entire Jalanko dimension. Minjun turned to the princess. He said that many of the inhabitants of Earth believe that the Shuten visited them in preparation for mass emigration. Minjun wanted to ask if it was true, but Vermi interrupted him, saying that the rumors had reached her, but it all comes from the fact that people don't know them well. She explained that Earth's climate and infrastructure were not suitable for shooting. When the car with them drove past the sidewalk, passers-by thought it was a tank, and someone was sprayed with water from under the wheels. Minjin replied that Vermi was right, even judging by this car. Vermi continued to say that this little star was unable to accept them. Even if they started preparing to emigrate, it would take them a lot of time and resources. Minjun, looking at her, said that it turns out that she is really here on business. Vermi licked her lips, drooling, and said that if she could solve one problem, then she would become fertile and be able to give birth and surpass other princesses. Minjun thought that if he remembered correctly, once a shootin' woman lays a fertilized egg, ovulation stops for decades. Minjun realized that they were trying to get rid of nature's curse. Using a magical means of communication, Bradley contacted them and said that they were almost at the Gonduk station, the station the princess was talking about. He asked her to tell them their exact location. Vermi stood up and asked her to convey her words to everyone. They would go to the Korean pension fund. Minjun objected, telling the princess that it might not be his business, but she had some kind of meeting. After all, if she just appears, then they will. Vermi interrupted him, saying that she did it on purpose. She explained that surprising them was part of her plan. 
someone from the pension fund office, having learned that Princess Vermi was coming, started shouting loudly. Why did they warn about the princess's visit only five minutes in advance? Someone ordered to quickly contact management. Meanwhile, the princess, baring her teeth in a terrifying manner, said that collecting long-term outstanding debts was the reason for her visit to Earth. The car with Princess Vermi was met by employees of the pension fund. There were countless of them when she got out of the car with her entourage. Minjun thought that the princess had really taken them all by surprise. He continued to reflect on the fact that originally Gonduk Station was not even close to the government route the princess was supposed to take. These people don't even know that the princess is here to repay debts. Vermi approached the pension fund workers and angrily shouted at them to bring their boss. Minjun looked at the pension fund building from the outside and thought that this company was obvious. Before he could finish his thought, the event was transferred inside this building. One of the employees said that the general director was returning to the company. Bradley looked at his watch. He said that quite a lot of time had passed, and they should have arrived by now. He was in the waiting room with Olga and Vermi when he heard that there was someone outside the door. Bradley said it must be them. The doors opened and Manzik entered the waiting room with his daughter and men in suits and dark glasses. Manzik apologized for keeping Princess Vermi waiting. He explained that he is the director of this company. Manzik was very surprised when he saw his teacher Yuminjin. He said he checked security so the agents could wait outside for them. Bradley said he understood and he and Minjun walked out into the hall. Minjun reflected that he knew that the chemical company was in trouble over synthetic gold, and it turns out that Manzik was one of the princess's debtors. But the princess is leading the biosynthetic gold market, and he decided to borrow from a competitor? Minjun thought that Manzik may be old, but not old enough to make such mistakes. Minjun picked up the phone and started typing something. He thought that Manzik really didn't know that this was a princess. Or did the lender change midway? Minjun was thinking that he shouldn't do a job that wasn't assigned to him. But could he say that it wasn't a job, but a personal request? Minjun thought that he and Manzik had known each other for quite a long time, and therefore he could make an exception and take up this issue, because they say that accidents are not accidental. Minjun called Katrina. He told her about the Korean pension fund and asked her to pass on the information to the government and let Minjun know their reaction. Minjun thought that Katie should know what to do about this. After all, the government knows that it is better to help than to watch the aliens take over the Korean company. And, in fact, they defeat the purpose of the escort. But the offer was too attractive to refuse. Manzik kissed Vermi's paw and greeted her. She said that if the formalities are over, then she listens to how Manzik plans to repay the debt. Manzik, a little nervous, agreed. He was lost in memories. He remembered the TV news that a pension fund had gone bankrupt due to falling gold prices. Manzik recalled that pensions faced bankruptcy. While many pension funds were going into the red, he, sincerely believing in himself, did not stop gold production. Manzik believed that if you put in all your strength, you can overcome all obstacles and get off your knees again. But, contrary to this, when he began to realize that he was losing ground, a man with a disgusting smile came to him and said that he had an offer that Mansik could not refuse. He asked to take a look and said that he was sure that the director would definitely not regret it. We were talking about the selective filter of mana. It is a necessary material for synthetic gold, which is 100% dependent on imports into other dimensions. Seeing Manzik's predicament, the lenders promised to supply Mana's selective filter at an unimaginably low price. Manzik explained that they don't even have that kind of money now. The guy with a gloomy look and a nasty smile offered a loan, saying that Manzik would pay it off as soon as he could. But the company's situation gradually worsened, and they offered more and more selective Mana filter in exchange for more and more debts, until one day they were contacted and told that their debt had been sold to another party, and the creditor's name was Princess Vermi Shuten. Hearing all this, Vermi began to calmly say that in her entire life she had never heard more nonsense. She shouted the last words. She said loudly that it was all a lie, and she didn't believe a single word. Manzik, nervous, said they did their best. But Vermi interrupted him, saying that she did not believe it, and either they would pay off the debt now or accept their terms. Manzik asked what condition she was talking about. Olga handed him the folder. 
Mansik read the contents of this folder, and then, exhaling heavily and with a surprised face, looked at Vermi, asking if this meant just giving her his company. He asked why Shooten needed a company that produced gold. Vermi smiled and said that Manzik should not worry about it. She added that the company whose shares will be transferred is legally established on Earth. She has already discussed this with the lawyers of both parties, so there cannot be any legal problems. Vermi stood up and approached Manzik, asking him whether he was choosing bankruptcy or transfer of shares. And if he chooses the latter, then it guarantees the preservation of jobs for existing employees. She added eerily that in any case, he would not be able to get away. Manzik became gloomy, lowered his head, and asked Vermi to give them time to think about everything. Vermi replied that she would return tomorrow at the same time. She left in the same car. On the way, Olga told Vermi that she was hungry. Olga was already bringing her a container, saying that she understood Vermi and took some snacks with her. The container contained pure meat. Vermi started eating it with pleasure. Minjun noticed the unpleasant smell of raw meat with blood that filled the entire space of the car. He was a little surprised, thinking that there was something else mixed in with the smell of meat, and it definitely didn't come from the meat. He was surprised when he looked at Vermi and thought that she was emitting this smell, but it was not the shootin' pheromone. Minjun remembered that it was similar to the pheromone that a beetle releases when communicating, but why is it suddenly coming from the princess? They may be similar, but there is definitely something different here. Maybe this is a specially manufactured chemical, and upon contact with air it oxidizes to this pheromone? Minjun abandoned this idea, thinking that the elemental composition of the pheromone contained a noble metal. Minjun realized that something had leaked into the princess's body and was changing inside her through chemical reactions. While Vermi was finishing her piece, Minjun grabbed her by the muzzle and shouted, Princess! She blushed a little and asked what he was doing. He started trying to say something in her language. Vermi became nervous, very surprised, and then closed her eyes, blushed, and reached out to Minjun with the desire to kiss. Minjun looked at her with disgust and irritation, and then turned to Olga to tell the princess to open her mouth. She began to talk about what the agent asked. But the driver of this transport noticed strange black dots approaching. They were beetles. Minjin thought in surprise that this was a trap. The car was attacked. The committee classified the creature as a first-degree threat. Hornet Manova. Particularly dangerous, the size of a thumb. Inside is a durable exoskeleton, the kind usually used in the construction of spaceships. They create a magnetic field by spreading their wings and diving at high speed. This small spaceship with a plasma engine crashes at great speed, and that is why it is so dangerous. The car was heavily damaged. Minjun managed to pull Vermi out of the car using magic. But Olga died. Minjun swore at this, and then noticed how a large number of these hornets were flying towards them, and protected Vermi with magic. He realized that now there was no time to deal with them one by one. But what if? He bit his lip until it bled, took a deep breath, and then breathed out a large amount of flame at the beetles. He reasoned that even if their shell is hard, then their insides are definitely not. Minjun decided that if he doused them with fire, all their insides would boil, but the beetles remained undamaged. Minjun was very surprised by this and created a shield, noticing that the beetles were attacking again. Minjun realized that these bugs were not filled with life force, but probably with the mana of the one who controlled them. Minjun realized that these vile creatures are too tenacious. Bradley shouted to Minjun from below that the target of these bugs was the princess. Minjun thought with a serious face that they only came for her. Realization came to him, and he rushed to fly away from them. Vermi was shocked by everything that was happening. Minjun pulled her by the tail. She shouted something in her own language. Minjun decided that he would not be able to fight these creatures and protect the princess at the same time. So first he needed to find a protective barrier. Minjun saw the bookstore and telepathically spoke to the boss, saying that he was turning on the shield. Lakefield and Dongchul sat inside, reading books. Lakefield thought a little, surprised, and asked whose voice is this. Minjun landed on the roof of this store. The roof shook and fell a little. Lakefield was surprised by this and wanted to say that it needs to be repaired, when suddenly Minjun activated the strongest barrier in the building. 
A bright golden flash could be seen from anywhere in the area. Ninjun activated the barrier, exhaled heavily, and looked at the bugs trying to penetrate him. Minjun looked out the window when they were already inside, wondering what he should do. Vermi was screaming about something in her own language. Lakefield replied that he did not understand a word. Ninjun said that he did too, but asked Lakefield not to pay attention to it for now. And Minjun also apologized for dragging Lakefield into all this. Lakefield put his arm around Dongchul, who was clinging to his knee in fear. Lakefield said they were fine and Minjun didn't have to worry. Minjun thanked them for their understanding. He added that he sent a request to the Bureau, so everything will be cleared out here soon. Vermi shouted something with irritation, but no one understood her. Minjun thought that maybe he should try to talk to her on a mental level. He tried this by asking the princess if she could hear him. Then he added a request to remain calm. He added that help was on the way. Minjin telepathically said that there must be some words that they both understand. And maybe Vermi came into contact with someone today or was touched by someone. Minjin decided that he first needed to find out where those chemicals came from in the princess's body. All of her food is thoroughly tested, so it's clearly not a fluke. And since the hornets didn't attack any other jokers, it means the chemical isn't airborne, making it something only the princess came into contact with. Vermi tried to say something. She was furious. Minjun thought that judging by her reaction, she understood what he was talking about, and there really wasn't any way she could answer him. Lakefield asked if Minjun needed a translator by any chance. Minjun said that he was accidentally needed, but could Lakefield really become him? Lakefield said that he couldn't do it himself. He looked at Dongchul and asked him to bring that thing from the storage room. Dongchul ran to fulfill the boss's request. And Minjun was a little surprised, not understanding what they were talking about. Dongchul said with a nervous expression that he brought what he was asked for. It was a frying pan. Minjun, noticing this, was very surprised and agreed with the idea that if he just hit Vermi on the head with a frying pan, she would definitely shut up. But still, he would like to hear something else from her. So he needs to hit her later. Lakefield said that Minjun misunderstood him, and what was he even talking about? Lakefield laughed quietly and said, Had Minjun really forgotten that the frying pan was constantly talking about what it could do? Minjun, raising one eyebrow, said that the frying pan was only talking about all sorts of perversions. Lakefield asked Minjun to take a look and said that it seemed that Minjun had forgotten that this thing had a mental communication function. Minjun remembered the first time he saw the frying pan with Jiangpul and remembered how she said that she understood everything on a mental level. Minjin took the frying pan in his hands, and she immediately said that her panties were wet just thinking about it. The frying pan groaned loudly. Meanwhile, the beetles continued to try to break through the barrier. Vermi took the frying pan in her hand. Minjun turned to her, asking if she had contact with anyone. Or maybe she touched something. Minjun asked the frying pan to translate his words. Vermi, listening to the frying pan, loudly shouted something in her own language. Minjun covered his ears in irritation because it was too loud for him. He asked the princess to remain calm. Minjun took her hand in which she was holding the frying pan. Vermi immediately became embarrassed, and Minjun thought with irritation that now was not the time for embarrassment. He ordered the frying pan to speak. What did the princess say? The frying pan apologized, saying that she was just daydreaming. The frying pan added that my lady is so naughty. She said that my heart was about to jump out of my chest, and I already forgot what it felt like. Minjun was already angry and asked what nonsense the frying pan was talking about. He asked if this was going to answer. The frying pan replied that the princess is very expressive. Vermi began to quote this. Vermi said she didn't know who did it, but when they were caught, she would scalp them and boil them in salt water. She added that she would tear out their genitals and saw off the remaining limbs with a broken nail file. Minjin looked away, thinking that this frying pan had become even more talkative. Frying pan said that this lady likes it, because she likes it rough. Minjin with an arrogant face said that if in three minutes the frying pan does not convey everything that the princess says, then he will. Minjin thought about what he could choose for blackmail, and then said that he would forever leave the frying pan lying in the dirtiest corner of the pantry. While Vermi and the frying pan were communicating emotionally, Minjun looked at the phone. 
He saw 57 messages and muttered out loud that Katerina sent him a lot here. Minjun turned to Katie. Katerina looked at him, crossing her arms over her chest. She said it would be great if Minjun let her know that he survived. He said he hasn't had time yet. Katerina exhaled heavily, muttering that, of course, he was all business. Minjun saw files about the Korean pension fund, government aid, and Woongi loans. He asked Katerina if she had time to study everything. Katerina replied that she had managed to study the pension fund. She said government aid doesn't seem like an easy task, and the government doesn't seem to like them. Katerina explained that the annual payment of fines for the same failure to complete assigned tasks on time is why the government does not want to help them. Minjun was surprised, repeating the same problems every year. Katerina asked if Minjun knew about the racial employment quota system. She explained that companies over a certain limit must hire dwarves, orcs, and trolls in a certain ratio, but this company employed 97 2% humans, 28% elves, and no other races. She said that in simple words, there is no one in this company except people and a couple of elves. And there are a lot of such companies, she added that the word was still beautiful. Minjin remembered human chauvinism. They put themselves above everyone else and discriminate against all races other than humans. But at the same time, they accept elves, calling them good and useful. But they do not recognize any other race. They believe that they do not measure up, explaining this with all sorts of bullshit like that they are too short, multiply quickly, too tall, and so on, they evaluate them only according to the criteria of danger in relation to people. Minjun's train of thought was interrupted by the sound of a frying pan. Minjun asked the frying pan if he remembered everything. Minjun took the frying pan in his hand and ordered, Now tell the story. Frying pan with a happy intonation that the princess said that she had not touched anything like that throughout today and had only been in contact with some people. Minjun asked with whom exactly. He added with an intimidating look that he needed names. The frying pan replied that at first Minjun caressed her very gently. Minjun looked at Vermi with irritation, and she, blushing, looked away. Minjun shouted that there was no such thing, calling the frying pan a stupid utensil. Frying pan said there was one more person. Minjun asked who it was. The frying pan noted that Minjun had closed his eyes. Katerina asked Minjun what did the frying pan say. Minjun exhaled heavily, feeling a little nervous. He put his hand to his face and cursed in irritation. Bradley was driving a black car. He read a message from Minjun, which said that the princess was safe and Bradley must find out who was behind the attack. The princess may have been attacked by something unknown, but there's nothing they can't track down as long as they have Bradley's ability in their pocket. Bradley grinned after reading this text and began to use his ability. His ability includes clairvoyance, the ability to see through objects, supplemented by psychometry, non-contact vision. The light reflecting from his eyes is not magic at all, but a path made by the physical world by thousands of flying bugs. Bradley asked the driver to turn at the next intersection. Bradley thought about the idiots from Justice. The idea of transforming the Minova Hornets is simply brilliant. Bradley continued to speculate that they probably thought they were safe since the spellcaster had no reason to show himself, but they just didn't know about Bradley's secret, and he would definitely catch those Herods. Bradley thought that if he could help track down the top brass in the human rights community, maybe he'd get a 5,000 Delanta bonus. He only has 10,000 Delanta left to pay. A system window appeared in front of Bradley, which showed his identification number a SIF 174,245 at 100 and a short questionnaire that stated that he was an Earth Dimension agent in the American Division. His name is Bradley, and his remaining debt is 10,000 Delanta. Bradley was excited to think that he could pay off half of his debt. He remembered that his total ransom amount was 70,000 Dalant, which was just pennies compared to other prisoners. And when he regained his memory... He would definitely not turn out to be such an unthinkable criminal as Talesia, who killed herself out of guilt after how I remembered everything. Bradley told the driver to go through the tunnel. He had a good feeling. He thought that he finally felt it, this freedom. At the next fork in the road, Bradley told the driver to go to the underground parking lot. They stopped there and Bradley and several people got out of their cars. In the underground parking lot, they saw a man in a black suit with a beige hooded raincoat. The man next to Bradley asked if it was him. 
Bradley mentally wondered why this man was standing there alone. Was he afraid that they arrived earlier than expected? The man in the cloak, smiling broadly, took off his hood. Bradley realized that he was wrong and not everything was so simple because this man was waiting for them. Bradley became nervous as the man in the coat cast a spell with a wide smile. Bradley used his ability and was very scared. He recognized this man and asked where he was here from. Bradley's ally asked in surprise if everything was okay. Bradley loudly shouted for everyone to run and retreat, but he did not have time to finish the last word, and the magic of the man in the cloak tore Bradley into two parts. All his other allies were stained with his blood and looked at him with fear. The man in the cloak was a blonde guy with blue eyes, he laughed. Meanwhile, Minjun was driving a black car, accompanied by other similar cars. He remembered the day he stopped at the witch's community. He remembered the lawyer who gave him his business card, Mansik's daughter, and the rest of the events of that day. Minjun was holding a business card that said Yong Nam Jayu Law Office. Lawyer Yong Nam Jayu. His phone number and email were also listed there. Minjun was thinking that Manzik hired the troll's lawyer that day, so Minjun never thought of him as a chauvinist. But was he just pretending to be one for his own reputation? The reason he ignored the law regarding the employment of other races was because he was hiding his past. He even kissed Shuten's hands, and all this was only to maintain his tolerance in the eyes of everyone. Minjun squeezed the business card in his hand and frowned. Minjun came to the pension fund. Manzik reflected that he believed that he would stop foreign companies from encroaching on their market and that he could protect their market. He believed that even when other companies closed, he continued to promote his alchemy even when it was difficult. Manzik held in his hands the treaty that the United Kingdom of the Jalanko Dimension had proposed. The agreement stated that the principal transfers 100% of the shares belonging to the principal party to the recipient party. In case of unauthorized actions in the name of the recipient without payment of the price by the principal, the recipient bears all criminal and civil liability. The grantor party has no right to execute documents in any form using the certificate of incorporation of the company specified above. After the date of this contract, the principal's country undertakes to ensure that the necessary taxation and new registration procedures in relation to this contract are completed by a certain date. Taxes related to the company must be paid by the grantor party before the date of this agreement. The agreement notifies in accordance with the provision of Article 450 of the District Transfer District of the company. The transfer of the company must be carried out with the prior registration of the retention of the mortgage and the transfer of ownership. The transfer is the Korean Gukch Pension Trading Company. Recipient United Kingdom Measurements Jalanko. Manzik continued to think that if jobs disappeared, their alchemists would simply move abroad, and if all the talent continued to leave, then their Korean gold market would simply be overwhelmed by foreigners. Manzik thought that he was holding on for the sake of his people, his country, and his workers. He crumpled the agreement he was holding in his hands and thought that, despite everything, all efforts would be ruined by just one piece of paper. He decided that, if he thought about it, those idiots who proposed the selective mana filter, that something that relied heavily on overseas imports at such a low price, those vile people were in cahoots with the princess. It was just a trap to swallow his company. Manzik threw the agreement in the trash and sat down in his chair. He exhaled heavily, remembering recent events. Someone said that they could not help the chairman. Manzik remembered that it was at this time that the human rights community came to visit them. The same masked man was covered in blood and behind him lay a mountain of orc corpses. The man said with a big smile that for some time now they have been quite interested in Mr. Chairman and the Korean Pension Fund. When asked why they were interested, the man replied that they were fighting for the rights of the people, and it was time to show Princess Vermi all their anger. He explained that one of the reasons for Vermi's trip to Korea must include the duty of Mr. Chairman. He added, what is the reason to come to Korea when there are many other countries on earth? Manzik became a little nervous and looked away. This man with a wide smile raised his finger to his mouth and, smiling conspiratorially, said that only a little was needed from Mr. Chairman. There will be no evidence left, and the chairman may not even think about it. They shook hands and the masked man said they would take care of the rest. Manzik thought that if everything went according to plan, 
The human rights community promised to take care of the rest of the debt and even the funding. Manzik thought with a smile that he could continue to practice alchemy, and then the gold market in this country would be preserved. His thoughts were interrupted by a phone call. Manzik asked in surprise, What is happening? Someone shouted on the phone that there was a big problem. It was one of the employees of the pension fund. He was shouting that the immigration bureau was now on the first floor. Manzik, very nervous, not believing these words, he asked again, What? Someone from the immigration bureau ordered to search every corner. Minjun was one of the immigration bureau employees. There were people, elves, orcs, and trolls. All these men were in suits. Manzik sat in his office and was silent. He trembled and with fear in his eyes, stuttering, asked how this could happen. That man said that there would be no evidence left. Manzik remembered that he had heard a lot about the Immigration Bureau agents, and since it was associated with the human rights community, it would all turn out that if he was caught, he would be tortured to death, and if he survived, he would be begging about death. Manzik created a spell with his hands and decided that it would be better for him to take his life into his own hands and leave calmly. The spell he created was an instant poison. He decided that this spell would kill him as soon as he inhaled. And if so, Manzik, full of determination, was ready to use it on himself. But the doors swung open and Manzik was tied up lots of ribbons. He exhaled heavily, looking at the person who entered the office, and asked with fear why they were here. He said the word hornets loudly. Minjin said with a calm face that if Manzik is talking about the Menoa hornets, the Immigration Bureau has successfully eliminated them. Minjun, with a face expressing contempt, turned to Mr. Manzik and said that he would tell everything he knew about the human rights community right now. Manzik was very nervous and, calling Minjun a teacher, apologized and said that he still had the right to remain silent. Minjun said that this is not so. He added that Manzik and the man in the mask should have expected this when they made their plans. Minjun calmly said that in accordance with the Fourth Amendment of the Korean Constitution, Manzik's rights as a citizen of this country would be partially limited. Manzik frowned and asked why Minjun takes the side of the aliens. He added furiously that out of the seven mass immigrations, they, the people, at least accepted the elves. Manzik shouted with rage, Why Minjun, being an elf, chooses the side of these monsters? Manzik continued to shout about it, and Minjun looked at him filled with hostility and disgust. Minjun thought about how publicly his race is only a quarter-elf race, and even when he is literally 75% human, Manzik calls him, you elves. Minjun continued to reflect that Manzik, not accepting even the slightest fusion of blood from other races, is a manifestation of human suprematism in its purest form. Minjun asked if that's why Manzik works with the human rights community. Because their ultimate plan is to get rid of every race on Earth other than humans? Drive away or kill? Manzik looked at Minjun in surprise. Minjun asked if he knew how badly they treated other races. Before Minjun could finish this sentence, Manzik asked, So what? Manzik said, Who cares whether these vile creatures die or not? And why should he care? He added that they are not even people. Minjun looked at him with contempt and then calmly added that he had no intention of interrogating him here. Minjun added that. However, it was better for the dragon to do it instead of Minjun, who did it just like that. Minjun said that dragons can use some pretty weird and nasty magic. There is a magic that can push the brain to its maximum, and everything that a person cannot even remember themselves will be revealed. The place where they met with the representative of the human rights community, their voice, what they were wearing, Minjun explained that Manzik would give everything word by word. When the Immigration Bureau officers were already taking Manzik out of the room, Minjun added that, of course, this would be a very painful process, but Manzik would not die until he told everything. Minjun explained that besides the dragons, agents with strong holy power will take care of keeping Manzik alive. Manzik was completely horrified by what he heard. Minjun heard him calling and picked up the phone, he answered the call and asked what is it. It was Blair. She told him something. After some time, it was raining heavily. Police cars were parked near the entrance to the underground parking. Minjun and Blair were standing in this parking lot. The room inside was destroyed in some places. There were blood splatters everywhere. Minjun asked Blair if it was about him asking her to check. Blair responded positively, 
saying that this was a report from an agent who had been sent for verification. Blair explained that Bradley left the area and was nowhere to be seen. Blair was upset, crossing her arms over her chest with a worried expression and looking at Minjoon. Minjoon replied that he understood her. The committee uses miraculous magic that transfers the agent's soul to another body. But the committee needs a lot of strength and resources to use this. So even they cannot find the soul that left the body, which means that Bradley is dead. Bradley's body, cut in half, sat on the floor, leaning against a pole. A bouquet of roses was sticking out of his shirt collar. Like a ghost, that guy with blonde hair asked Minjoon, Isn't this beautiful? He put his arm around Minjoon's shoulder and pointed at Bradley's body, saying that this bouquet was created especially for them. Afterwards it dissipated, and Minjoon felt red streams of magic around him. Minjoon realized that the suspect had deliberately left traces in the spirit world, as if someone wanted Minjoon to see it. Minjoon clenched his hand into a fist so that veins stood out on it. Minjoon mentally asked, Is he happy now? The footprints in the spirit world conveyed the message that the person who left them missed Minjoon. Minjoon frowned and thought he'd see what would happen. Another message in the spirit world said, calling Minjoon a baby, that whoever left the message missed him. Minjoon was furious. He decided that he would tear this man apart if he caught Minjoon's eye. Minjoon turned to Blair and said that they needed to send the princess back. He explained that the terminals were most likely closed. But if they talked to Jenkinson, he would probably make a small exception. Blair wanted to argue, but Minjoon continued talking interrupting her about how they were planning to use the princess as bait for the thugs of the human rights community. Blair, a little nervously, replied that it was so. Minjin said that despite this, the current situation is a little different from what was planned, because they hired foreign mercenaries, which means there is no chance that the leaders themselves will show up. So they stopped this game of cat and mouse, because it has become too dangerous. Minjun began to leave, saying that as long as he accompanied the princess, she would be safe, but let the Jenkinson company prepare for the princess to return home early. Minjoon was filled with rage, with an eerily calm face. He thought that this was so that he would no longer have to protect her, and he could focus all his strength on killing this disgusting creature. At the same time, in Dimension 50 winning 532, there is a second terminal. Jenkinson tried to clarify what his subordinate said. The troll in the suit, stuttering and a little nervous tried to say something about the distorters of the earth. Jenkinson already asked with irritation what he was trying to say. He turned around and, frowning, said that, simply put, the distorters remained intact after five jumps into the dimension, but one still broke, and repairs would take three days. Jenkinson gritted his teeth in irritation and repeated, three whole days. The subordinate apologized to him, but responded positively. Jenkinson mentally cursed and asked why now when he decided to visit Secretary Blair. Jenkinson started screaming, What's wrong with the other distorters? Are there really no spare ones? Jenkinson ordered his subordinate to quickly find something. The subordinate handed over the tablet, saying that he had already found it. Jenkinson literally snatched the tablet from his hands and asked what it was. He calmly said that if they use this, they will have many transfers. This way they will waste too much time. Jenkinson thought about it while studying information about the manifestation of dimensional distortions and asked why a passenger of this race would go alone to Earth. The slave received a notification on the communication device. Jenkinson asked what is it. The subordinate replied that a message had just arrived from Earth from Chief Secretary Blair. Jenkinson took the communication device from his subordinate and said that he hoped there was at least some good news. Blair greeted the chairman and said that Blair Campbell was speaking to him. She bowed and said that she had contacted him, hoping that he would urgently approve this request. Jenkinson asked what kind of request. After some time, Blair ran up to Minjun and loudly said that she had succeeded. Minjun asked if Jenkinson allowed. Blair, catching her breath and resting her hands on her knees, said yes, and the chairman contacted the committee directly. Blair recalled that when she called Jenkinson, he took on his true dragon form and said he would contact the committee personally. Blair was shaking all over. Now she told Minjun with residual fear that they would only be able to fly if it was one of the spatial distortions that the princess used. Minjun said that then they should move out now. Minjun created a magical means of communication 
and conveyed a message to all the magicians involved in this plan. He said that at present, Princess Vermi and her escort consisting of jokers will travel by teleportation, the destination being the international airport on Yangjong Island. After some time, the military and special forces with dogs guarded the VIP area of the airport. The princess sat in this VIP area, communicating with a frying pan. Minjun was sitting not far from them and thought that this frying pan said something about a mental connection, didn't it? Minjun remembered that this type of translation is called bolhua, which means interpreting sounds out loud. This is the principle of reading the surface consciousness of the speaker, in other words, limited mind reading. Although the instructions did not even provide such an explanation, they say that most of these pans were destroyed because the court declared them illegal. Could it be that this frying pan is the last in the entire universe? Minjun watched them with a frown and thought, who could put such a unique ability into an ordinary frying pan? Minjun thought about how he had met so many people in his entire 800-year life. But the one who had such a talent could only be Bradley, namely Bradley, if this is a rare ability, then he could live well even after leaving prison. But who would have thought that he would die a dog's death? Princess Fermi interrupted Minjun's train of thought by handing him a shaking frying pan. Minjun reasoned that she probably wanted to tell him something. He put his hand on the princess's arm, holding the frying pan. Vermi said that she heard that comrade Minjun died recently, and she was very sorry that it was because of her. She asked Minjun to accept her condolences. Minjun exhaled heavily and said that it was not her fault. Vermi said that she had heard that racism was rampant on Earth, but she could not even think that something like that could happen. Minjun calmly replied that, unfortunately, this was to be expected. Seven mass emigrations in such a short period of time, but no one deserves to die simply because he is different. Vermi confirmed his words, saying that no one, but, to be honest, their situation is not the simplest either. She explained that maybe in the Jalanko dimension everything is not as bad as on Earth, but throughout history this dimension has also experienced many mass emigrations, and they also went through interracial wars, and, of course, the indigenous people suffered the most, namely, they are jokers. Minjin said that he heard that much of the history of the race wars has been lost, as well as the traditions that were passed down from generation to generation. Blair approached them, apologizing for interrupting them, and explaining that it was urgent. Minjun asked what happened. Blair, looking at the tablet, said that they needed to wait a couple more hours before using the spatial bender, because they needed to coordinate this with the committee so that they would not be suspected of smuggling people. Blair added that they say that the weight of the vessel when leaving Earth is greater than what it was when landing on Earth. Vermi was embarrassed and whispered something to Minjun. Blair looked at them with confusion. Minjun explained that Vermi said that she had bought jewelry. Blair asked with a surprised face, Is it really that much? She added that everything was clear to her, and everything had to go quickly, because no vital energy was detected. Minjun turned his gaze to Vermi and thought about what, just think, she bought so much that it affected the mass of the entire ship. Minjun thought about how she could afford it. Minjun concluded that his work as a bodyguard would end in a few more hours, and after he returned the princess safe and sound, his next mission would be the disgusting man who killed Bradley. Someone screamed very loudly. Blair, Vermi and Minjun were very surprised by this. One of the immigration officers fell to his knees, screaming. Someone asked him what happened. This man held his face with his hands. His skin began to melt. He was shocked by everything that was happening. Everyone else around him shouted that it was poison. Someone shouted that they needed to quickly bring the detoxification manuscript. The man continued to scream. Blair and Minjun looked out the window and saw where this was happening. Minjun thought with a scary look that this would save him time searching for that disgusting man. Minjun promised that he would definitely tear apart the one who was being chased by 26 governments and 8 elders. This is the dark magician Theo Christiansen. Theo was the reason for the poisoning of that man. He walked among an entire army of self-created zombies and chuckled. Theo said that the poison and zombies are just for show. He added with a smile that he would not want their meeting to be interrupted. He said the name, Imingen. The man who was struck by the poison was groaning in pain and bleeding. People were fussing around him. 
A troll with a machine gun in his hands shouted the order to immediately open the antidote and move the patient. The troll swore, nervously, and said that this was all very creepy as it was, and nothing was visible yet. This troll sat on the ground and said that this is the worst state for protection. He rubbed his head with his hand and sat cross-legged. This troll's name was Carl Hood. He was from the Republic of South Africa and was an affiliated agent. His magic weapon was a 20mm cannon. The agent standing next to him asked if Carl had seen a photo of the place. Carl answered in the negative, asking why. In response, the elf agent with long blonde hair tied in a ponytail said that he had been an agent for a long time, but had never seen anything like this. The photo showed Bradley with a bouquet of flowers protruding from his collar. The agent continued to say that the photo was enough to understand that the deceased Bradley was lucky because the others were tortured to death. The blonde-haired agent reasoned that the culprit must be a dark magician, right? He was tense and gloomy. He said that there are rumors that if you contact them, the future three generations will have bad luck. And if they harbor a grudge, they will pull them out of the ground, and it won't even be possible to destroy them, because they are like cockroaches. The agent with blonde hair, stuttering a little, asked if everything would be okay with them. Carl replied that with them was the one called the Legend, who had completed many missions with the Elder Dragon. This is Yuminjin. Meanwhile, the military shot the zombies with machine guns. Someone from the military shouted that zombies were advancing from the shore, and they needed to quickly call the agents. The binder carried out the order. He shouted that this was a security unit, and right now. Before he could finish speaking, his hand holding the phone fell to the ground. His arm was cut off, and he screamed in pain. The agent with blonde hair listened to this message and heard the setter scream in pain. Carl heard this too and began to get very nervous. He thought that there was only one bridge leading to Yongjong Island. Thinking that everything would be fine if they protected this place was a mistake. This is because mass teleportation is impossible. Carl couldn't believe that this dark magician forced zombies to cross during low tide. Many zombies were wading through the shallow water. Carl cursed as he contacted Minjin. Carl explained to him what was happening and added that this was the end of his briefing on the current situation. Minjun said that he accepted his information. Blair asked what they should do. She was a little nervous, and Vermi stood next to her with a frying pan in her hands. Minjun explained that they should take the Shutin to the ship and fly away immediately, and Minjun himself would inform the committee about what was happening. Blair was surprised and wanted to say that the committee had not yet... But before she could finish speaking, Minjun interrupted her with the words emergency code for the distorter. Blair looked at him, her eyes wide. Minjun turned to her and said with a calm face that the chairman usually does this, but since they are in another dimension, he had to leave it to Blair as the chief secretary. Blair, a little nervous, asked how Minjun knew this. She thought that this was true and that it existed. Perhaps they could only be used with the permission of the committee. Dimensional warpers require a permit for each use, and in order to operate one, you need to be aware of the warper's emergency permit. Without committee permission, the emergency bender code is provided by the terminal manager. Many people don't even know it, but who exactly is Minjun? Blair looked at him thoughtfully as he contacted someone. Minjun gave orders to all agents who are able to move. They will accompany the princess and her servants to the distorter. Minjun began to leave this room and turned to the chief secretary, saying that he was leaving the princess to Blair. She strongly agreed with him, and Princess Vermi shouted something in her own language. She thought that everything was fine, because she would definitely meet him again. Minjun went outside and teleported to a higher altitude to look at everything from above. Minjun applied magic to his vision and thought about what Theo said to let Minjun find it himself. Minjun found Theo among the crowd of zombies and decided that he would definitely kill him. The magic window of the scanner through which Minjun looked at Theo said that the reward for killing Theo was 200,000 dalent. Minjun rushed towards him, taking out his knife. Theo watched his movements and said with a wide smile that it was all reminiscent of the time when Minjun destroyed Theo's school. He reasoned that even though Minjun was with the Elder Dragons then, now only Minjun and Theo are here. Theo shouted with rage that Minjun is a parasite who lives off dragons. He decided that he would destroy Minjun with real black magic. 
Minjun stabbed the knife blade into his hand and said that he will be the one to tear Theo apart this time. He shouted the last words as he pierced his hand with a knife and cut it from palm to shoulder. Minjun looked intimidating, and Theo, looking at him, laughed madly. Minjun shouted out the enemy's name. In the midst of the battle, Theo ordered all the zombies to attack Minjun. Theo used green magic. The zombies formed a whole mountain around Minjun with their bodies. But suddenly, red glimmers appeared in this mountain. There was an explosion and Minjun threw all the zombies away from him. His hair was flowing and he looked intimidating. He looked like a clot of dark magic and asked Theo, Is that all? Theo concentrated red magic on his fingertips and with a wide smile answered Minjun that let it be as he wishes. This magic broke the earth's road from Theo to Minjun and another explosion occurred where Minjun was. Tio with a crazy smile created several more spells around himself and shouted that he created dozens of types of real magic just to kill Minjun. He added that he won't let Minjun die until he tries them all. He attacked Minjun, saying that he would use them one by one, step by step. Another large-scale green explosion occurred. Theo smiled and looked at everything that was happening. Minjun emerged from the dust and smoke. Theo was very surprised. Minjun said with irritation and rage that he was asking, Is that all? Behind Minjun was a huge purple monster. Theo screamed and attacked with a new spell. There was no longer a crazy smile on his face. He was just tense and concentrated. He thought that something was wrong. The real magic that he had prepared for this day did not work on Minjun. Theo frowned and was serious. He thought that he was ready for any development of events. But even this amount of dark magic is not enough. He hadn't even had time to treat his wounds in the past month. His hands were bloody and his fingertips were black. Theo thought that he had prepared so hard that the screams of the victims were still ringing in his ears. Minjun, unharmed, continued to slowly approach Theo. Theo cast another spell that split the ground and sent strong streams of energy out of those cracks. Theo continued to ponder that despite all this, why? He shouted, why doesn't anything work? Minjun walked with a gloomy look. Theo Christiansen, this is the name given to him by his devout parents. Unlike the meaning of his name, God's gift, his high talent for dark magic was like a slap in the face to God. Once upon a time, in a slum somewhere in Europe, goblins came to Theo, clasping their hands. They asked if they would really be provided with food and work. The goblins thanked him sincerely. Theo grinned and invited them inside with a good-natured face. When they entered, he closed the door. It wasn't that Theo hated orcs or goblins. He just didn't want to be disturbed during his research into dark magic. When those goblins walked inside, they saw a bloody torture room. There were chains and hooks hanging everywhere in this room. The room was lit by floor and wall torches. In the middle of the room, there was a wooden operating table with a goblin lying on it. Several more goblins and orcs were in different parts of the room, exhausted or dead. The goblin who had just walked in nervously turned to Theo and asked what about food and work. Theo swung at him with a crazy smile. No one will worry, even if orcs or goblins start disappearing in droves. It was raining. On the street, a guy in a green cape and glasses shouted into the gramophone that even when a group of goblins disappeared in Eastern Europe, the European Alliance did nothing. It was a small rally where everyone stood in green raincoats holding placards with text. The guy with glasses continued to shout into the gramophone, The Alliance does not care about the social disadvantage of goblins, and they do not care whether they live or die. The guy turned to people, saying that they, too, could find themselves in a similar position. But no one paid attention to this small rally. One working man, passing by, said with disdain that once those vile monsters left, it became at least pleasant to walk along the clean streets. The second man who was following him turned to the protesters and asked which side they were on, humans or monsters. The guy with glasses began to answer that they must create a society where the weak will be protected. But before he could finish his sentence, someone pushed him on the shoulder. It was Theo. He was covered in blood and looked at this guy intimidatingly. The green-eyed, brown-haired guy who was this guy looked at Theo with fear. Theo thought that this was beneficial to him and that thanks to people like those two workers, he could explore dark magic without barriers. Sometime later, dragons flew over the city. 
they carried out a mission and burned down Theo's school building. There were also military men there, one of whom shouted to the squad, All clear, he added that Theo Christiansen is here. The dragon spoke to Minjun in a terrifying voice, saying that it seems that all the small pawns have been removed. But what about Theo Christiansen? Minjun replied that they were looking for him at the moment, but given that many of the corpses were still fresh, he most likely escaped, sacrificing many to escape their trap. The red dragon with yellow eyes said that they would have to be content with getting rid of the school in Oslo. He added that they would put Theo Christiansen on the wanted list and continue to pursue him. Meanwhile, Theo was breathing heavily. He ran along the sewer canal for a very long time and only now stopped. He could not even imagine that the government would be worried about some orcs or goblins. Theo realized that it was a mistake to kill too many orcs. As the orcs working in the factories and factories disappeared, problems began to grow in the industrial sectors. Now that this has become a problem for them, will they take action? Theo thought about this with a surprised look. He thought that initially no one cared about the orcs at all. He decided that everyone in the government was vile hypocrites. Sometime later, two orcs were walking in the same slums. One of them asked if the other had heard that the school in Oslo had been destroyed. The second orc replied that he had heard that the Immigration Bureau and the Elder Dragons were working together. But even so, they failed to capture leader Theo Christiansen. The orc's interlocutor said that he hoped that this vile man would be quickly caught and killed. Theo at that moment was standing not far from them and holding a newspaper in his hands, where there was a wanted notice for him. He mused that it was too difficult to face both the Immigration Bureau and the Elder Dragons. He must destroy them, starting with the weakest, and he must start with Immigration Bureau agent Yi Minjun. Theo thought that Minjun was a dark magician like himself, who had betrayed his family to live as a parasite under the dragons. Then Theo decided that Minjun would be the first, he thought that in order to take revenge on him, Theo needed stronger power and more victims. That is why cooperation with the Union for the Defense of Human Rights was so suitable for him. After all, they both wanted pain and the blood of monsters, Theo and the masked man. They communicated a little earlier than the present time. Theo was in a large hangar. He spoke on the phone, saying that he would take care of Princess Vermi's bodyguard. Theo assured his interlocutor that he would not be disappointed. An orc lay on the operating table in front of Theo. Theo was thinking that when he received the request regarding Princess Vermi from the Union, he had no reason to decline it, because it was time to get revenge on that idiot. Theo was serious. He reflected that even the red dragon covering him was not on Earth. Theo, standing in front of the window, thanked the Lord for giving Theo such an opportunity. Theo spread his arms, looking out the window, smiling madly. Present tense. Theo said in confusion that this was nonsense. Theo started yelling, asking Minjun if he had any idea how much sacrifice Theo had made. Suddenly, a stream of magic passed through Theo's chest, creating a large hole in it. Theo didn't even have time to react, but only be surprised. Minjun had his hair down and stood with his magic hand raised, his face calm. Theo fell backwards onto the ground and groaned in pain. After a few moments, he called Minjun a name and began to rise, trembling, as his wound healed. Theo asked how Minjun could still be alive after using such powerful dark magic. Theo, with a crazy look and burning eyes, shouted that dark magic is an art created on murders and victims. He added with a frowning face that it shouldn't be built on self-sacrifice like Minjun does. Theo noticed the torn sleeve of Minjun's jacket and noticed that the arm itself was not so badly damaged. Theo shouted that Minjun should be dead already, so how is he still alive? Theo, smiling widely, shouted that he understood everything, and Minjun must have sold his body to the dragons. Apparently, this is why Minjun received such a powerful life force. Theo continued to shout furiously that after this, could Minjun even call himself a real dark magician? Minjun stood calmly, and then again cut his palm with his purple knife and asked the last words about the real dark magician. Meanwhile, Blair tore the magic scroll, which glowed when she did so. She asked if anyone else had scrolls with the antidote. The accompanying princesses stood in front of her and spoke in their native language. They did not understand what Blair said. She looked tensely to the side and thought that they had almost reached the distorter, but they could not just run through the poisonous smoke. 
She didn't understand what to do. Between them and the distorter, purple, toxic smoke hung in the air. Suddenly, a rolled-up scroll landed on the ground next to them. Blair was a little surprised when she looked at this. Carl shouted that it was his emergency scroll. He added that he could still hold out for a little while, because he is a tenacious troll. He shouted that they should use this scroll and leave. Blair looked at him in surprise, mentally saying his name. She picked up the scroll and looked around. The zombies broke through, and the agents, together with the military, defended themselves against them. Blair frowned and, tearing the scroll, began to run with the princess and her entourage towards the distorter. She shouted very loudly, Thank you. The door of the twister squeaked and opened after Blair unlocked all the locks. She loudly shouted to the princess to come here quickly. The princess and her entourage climbed into the distorter. The agents fought valiantly. Carl shouted that they couldn't stand it any longer. He wanted to shout to his allies to hurry up and leave, but he began coughing up blood. The poison affected him. All the agents were alarmed and ran to him. Blair loudly asked someone to help this agent. One of the princess's attendants returned and, taking Carl on his shoulder, ran back. Blair screamed at him to quickly get into the distorter. When this joker returned, he carefully laid Carl on his back. Carl lay unconscious. Blair thought that he was too poisoned, and even if he was a troll, being in the poisonous smoke for so long was very dangerous. Carl was covered in sweat. The collar of his shirt was stained with his own blood. He lay with his eyes closed, his brows furrowed. Blair continued to reflect that, despite all this, with his innate troll tendency to put others first, he had given his scroll to them. Blair was a little nervous, loosened her tie and said that she would go to the booth for now, so she asked the Joker to look after him. Blair realized that if they continued to hesitate, they would all die like a dog. She decided that she needed to go to the Jalanko dimension right away. As Blair walked into the cabin, one of Princess Vermi's escorts asked in his own language what was going on. Blair felt something too. Her eyes flew open and she realized what that sound was. This was the security feature built into all of Chairman Jenkinson's treasures. Special sound. Blair is sure that this sound comes from the Chairman's treasure containers. The sound source deliberately produces a low sound so that the middle races cannot hear. However, Blair was trained directly by the Chairman, so she can hear it, and it most certainly comes from Chairman Jenkinson's treasure. She remembered herself saying that there should be a storage area below, and she thought that they would need to wait a couple of hours before they could use the spatial bender, since the wait had increased significantly. Blair realized that the committee had to quickly approve the request. Normally, the committee would have checked everything carefully if there was no such emergency as now. But why was this on the princess's ship? Blair thought that this is not important now. One of Vermi's escorts growled angrily in his language. Why is Blair loitering around? Blair turned around and shouted that she had to check the vault. She looked serious and thought about the fact that the chairman's treasures were here on the ship. Those accompanying Princess Vermi were a little surprised by such an emotional response and asked in their own language, What is this girl talking about? They communicated with each other, asking if anyone could translate her speech. Princess Vermi stood drooping, head down. She had a frying pan in her hand. She understood everything that Blair was saying. Blair shouted that even if they died from zombies, she would not die until she checked what was in the vault. Blair realized that in such a situation she could not trust Shooten. She decided that she needed to find someone who could help Carl. Blair looked at how he was suffering. His eyes began to roll back. She realized that the injury was too serious, and the other agents were already busy keeping the zombies at bay. Blair wondered if there was anyone else here. One of Princess Vermi's escorts grabbed Blair by the shoulder and called her in his own language and asked what she was doing. Blair looked back at Vermi in surprise. She realized that there was someone who could help. Blair looked at the frying pan and thought, if only that person. Meanwhile, Minjun watched as red bubbles multiplied in Theo's chest. Minjun called Theo crazy with a surprised face. Theo thought that the difference in strength was staggering, huge, which meant that it would be simply impossible to escape. He realized that he would probably be tortured like hell if he were caught. Theo thought with a crazy smile that he just wanted to explore dark magic forever. But he doesn't like to suffer, so even if it hurts a little, Theo will still make Minjun suffer. Theo's eyes were bloodshot, 
and he looked at Minjun madly. Theo was shrouded in dark magic. He shouted that because Minjun allowed him to escape to Europe, because Minjun could not kill Theo that day, he would regret it forever. Theo's body was changing beyond recognition. Everything around is on fire. A few hours before, in a terminal in another dimension, a green, snail-like alien was working while sitting in the terminal. He heard them say hello to him for the second time. This alien paid attention to the miniature girl and apologized to her for being too busy and not noticing her. She said she came for the bender code. She added that the committee had probably already approved the code. The alien loudly responded positively and said that everything had already been approved and the code had been issued. The alien added that, contrary to this, he is not sure that his interlocutor is aware, but at the moment the committee has announced a partial blockage of the earth. The alien said that it was easy to get there, but moving in the opposite direction matters differently. He added that his interlocutor would not be able to predict when she would be able to leave there if she decided to go there. The alien asked if everything suited her. The girl responded positively with a cheerful smile, saying that this was great and such things were not important. The alien looked at her and said that something good must have happened to her if she looked like that. The alien continued to do his job, and then the realization came to him that it was not a person. He widened his one eye and thought, Why is this race trying so hard to transform into a human? It must be very inconvenient. The alien apologized for the wait and gave her the chip with the distorter code. She thanked him and started to leave. The alien thought that these were not his problems, and whoever you would meet in this vast universe. The alien called out to her and said that it seemed her call sign was not registered in the Dimension database, since her ship was private and not commercial. The alien said that he could indicate something about the time, but does she have a preferred name? The girl with short hair and red eyes answered, Del. It was Yiminjun's ex-wife. At the same time, the man stood with a glass of wine in front of a plan board on which were Minjun, Mansik, Orcs, Trolls, the Jenkinson Company logo, various maps of the area, documents, and also Bradley, who was crossed out. In the middle of this whole plan was Princess Vermi. The man who was watching all this was in touch with the regional manager. The manager said he was calling to report the current situation. The mercenaries just told the manager that this man released poison and zombies at the airport. The man who looked at this whole plan with a glass of wine was the same masked man, the head of the Human Rights Association. The manager added that he said he would do it himself since Minova's hornets failed. The masked man shook the wine glass in his hand and accepted this information. The manager said there was more to it, but did this man know about the vault on Puckin Mountain? The man turned away from the planning board and walked towards the table where there was a bottle of wine and sliced apples on a plate. Did he ask about the storage facility? And then he added that this is obviously a failed plan. And is there anything more interesting? The man put a glass of wine on the table. The manager replied that he was told that Jenkinson stole something from there the same day they were going to carry out their plan. The masked man reached for a piece of apple, but upon hearing these words from the manager, he froze. He asked about the forest fire, and the manager responded positively, saying that it was an uncontrolled bushfire, but to get through the barrier created by Jenkinson. The manager did not finish his sentence when the masked man froze in bewilderment and thought that if this was really the case, then why did this have to happen when their brothers were there? The timing was too precise to be considered a coincidence. The man mentally asked if it was possible to make Jenkinson focus on them. He squeezed the glass in his hand so hard that it broke and the pieces flew in different directions. The masked man thought with rage, do they dare to use them? And who are these disgusting idiots anyway? Meanwhile, a gun was pointed at the back of Blair's head. It was Princess Vermi. With an intimidating look, she ordered Blair to shut up and enter the code. Blair was very surprised that Vermi spoke English. Vermi shouted loudly that if Blair didn't want to get a hole in his head, then let him open the vault. Blair was shocked by everything that was happening. Vermi growled loudly, cursing. Blair mentally asked, How is it possible that Vermi speaks English? She remembered that nobles usually use a translator to maintain their image. And why learn an unnecessary language? Blair entered the code. Vermi said loudly that Blair had better hurry up if she didn't want to get shot in the head. Blair, surprised, thought, How does Vermi speak so fluently? 
Was it a lie when they said they were not considering mass emigration? Using debt to get into the alchemy workshop was not just to increase one's wealth. The real goal was to diversify the gold mining process, creating a foothold on Earth where they could safely settle down. Blair looked at Vermi nervously. She thought that the committee or Earth would not be very happy about their immigration, especially if it was the Jalanko dimension that treated them like animals. They own 15% of GDP, but have fairly weak power. An alligator hatching a golden egg, so the Jalanko dimension won't let them go so easily. But why did they steal the chairman's treasure then? Blair realized as she entered the code that their secret immigration plans would be easily exposed if they were caught. She has a lot of thoughts, but one thing she is sure of is that they will be finished if they go to the Jalanko dimension like this. Blair began to use magic. She thought that she really didn't want to use it, but now was not the time to think. She quietly whispered to the glowing object a request for help. Blair asked to go and find Agent Yuminjun and report the situation on the ship. The spell flew towards Minjun. He was in battle in a huge purple storm. Minjun flew out of this storm and, frowning, shouted, What's up? He directed a fire attack at Theo. Minjun looked at the huge purple tornado. He thought about Theo using his own body and magical power as a sacrifice for the final blow. Theo laughed and was the source of this huge purple tornado. Minjun reasoned that the black magic had become much stronger compared to what Theo had used before. The tornado was formed by hornets. Minjun reflected that their reproduction speed was much faster than the killing speed of these vile bugs. Minjun thought that he shouldn't be afraid of death from them, but if he doesn't stop them, they will fill the nearby cities and create chaos everywhere. Minjun frowned and thought that he couldn't stop them alone since Jenkinson wasn't here. Minjun will have to ask another dragon for help. He noticed that the spaceship was flying out of the distorter. Minjun thought in bewilderment, what kind of stupid race would use a spatial bender at such a time? Minjun decided that there was no time to think about it, and he should focus on blocking these bugs. Minjun rushed into battle. He thought that if he wanted to do this, it seemed that at a minimum he would have to sacrifice one of his hands. Minjun was ready to cut off his left hand. How suddenly it became dark. Minjun was very surprised. He looked at the sky, which was covered with some kind of dark matter. He mentally asked what was happening. What Minjun saw shocked him. The whole sky seemed to be covered with the tentacles of a black octopus. The agents also became nervous, asking what is this? Minjun reflected that when he first became a prisoner, for him, who had lost all his memories, the first who explained the whole situation and suggested where to move next were those who monitored the endless dimensions, races and prisoners. They were the committee and one of the founders' committee is the ancient race in Delian. This creature looked like an octopus with a huge number of tentacles and one huge purple eye. This creature filled the entire sky. Minjun was very surprised, nervous. He didn't understand why Endelion was here, in such a distant dimension. Maybe he came through that distorter. Why did he use such a small ship and not a race distorter? The creature's purple eye began to glow, and the creature itself began to make strange sounds. Endelion created a black hole into which all the beetles were sucked. Minjun was in the air, but the black hole's gravitational pull had no effect on him. He thought that inside that black hole, was there really an abyss? A place where even the committee refused to explore. A place where once you enter, you will never be able to leave. It is a hell where they throw prisoners who cannot be reformed even with hard work. But the most important thing is in this black hole that absorbs each of these bugs without harm to the environment. Even so, just go ahead and open something as dangerous as a black hole. Minjun was surprised by the committee members' behavior. Minjun mused that even though they are noble, the committee can still remove them. He looks like someone who is not easy to deal with. No need to focus on him. A glowing spell sent by Blair flew towards Minjun. Minjun asked with a calm face, What is this? Strange spirit? The glowing spell was a small dragon with yellow eyes and red scales. This little dragon was conveying Blair's request to help her. The little dragon started talking about Princess Vermi. When Minjun finished listening to him, he gritted his teeth and growled at this disgusting alligator. Frowning, Minjun turned around and rushed to Blair's aid. The agents did not understand what was in the sky. One of them asked what it was, but the other distracted him, ordering him to concentrate on the zombies. 
He explained that he didn't know what happened, but their movements became slower. The agents fired non-stop at the zombies. One of them shouted that they could hold out until the princess fled. The spaceship took off. One of the agents shouted that they would soon have everything ready and they needed to hold out a little longer. Minjun landed on the ground between the agents and the zombies. The impact was so strong that the ground cracked where he landed. The agents were very surprised by his appearance. They wanted to warn him that zombies were standing right behind him, but he turned around and cut off the heads of all the zombies in an instant. The agents began to support him, shouting his name and saying that they were saved. Minjun ordered the agents to stop the ship quickly. Suddenly it became very bright. Minjun was blinded by the bright light of the sun. He shaded his eyes from the sun with his hand and looked around. It was still the same airport. Minjun wondered if Indelian had left. Minjun didn't understand what was happening. He decided that now there was no time to think about it, and the distorter was more important. Someone asked Minjun where he was in such a hurry, and his heart skipped a couple of beats. Del calmly approached him and said that he was really still the same even after decades. Minjun frowned slightly and became very nervous. Del, blushing a little, shrugged and greeted Minjun, calling him cute. Minjun immediately turned around and, addressing her by name, asked how she got here. She replied that, of course, on a spaceship. Minjun remembered the spaceship that passed through the distorter. Minjun thought that she might be in it, but that doesn't matter now. Minjun became worried when he saw that the spaceship containing Blair and Princess Vermi was almost in the warp. Minjun was a little nervous. He turned to Del apologizing and asking if they could talk a little later. She was a little surprised. Minjun started to run away, but she immediately grabbed his hand, shouting that this was too much. She had tears in her eyes. She shouted that he couldn't be with her now when they hadn't seen each other for so long. Minjun looked at her hand, which was tightly squeezing his. Minjun was confused and thought she would drive him crazy. Minjun pulled his hand out of her grip and apologized loudly. As he ran away, he loudly suggested we talk later. Del looked at her hand in confusion. Minjun ran towards the distorter. Del looked at him intimidatingly. While Minjun was running, he was thinking about how he would take care of Del later, but now he needed to. Before he could finish his thought, he felt something strange. He looked around and took in what he saw with fear. Del asked the darling, what's wrong with him? Is this ship really more important than her? Black Matter rushed towards the ship and enveloped it, pulling the ship out of the distorter. Minjun was shocked to see this and stammered and asked, Tentacles? These tentacles originated from Del's back. She asked Minjun, What is it on this ship that he ignores her like that? She looked intimidating and stared at Minjun very intently. The onboard computer of this ship said that there were 60 seconds left before departure. All passengers are asked to fasten their seat belts. The onboard computer began the countdown. Princess Vermi thought that if everything worked out, the Shootin' Tribe would be free. Memoirs of Vermi. Someone asked her how she felt about the land as an object of exile on the periphery. She stood in a large empty space on the stone floor. The voice continued to say that you just need to pay the appropriate price, and then he will go to the committee with a proposal. Vermi thought. With her eyes downcast, she thought that she didn't really want to ask the committee for help. But in order to overcome the opposition of the other races in Jalanko, she had no choice but to turn to the committee. Vermi asked what the price was. The terrifying two red eyes from the darkness replied that everything was very simple. Now the princess would have to visit Earth more often, and during each visit they would use their distorter to deliver different goods. A huge creature with red glowing eyes looked like a snake. Present tense. Less than ten seconds left before takeoff. Vermi was pleased with the work done. Blair sat tied up in a chair, nervously thinking that Agent Yi Minjun is still not here. And, closing her eyes, she thought that it didn't matter who would come. She was simply begging for help. Suddenly something happened, and the ship began to shake. Those accompanying Princess Vermi began to scream, but she herself did not understand what was happening. It was Del who stopped the ship with her tentacles, asking Minjun, Is this ship really more important than her? And what is there anyway inside? Minjun was very surprised. He thought that these tentacles were very similar to those that Indelian had. Minjun turned to Del with a question. Is it really that Indelian? Del responded with an intimidating look that it was her. 
and even when she regained her body and memories, she came in these clothes and in this body just to see Minjun. She screamed with tears in her eyes that she did this for him so that he would remember what she looked like when they first met. But he... She started screaming that he was ignoring her because of this vile ship. Everything inside the ship was shaking, and the Jokers were shouting something in their own language. Del held the ship in the air with her tentacles and asked what was there. Minjun, worried about this whole situation, wanted to stop her. But he didn't have time, and she cut the ship into two with one of her tentacles. All things and passengers began to fall from this ship to the ground, screaming. Del used magic to stop all the objects and passengers that were falling from the spaceship. Del asked Minjun not to worry. Everything inside was intact. She looked at the ship with a slight smile and asked what was going on here. And then she looked gloomily at Minjun and said, more importantly, why was he so worried? Minjun looked at Del in bewilderment. He was surprised that she didn't kill them. He also thought that she no longer looked like the Del he remembered. But what was she thinking about? Minjun started talking and thought that it doesn't matter what she thinks about, and we need to deal with the current situation first. Minjun started talking about the passengers on the ship, and specifically about the girl. Del interrupted him by asking, Girl? She said that Shuten is clearly not Minjun's type, and neither are trolls. Del noticed Blair, who was waving her arms in panic. Del started to cry again. Blair screamed Minjun's name and screamed that he really came. She added that she was looking forward to it. Minjun was shocked and very tense. He mentally scolded Blair and thought that she was suicidal. Minjun tried to stop Del, saying that she had gotten it all wrong. Del said with a very sweet smile that everything was fine and she didn't mean to hurt her. She just wanted to say hello and... Minjun interrupted her, asking her to listen to him first. But Del said with a terrifying look that she wanted to see her face. A huge eye appeared in front of Blair, emitting colossal energy. Blair was very frightened and screamed in fear. Tears appeared in her eyes. Minjun thought that something needs to be done about this, and shouted out, Del, it's her. He shouted that this was the wrong girl. Del turned to him with a terrifying look, stopping the spell. Minjun pointed his finger at Princess Vermi. Del said questioningly, Shootin? She asked, Does Minjun really think that she will believe this? Vermi was very nervous and looked at Del. Del, with an intimidating look, asked Minjun if he knew what it cost her to come and see him. Her tentacles began to exude magic. With a terrifying look and tears in her eyes, she asked if Minjun was also lying to her because of this girl. 